Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend. Let us head fanfics. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series of What If Broken Villain Deku Had Gamer Quirk. Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Age 5. Stumbling upon All Might on his way home was not what Izuku had wished for that day. He had long since given up on a chance encounter with his favorite hero. After all, celebrities don't just walk around the street all day waiting for a quirkless nobody to request an autograph. But here he was, in all his glory, All Might stood in the middle of a crowd of admirers, looking more terrified of the notebooks and phones and gifts being thrust at him than he had ever been in front of villains. Thanks to his small frame, Izuku crawled his way through people's legs with slight difficulty and soon made his way in front of his idol. Now that Izuku was mere feet away from All Might, he was astonished at the man's extreme physique that was kinda hard to tell across the monitor. Being next to him made Izuku feel so small and insignificant, but the overwhelming height of the man only brought him a feeling of protectiveness, like being under a shielding giant tree on a rainy day. Trembling from excitement, Izuku bounced up and down as he pushed his notebook up as high as possible, hoping the popular hero would choose his notebook amongst the many that was offered to him. Uh, all might, he yelled, his voice breaking, see can I get an autograph? The second surprise of the day came when All Might heard his pitiful squeak among the clamorous chatters and gladly took the offered notebook. Of course, what's your name, boy? I'm Midoriya Izuku. All Might signed the notebook with a flash, his signature smile on his face as he returned it to Izuku. It was incredible how he was capable of looking so cool while doing something so mundane. Izuku mused as he thumbed over the page where All Might's glorious signature carved its way to memory. All Might, the greatest, legendary hero, the symbol of peace, protector of the country, the most amazing person alive had been holding his notebook. His notebook. Izuku broke out of his musing when he saw All Might bent his legs slightly, a sign his years of observation helped him notice habitually before the man jumped. All Might was leaving. His first encounter with the legendary hero was about to end in less than a minute with a few insignificant exchanges of words that most likely won't be remembered if he was to think back on it years later. He couldn't just end it like this. He wouldn't. See can. Can someone without a quirk become a hero? Before the man could leave his sight, Izuku spluttered out a question that had been clogging his mind for years. All Might stood with his back face towards the crowd, who was starting to get impatient with Izuku getting all the attention. Slowly, he replied in a low tone, I'm going to be frank with you. Heroes deal with life and death situations on a daily basis. It's not something to be taken lightly up. If a quirkless hero was to participate in a hero fight, without any power to defend themselves, they will only be a hindrance to the other heroes and give the villains an advantage. Even with the help of gadgets and equipments, they will still be the weakest link of the heroes. Plus, hero equipments are hard to come by and are a big investment. A group of heroes is only as strong as their weakest member, and the addition of a quirkless hero would greatly reduce the chance of successful captures, which is why a quirkless person has never passed the hero license exam. There were many words that Izuku didn't understand at the time, but one thing he knew was that being quirkless equals to no hero. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but I don't want you to waste your life working towards an impossible goal. It's better to give up early than regret later on. All Might's stern face fell when he turned around, beaming, that's all. Izuku didn't hold him back this time, letting his idol jump out of sight. The disappointed crowd dispersed, with a few lingering people throwing dirty looks at the small boy who was lucky to be blessed with All Might's attention even for a few minutes. That day, Izuku's dream was totally, completely, and utterly shattered into pieces. Not a single scrap remains. The next day, he went through school without his usual vigor. He sat quietly in class not participating in any of the class discussions. Everything around him seemed to blur out and the noises seemed to fade. Izuku was in his own little world, a dark vast empty space with a small ball of flame lighting up a path that led to infinite darkness. During lunch, he sat alone as usual as he watched his classmates with all their amazing quirks laughing and fooling around. As school came to an end, Izuku packed up quietly, hoping to return home as soon as possible so he could crash onto his bed and just black out. But all good things must come to an end. Kakan appeared next to him with an explosion effect. What's wrong with you, Deku? Izuku glanced at him warily. It's nothing, Kakan. It's obviously not nothing. You were zoning out the entire day. It took Yama-sensei three times to get your attention. And you didn't even look at me once. What's wrong with you? Kakan slammed a hand onto his desk, causing Izuku to flinch. Kakan was right. What was wrong with him? Well, for one, he didn't have a quirk. Yet he dared to dream about becoming a hero. Then, he even had the nerve to speak to All Might. Someone like him. An extra like him. Come. Kakan yanked his arm and dragged him out of the classroom. School had ended for a while and the hallway was nearly void of students. Good. No witnesses. Perfect timing for Kakan to torment him. Even if someone did see the way Kakan was treating him, 
they would probably dismiss it as Kakan being his usual aggressive self. Izuku's mind spun wildly as memories of past encounters flashed across his mind. Izuku sneaked a glance at Kakan's face. As expected, Kakan was seething like he wanted to murder someone. Great, today he probably won't let Izuku off the hook so easily. Was it too much to ask to just leave him alone? He just wanted to go home. Kakan kicked open the door to the roof. For some reason, it wasn't locked. He pulled Izuku near the railing and let go of his arm, looking away and grumbling something underneath his breath. Izuku rubbed his sore wrist where Kakan had grabbed as he watched on with confusion. What does Kakan want with him now? Look, you know I hate your guts, right? Kakan spat, face red with anger. Small explosions danced on his sweaty palms. I know, you don't have to remind me every day, Kakan. Izuku bowed his head, ashamed. He knew Kakan never saw him as a friend. He'd known it since he first met him, but it hurt even more to hear it from Kakan. You're a worthless, useless, stupid quirkless Deku. I, I, I hate you. You can't even defend yourself yet you want to be a hero. Don't make me laugh. What are you gonna do when you face a villain? Ha! Huh. Throw your damn notebook at it. The villain could kill you in seconds. If you want to die so badly then just jump off the roof. It'll save you the time and effort. Kakan rambled on, fingers clawing through his messy hair as if frustrated that his words would never get through Izuku's thick skull. You hear that? What I'm saying is that. A series of small explosions spooked Izuku. Kakan looked so mad. H H ha. Ha. Damn it. Stupid, shitty Deku. With that said, he ran down the stairs, leaving a trail of smoke behind him. This was the last straw. Izuku knew how useless he was, but he always pushed down those negative thoughts and focused on the positive emotions. He continued to dream on and wish for a brighter future. He hoped one day he'd meet someone who'd support him no matter what, who'd stay by his side and urge him on, who'd tell him, you can be a hero. Yesterday's meeting with All Might crushed those hopes, and today's meeting with Kakan even more so extinguished that small flame of ambition inside his heart. Izuku stepped closer to the railing, watching the students trail out of the school gate, a blonde Pomeranian head standing out in the crowd. Some students remained on the field due to club activity. There was a group of students standing on the baseball field, not doing anything, no, they were discussing something. Izuku squinted his eyes. Something was off with the field. There were some charred grounds all over the baseball field. They seemed to form something. Oh, oh, no, is that a D? He pushed himself forward, leaning against the railing. That's definitely an E. And then K. And the last one is V. Izuku frowned. Whoever was fooling around would probably get in trouble tomorrow when the teachers caught them. It wasn't Izuku's job to worry. Beside, he didn't care anymore. Whatever that had happened to this world, to other people, to the heroes, to the villains, to himself, Izuku placed a hand on the railing drumming his fingers on it as he walked along the borders of the roof, stopping when he reached the back of the building. Underneath the railing was the back gate of the school that was mostly used by teachers and the likes. It was a shorter distance to the building than the main entrance. Izuku could see some people walking past outside of the locked gate. He wasn't thinking when he pushed himself over the railing. His mind was blank as he stared down his feet, at the hard cement ground that seemed suddenly so close to him. His vision swayed and he felt like he was falling forward. The cold metal under his sweaty palms snapped him out of his trance. His hands tightened painfully around the railing. Sweat caused his palms to become slippery. The realization of what almost happened got his heart racing. What was he thinking? Was he really going to kill himself? Why? His obedient mind began replaying all the rejections he had received. I'm so sorry, Izuku, as his mama cried. You're a worthless, useless, stupid quirkless Deku. You should just die, screamed Kakan, red-faced. It's better to give up early than regret later on, said his hero, All Might. Maybe it was better to die. Maybe he'd be born with a quirk in his next life. But as he was contemplating, his mama's face appeared in his mind. Her crinkling eyes when she found him during hide-and-seek. Her soft laugh when she played heroes versus villains make-believe with him. Her warm smile when they watched hero movies together. Her beautiful, glowing emerald long hair under the sun. Her awkward pose as Izuku fumbled with the camera during their visit to All Might Amusement Park. All those happy memories surged up all at once. As Izuku thought back to how much his mama treasured him, how he was everything she had, his grip on the railing tightened. He couldn't do it. Not when he imagined how much pain it would bring to mama, how much she'd cry in his absence, or how she'd sit on the couch alone in the dark, with the TV's dim light dancing off of her dull, blank eyes that used to be so remarkably bright. How could he possibly hurt mama like this? How selfish was he to only think about his own pain and problems, and not spend a penny worth of thought on his mama? What kind of son was he? This was stupid. He shouldn't do this. He'd just be a cop. Or something. No matter what, he had to keep on living. For his mama's sake. Izuku didn't even realize he was shaking until he tried to get himself over the railing. 
The severity of the near-death situation just downed on him and all those fears that was absent turned out to be merely delay. He couldn't bring any power to his hands and the railing was too high for him to simply jump over. He couldn't stop trembling no matter how much he tried. He regretted doing this. He was so stupid. If he hadn't done this in the first place, then, then he wouldn't be falling off the roof right now. School just ended. It was a fairly normal day for Tabita. He didn't pay attention in class but instead doodled his hero costume in his elegant pocket notebook. Teachers yelled at him, and he just tuned them out as usual. Takeshita, the best student in the hero course, was popular with the girls as always, and according to the rumors, he had already been accepted to a hero agency. Tabita had sat aside and watched with masked disinterest and slight, suppressed envy as he ate his bento. Talking about bentos, his mom had been slacking off while making them. They used to be so aesthetically beautiful. Now, he lost his appetite whenever he looked at it. Well, at least it was still wrapped perfectly in his favorite furoshiki. One thing that made today slightly different was the parent conference in the principal's office. That arrowhead principal once again ranted about his behavior issues, but this time in front of his parents. Tabita had seen the gleeful looks in the man's eyes when his dad glared at him and his mother began crying in distress, and he didn't like it. It was a look full of mockery and superiority barely kept hidden behind fake pleasantries and professionalism. It was obvious that the principal had already given up on Tabita and lost all hopes of him ever achieving something remotely satisfactory. Arrowhead's mask had crumbled for a second when he mentioned how expulsion was a possible ending if Tabita didn't up his game. But it was quickly replaced with a concerned smile before his parents caught on to it. He thought that threat was enough to waver Tabita's determination. Well, it would take more than that. Tabita wasn't going to give up his hero dream if that was what he was planning. His optimism was his best weapon and he would continue fighting for a bright future. However, his grades indeed needed some polishing. Judging from the heated glares his father had been shooting him with, he won't be getting away scot-free this time. He would have to put more effort into his school work. But how do the teachers expect him to become a hero if they don't give him more opportunities to do actual hero stuff? Experiences were unnecessary requirements when applying for hero agencies. Thus, Tabita continued actively searching for opportunities to save people, and that led him to a crowd of people gawking at something high above them. Tabita glanced out of curiosity and found a window cleaner panicking on the suspended platform that was barely connected to the building, wire ropes snapping apart. It was his chance. Tabita grinned. He'd show them how heroic he was. He would save that man. The moment the last wire rope snapped, Tabita rushed forward, creating air cushions to launch himself towards the falling man. In his hurry, he didn't notice a hero rushing to rescue. The scene seemed to be going in slow motion. The man was falling, falling, and he was getting closer, closer. Then someone rammed into his barrier. Tabita gaped in shock as another man dressed like a pro hero frantically found his footing and jumped towards the fallen man yet again. But the encounter delayed his rescue and the man fell onto the ground in a sickening crack, the perfect sound effect of the current state of Tabita's heart. Later that day, today was a horrible day. Tabita decided when he was finally released by the furious hero and the police. His mother stayed back, still apologizing profusely as the police reminded her repeatedly the severity of her son's actions. This incident would be brought up to the principal, and with his already low reputation, expulsion seemed like it wasn't outside the range of possibilities. Great, just great. The sun was setting and the road home seemed longer than normal. Tabita shuffled his feet, staring hard at the stubborn ground. How he wished for the ground to open up and swallow him whole, right here, right now. Maybe life would be better if he lived in a hole. The world was too cruel for him. Heroes saved people, but where was his hero? His mind was a mess. Terrible thoughts of what was to be expected bombarded his bursting head. How would his parents react if he was actually expelled? How would his classmates react? Would he still be able to go to school? Was his parents going to kick him out? Could he still be a hero? The last question drifted a while longer in his mind as he took in his surroundings. He had walked upon the elementary school he always saw on his way home. Today was no different. The back gate was locked. The guard was snoring. A cat was stealing the fish off of his bento. The school was nearly empty. The roof was. Wait, is that? Tabita couldn't believe what he was seeing. He rubbed his eyes, then pinched himself just to make sure. A boy was standing on the edge of the rooftop, outside of the railing. He couldn't see the boy's face from afar, but judging by his slouched posture, it seemed like this was a suicide situation. For a moment, Tabita contemplated turning away and continuing his miserable life. His earlier incident was a clear indicator that he wasn't hero material. He had also failed the provisional hero license exam four times. He had faced rejections all his life and his attempts to help someone almost always ended up biting him in the rear. Why would this time be any different? It wasn't like saving one person would make him a hero anyway. But when he saw the boy attempt to climb back over the railing, but slipped and lost his footing, Tabita moved, his mind suddenly clear. 
Who cares if no one believed in him? Who cares if no one appreciated his help? Who cares if he'd be expelled tomorrow and his hero dream was likely crushed for life? If he was going to watch a child fall to his death without doing something to help, when he had the ability to do so, then he wasn't even a man, let alone a hero. Gently rebound, Tabita jumped onto the elastic barrier and launched over the locked gate. The guard remained asleep. He repeated the technique and another aerial cushion appeared underneath the fallen boy. Tabita prayed silently as he watched the boy land on the elastic, stretching it a little and bouncing back up. Tabita was already in position and he caught the boy's small body without much effort. All the energy seemed to vanish and Tabita fell onto his knees, his bangs drenched with sweat. Perspiration mixed with gel slid down his cheeks, making its way very uncomfortably into his uniform. That stubborn little curl once again escaped his gelled rest of his hair and flopped against his forehead. His heart was racing so fast he was sure the boy was able to hear it. Well, when he came out of the trance, that was. When his feet slipped and his grip slackened, Izuku was so sure that today was the last day of his life. As he was falling down, he didn't panic. It actually felt quite nice to be in the air, not restrained to any surface. He wondered briefly if anyone would save him. If All Might would. No, he clenched his eyes shut. All Might had no reason to show up at an ordinary elementary school. He was probably busy fighting villains on the street. No one was going to come to his rescue. The school was nearly empty. Most teachers already left. Nobody knew he was on the roof, except Kaken, who had already left the school. Izuku was going to die. His head was going to hit the concrete so hard it shattered to pieces, much like the state of his hero dream. No one would save him. No one. Izuku hit the ground. But he didn't feel any pain. The ground was surprisingly soft, and it seemed kind of stretchy, like rubber. Izuku thought as his fingers made contact with the ground, soft, slimy, but not wet, rubber. Izuku felt his body sink in, then bounce up, right into a pair of strong, steady arms. The world stopped spinning and all movement stilled. Izuku felt the silky smooth texture of clothing rubbing against his cheeks. He could faintly hear the beating of a fast thumping heart. He cracked open an eye slowly. The concerned face of a stranger filled his vision. Unable to believe what just happened, Izuku had to ask to make sure, did, you save me. The stranger let out a chuckle, sighing deeply, seems like you're okay. He bent down and allowed Izuku to stand on his own. Can you walk? Izuku tested a few steps. His legs felt like jelly. Yeah, no, you can't. The stranger interjected. He bent down, back facing Izuku. Get on, I'll carry you. I, I can't trouble you. You already saved my life. T that's more than enough. That's not enough. The man gently took Izuku's hand and placed it on his shoulder. You're probably still terrified of what just happened. I'm not leaving you to deal with the aftermath by yourself. Izuku got on his back reluctantly. Where do you live? 40. Okay, hang on tight. The man shifted Izuku so he could sit more comfortably. So tell me, what happened? Izuku bit his lips. It was a mistake in the first place. And now that he thought back to what he had tried to do, his face heated up and he tightened his clench on his savior's silky suit. He didn't want to tell the man who just saved him, that he had tried to kill himself merely because nobody told him what he wanted to hear. It would sound like he was just seeking attention. He was afraid the man would regret having saved him. After knowing he was just stupid, quirkless Deku who couldn't do anything right but still wanted attention when he didn't deserve them. Hey, the voice snapped Izuku out of his thoughts. I can't help you if you don't tell me your problems. People want to end their lives for all kinds of reasons. I am sure that whatever problems you are facing, there is someone in this world, right this moment, that's having the exact same problem as you are. So there's no need to feel embarrassed. Problems cannot be solved if they remain hidden, you know. Um, Izuku started. The man's words hit home. Was there really someone who'd also gone through what he had? Who knew what he was feeling? How do they overcome it? How do they deal with it? He wanted to know. I, unquirkless. There was no visible reactions from the man. But and, I want to be a hero. But, everyone told me I can't do it. Even my mama, even my best friend. Everyone laughed at me. I mean, I get it. I have no power so there's no way for me to become a hero. Hero's job is dangerous and if I do become one, I'd only slow everyone down. Biba, I just can't help it. I want to be a hero so bad. I think about it every day. Everything I do is so I can become a hero. Without that, if you take that dream away from me, then I... Izuku's voice cracked, unable to continue. Streams of tears rolled down his cheeks, blurring his visions. He wanted to bury his face into those broad shoulders, to seek comfort, and to cry to his heart's content, but he didn't want to cause the man any more trouble. The man stayed silent after Izuku's confession. Izuku waited, panicking. Did he say too much? Was the man mad at him? Hey, the man started. You don't get to choose what you yearn to be. Sometimes, your heart's words don't match up to what your logical mind's telling you. You know that it's impossible for a quirkless person to become a hero, but your heart only speeds up to the idea of becoming a hero. 
That cannot be controlled or suppressed by any means. Doing so would only cause you pain. If I can't stop that, then what can I do so I don't feel any more pain? The man turned his head and Izuku was shown the brightest smile he has ever seen. It wasn't the confident, victorious smile All Might symbolically held on his face everywhere he appears. It was the smile of someone giving their all to overcome the obstacles thrown at them. They may not win, but they were trying, and wishing with that hopeful smile on their face that everything would be alright, that they would win in the end. Do what your heart tells you. But, but I can't become a hero. And quirkless, other quirkless people may have failed to become a hero, but you're not them. They failed to do so, doesn't mean you will also fail. Many factors lead to failure. Who's to say those factors also apply to you? It's not always the end result that matters, it's the process. If you still failed to become a hero after giving it your all, you can at least look back and say, hey, I've done everything I can to achieve this dream, but I still failed. So it's not my fault. I've given it my all. You would have no regret. But if you were to give up now, then when you're older, you would look back and think, if I haven't given up back then, maybe, just maybe, I would have achieved this dream. It's my fault for not even giving it a try. Remember, even if there's a very small chance of success, it's still a chance. You can't say something is impossible without taking every opportunity to give a go at it. Izuku didn't know if the man did something with his quirk, but these words were like magic, suddenly clearing up his troubled mind and lighting up his path. All the uncertainty, anxiety vanished from his mind. This was the first time, someone told him, you can become a hero. Izuku's world stopped. Believe in that, give it your best, and see where that leads you. Life is filled with miracles and mystery. If you failed in the end, then oh well. At least you tried and have nothing to regret. If you succeeded, then, you'll be able to prove everyone wrong. You'll show them that the boy they looked down upon is now a hero. They'll have to rely on you to watch their backs. They'll look up to you, admire you, appreciate you. You'll be at a place so high up those bullies can't even reach the bottom of your shoes. As the man said this, his entire frame trembled. There was a determined grin on his face, and it lit up that flame of ambition that momentarily disappeared. Izuku shuddered as the infectious smile brought a wave of excitement coursing throughout his body. This was the first time in his life he felt like he could actually do this. No, he would become a hero, and no one, not even Kakin or All Might, could stop him. Izuku was burning with passion on the rest of the ride home. He opened up to his savior and told him his name, his hero All Might, his best friend Kakin and his explosive personality, his favorite person in the world, Mama, and pretty much gave the man an autobiography on himself. He also asked the man his name, which the man replied, My name is Tabaita, but call me gentle. I am aiming to become the gentle hero, someone who can save the spirits and heart of the victims with his mere presence and the mention of his name. Izuku was surprised to find out that the man was still in high school. He looked much older, or perhaps it was just due to the suit. In response to Izuku's confusion, the young man sheepishly admitted how he did poorly in school and had to drop back two grades. It was like a dam being broken. Many more embarrassing admissions flowed out of his lips. Izuku listened quietly as the young man recounted his life. How he got into a normal school with an okay hero course, but didn't work hard enough and failed all his classes. How he failed the hero license exam four times because he didn't put enough effort into it. And now, all those failures led up to him failing to save someone earlier the day, and was likely to be expelled. It's embarrassing, telling you to give it your all, but not staying true to those words myself, Gentle said, letting out an awkward laugh. But you saved me. Gentle seemed to have forgotten that he indeed had just saved Izuku's life, as he perked up with a ha. Even after failing so many times, you still didn't give up your hero dream. It's thanks to you that I can live on and give my hero dream a try. Thank you, Gentle. You're my hero. There was a long silence after that. Izuku cocked his head sideways and saw a streak of tears on Gentle's cheeks. His expression frozen, eyes widened, lips parted slightly in shock. Gee Gentle. Izuku held onto Gentle's shoulder when the teenager let go of one hand to wipe away his tears. It's the first time. First time ever. Gentle choked out, his voice trembling. I see. I can be a hero, too. I saved someone's life. I'm a hero. Izuku wasn't sure if Gentle was still talking to him, but he responded nonetheless. Yeah, you're a hero, Gentle. You're my hero. For the first time Izuku didn't want to enter his house. What's wrong? Gentle watched him with a gleeful smile. Do you need a save? A gentle hero is here for your convenience. Izuku laughed at the flashing pose Gentle striked. Ever since he told the teenager how he was now Izuku's favorite hero. The older boy didn't stop gloating over his confession. Gentle had probably gone through a lot more than what Izuku had. So to hear someone tell him all his efforts weren't wasted and that he was actually a hero must have felt pretty good. Izuku himself felt like he was sitting on clouds ever since Gentle told him he could become a hero. I have been saved enough for the day. Izuku chuckled. I can't just sit and wait for heroes to save me every time I'm in trouble. 
I need to start saving myself and other people, because that's what a hero does. Gentle's expression softened upon hearing those words. He crouched down and ruffled Izuku's fluffy curly hair. Nicely said, kid, now get inside the house and stop making your mom worry, because heroes don't make other people worry about their well-being. Gentle took out a pocket-sized notebook with intricate designs, looking as if it came right out of a medieval fantasy world. He scribbled something onto a page near the end and ripped it out, wincing slightly as if it caused him physical pain to hurt his notebook. Here, this is my phone number. Call me if you need Gentle the hero. And about what I said earlier, I too need to stop making people worry about me. I promise, next time you see this face, I will be a whole new Gentle. I will be a hero worthy of your admiration. Izuku took the slip of paper and carefully tucked it inside his pocket. I'll be waiting. He walked up to his door and slid his keys inside, unlocking it. He glanced back. Gentle stood there with a soft smile, making sure he made it inside his house safely. Izuku waved at him, grinned, and closed the door behind him. Something exploded in his face, followed by a shower of glitters. Izuku stood bewildered as the scene played out. Happy birthday. Izuku, Izuku-chan. His mama, Kakin, Kakin's mama and papa were standing at the doorstep, holding party poppers. Confetti fell all over Izuku and splayed in a mess on the ground. What took you so long? I got here an hour ago. Only Kakin would talk to him like this on his birthday. To be honest, that massive blow to his confidence yesterday had totally erased his birthday off of his mind. He should have realized yesterday when his mama told him to come home by himself for these two days because she got some errands to run that something was going on. Her overprotective nature would never let Izuku walk home by himself when he was still this young. Kakin's mama, Mitsuki, whacked Kakin on his head. Dumbass. She ignored Kakin's papa, Masaru's whispers, language, Mikin. I told you to walk home with Izuku. What happens if a villain wants to eat some children today and snatches one of you? I did wait. That idiot never showed up. So I left by myself. No you didn't wait. Izuku wasn't gonna call him out on it, though, since he could understand where he was coming from. Kakin would never allow himself to be seen walking home together with Izuku like they were friends. Anyway, why don't we keep the scolding for tomorrow? Today is a day of happiness and celebration. Let's start by exchanging presents. Izuku wondered why his mama looked more excited than he, the birthday boy, was. That thought was thrown to the back of his mind. However, as the two families situated themselves in the living room, at the foot of a big All Might poster was a bunch of presents. Izuku couldn't sit still. He jumped up from his seat next to Kakin and bounced excitedly. So which one first? Which one first? Hum, which one do you want to open first? Izuku plunged into the pile of presents, feeling and shaking all of the unmarked boxes. He chose the smallest box in the end. I'll open this one first. Kakin tensed up. For the past few years Kakin didn't get him anything, which always resulted in a heavy head bashing from Mitsuki the next day. Perhaps Kakin did it this year to escape his mama's fist? Izuku wasn't sure, but he was eager to see what Kakin had gotten him. He peeled the horribly wrapped box carefully, so slowly Kakin had to yell, hurry up, I don't have all day, and got another whack in the head. He didn't know what to expect, but he definitely wasn't expecting a small device designed and colored like the face of All Might with a strap connected to it and a hook on the end. On the strap were red, blue, and yellow beads that spelled out D-E-K-U. This is a security alarm for kids. Katsuki spent months saving up his allowance to buy this little thing. He said, and I quote, Deku needs someone to look out for him and I can't be there all the time. He even sold some of his valuable hero collection cards to earn money. Shut up. Shut up you old hag. Kakin was blushing furiously. He kept punching his mama in response, which was pretty much the most he would do when it came to his mama. He would never in his life use his quirk and attack her for real. Izuku rolled the security alarm around in his palm. It was small, lightweight, and easily accessible. He pulled the strap just to test it out. As soon as the strap disconnected from the device, a shrill screeching cry emitted from it, halting all movements in the living room. Izuku hurriedly plugged the strap back in and the cry stopped. I Izu-chan. His mama started, voice hesitant. Don't do that again. Oh okay. Unless it's an emergency. Oh, okay, mama. Sorry. Izuku was the closest so he received the worst from it. He definitely wasn't doing that again unless it was a life and death situation. He turned to Kakin and gave him his biggest smile to showcase his appreciation. Thank you so much, Kakin. I'll treasure this. HMPH. Whatever. Next up, Izuku picked out Mitsuki's gift. It was a dozen round rubber balls that would explode into a blinding light if certain conditions were made. Mitsuki got him six that explodes on impact and six that explodes six seconds after the initial impact. They were the child toy version of the flash bombs some heroes used. You're turning six so these numbers should be easy to remember. I thought you might need something to delay your bullies so you can run away. Mitsuki later apologized for accidentally making it 666, the devil's number. Masaru's present was an All Might-themed bicycle. 
Kaken couldn't stand Izuku following him around riding a tricycle designed for babies. So he took it upon himself and taught Izuku how to ride without the supporting wheels. It may have taken almost half a year and Kaken's almost giving up over a dozen times. But eventually Izuku was able to ride a normal bicycle and Kaken's ego was boosted incrementally after that. Next up was Mama's present. It was a thin envelope. I couldn't think of anything else to get you since you pretty much have all the All Might mercs you wanted, so I got you that. Now that, thought him curious. What else did he want that he hadn't gotten yet? Izuku tore the envelope in and shook out the content. It fell onto the carpet ground soundlessly. With trembling hands, Izuku held up a golden badge with the letters YHP, engraved across the bottom. Is, is this? Izuku's hands trembled as he held onto the crest he had only seen been worn on other, older children's proud chest. You've been accepted to Youth Hero Program, congratulations. Mama said in her best broadcaster voice, making everyone laugh. I I I love it. Thank you mama. Izuku dived into his mama's open arms and smothered her with wet kisses, earning more laughs from the family. Last but not least was the biggest box from Papa, even bigger than the box for the bicycle. Izuku unpacked it, only to see another box inside. He cut through that, only to see another slightly smaller box under it. He continued killing boxes for at least 30 minutes until he finally got to the surprise. It was a game disc. What a surprise. If the game had been packaged normally, Izuku would be excited to play it. Now, he along with everyone else were so hateful of the dozens of unnecessary boxes that he simply set the game aside and grumbled, stupid papa. The game disc was given the silent treatment for the rest of the party. Izuku had a lot of fun and he believed it was sufficient to say that today was the best day in his life. He not only met the one who believed in him, he also received numerous awesome presents including the news of his enrollment to YHP. That was probably the best gift he had received. By the time the day was over, both families were exhausted. The Bakugo family had to drag an unwilling Kakan away from Mama's homemade spicy popcorn. He only stopped yelling at the top of his lungs when Mama packed the rest into a Ziploc bag and let him take it home. Izuku helped Mama clean up the haywire resulting from Bakugo's presence then he took a shower while Mama did dishes. He had to get a good night's sleep considering he had school tomorrow. But when he passed the living room and saw the game disc, he hesitated. After all, it was still a birthday present and birthday presents were supposed to be opened on the day they were received. After getting the permission from Mama to only check it out, Izuku raced upstairs into his gaming room and inserted the disc into the console. As he waited for the game to load, he scrutinized the case. The cover was black with only the words Game of Life written on it in sketchy, messy scrawls. There was nothing else in, or on, the case. No brand name, summary, game type, no nothing. Izuku wondered what Papa was thinking when he bought this game. The game had finished loading. The startup screen was suspicious as well. It was a completely dark screen with the sentence, Click any button to continue. Izuku did, and led to the next screen. The same background, but more sentences. The top was a quote, Life is a game. In a world where 80% are VIP players, being quirkless means your game of life will be more difficult than the others. No matter your difficulty level, this is the one game everyone has to play. Game over or refusal to play means the end of your life. Every choice matters. Make your choice wisely. Normal easy. Despite how sketchy this game was, there was something about it that made Izuku want to know more. His finger hovered over the confirmation button that the top choice highlighted. Izuku had almost died, twice, today. He knew how much he valued his life and there was no way he was going to even risk the chance of losing his life again. He pressed. The screen blacked out. Then, as if Izuku had just put on his 3D glasses, the black screen wiggled out of the TV screen and paddled on thin air using its two lower corners. It stopped a few feet away from Izuku, and, with a glass-shattering visual and sound effect, the black rectangle crumbled into tiny pieces, leaving behind a RPG player profile screen with blue-tinted letters, much like what one would see with VR goggles. The bluish screen enlarged and Izuku could see five tabs on top, with the current display being the first tab, Profile. Underneath it was a hologram of him wearing a shirt and shorts with slots surrounding him. Next to it was a game-like stat sheet. Name, Midoriya Izuku. Title, None. LV, 1 EXP, 0 divided by 100. HP, 100 over 100. MP, 100 over 100. Age, 6. Quirk, None. STR, 3. DEF, 4. SPE, 4. DEX, 4. Luck, 8. Rep points, 0. Techniques, None. Izuku wasn't sure how long he sat there, just staring dumbly at the screen. The controller had long since fallen onto the ground. It wasn't until he heard the shower turn off in the bathroom when he snapped out of it. In a rush, he left the game disc inside the console when he shut it down. He made it safely to his bed before Mama checked on him. He had promised to go to sleep before she finished showering, and he didn't want to be scolded on his birthday. Lying on his bed, Izuku finally accepted the situation. 
He wasn't even sure what to accept. That he could now see a VR screen without VR goggles. That he was playing some sort of game that turned his physical body characteristics into stats. He had to look more into this. The screen had disappeared. Izuku thought back to it, wishing for it to appear, and it did, floating yet again in the air in front of Izuku. This time he noticed a banner at the bottom of the screen. Tutorial A brief explanation of the control panel. <laughs> Izuku thought about pressing the first option. But before his finger touched the screen, the option was selected automatically, as if it could be controlled with his mind. Even better. This way Izuku wouldn't be labeled as the quirkless freak who tried to touch air. It's a pleasure to meet you, master. A metallic sphere popped into existence. It had a slit across the middle that revealed a wide terrifying eye, and a smaller slit beneath it as a mouth with jagged teeth. It continued in its monotonous voice. I'm GOLA1412 here for your service. Feel free to call me Gola. Can I call you something else? No. Wow. Its hardedness rivaled the hardness of its shell. Izuku was a little creeped out by the freaky eye that bored into him, unblinking, but he stood his ground. He was aiming to be a hero. He could handle this. Now, let us continue. There are five tabs. The first one, profile, shows your profile, obviously. You have to be a complete retard to not understand it. Izuku felt a little insulted, pouting. He glared defiantly at the Cyclops creature. The second tab, quests, shows the status of your quests, which you don't have any currently. Quests can be obtained in many ways. They often give satisfactory rewards so make sure you complete as many quests as you can find. Even the side quests can prove beneficial in the long run. You never know when you'll need a strand of hair from All Might or a catnip. Izuku had an urge to protest, but he stuffed it down not wanting Gola to throw any more casual insults around. The third tab, Bazaar, has five categories of items that you can purchase with your reputation point, which are gained by becoming popular. They are gadgets, costumes, disposable items, misc, and last but not least, Diararu Amruo. A fast rhythmic beat echoed in his room. Izuku wondered if he was the only one who could hear it seeing how his mama didn't barge in panicking. Quirks, wait, quirks. Izuku slapped a hand over his mouth when he let slip a shriek. Master, you can talk to me telepathically. I can hear your thoughts. SS so you're saying that. That I can actually buy quirks. Any quirk. Can I have multiple quirks? What kind of quirks are there? Master, you will be able to unlock the bazaar once you earn a reputation point. But to do that, you'll need to complete quests. Before Izuku could ask more, Gola continued, next tab is map. It will show nearby quests and your current location. And the last tab is inventory. You currently have five slots available. More will be unlocked as you level up. It allows you to store and retrieve non-living objects. Same objects can stack. This concludes the tutorial. Do you have any questions, master? Yes. Izuku excitedly waved his hand. So about the quirk. How do I get a quirk? Master, there are many ways. You can buy quirks in the bazaar for 10,000-100,000 points each. Some rare quests may reward you a quirk upon completion. You can also choose a free quirk every 10 levels you level up. Any other questions? Um, about the inventory. Tusk. Gola clicked its tongue like it was annoyed. It did a very obvious eye roll, not even attempting to hide its annoyance. Izuku gulped. Now he felt bad. Last question, I promise. So how do I put stuff into the inventory? Fairly simple. Just put your hand on it and visualize the item inside a slot. It will appear inside. Is that all, master? Why yeah. Gola vanished, its body breaking down into cubes which proceeded to crumble into smaller cubes. Soon, the cubes became as small as air particles and couldn't be seen by the naked eye. Izuku lay back down onto his soft pillow. He grabbed his watch from his nightstand and tried putting it inside the inventory. It worked on the first try. Wow, he gasped in awe, ogling at the small watch icon in the slot. Cool, he whispered. That night, Izuku played around with the inventory for a long time until he finally fell asleep. In his dream, he saw himself getting into the best hero school, UA High School, and meeting many popular heroes. He made many friends, became popular, and even talked with All Might again. The dream ended with him saving All Might's life and being hailed a hero by the public. The next morning, Izuku woke up to All Might's shouts of I'm here. I'm here. He turned off his blaring alarm in a swift motion and rolled out of the bed. Tiny feet made contact with the cold floor, making him shiver. As he was getting ready for school, he spotted the presents he received yesterday. It was definitely a smart move to carry a security alarm on him at all time, but he didn't want to risk the strap accidentally disconnecting and causing a false alarm. Therefore, he stored it into a slot in the inventory. Next up, he stored the 12 mini flash bombs, taking up two slots, with one being those that exploded upon impact, and the second being those that took six seconds to explode. Then Izuku saw the bike. It would be convenient to have a transportation tool wherever he went, but its disappearance would cause his mama to panic, so that was a no-go. He looked around his room, and at last decided to store all his hero analysis notebooks in the inventory. 
They all took up one slot because they were the same type of items. Those were his treasures and losing them would be painful. Izuku left the last slot empty for emergencies. During breakfast, Izuku couldn't stop wiggling in his chair. On one hand, he desperately wanted to tell his mama what happened last night. But on the other hand, he was afraid of her response. His mama was an easily scared person. It was very likely for her to react negatively to the game of life. Maybe she'd even think something was wrong with his head and take him to the hospital. Or scold him for making things up. But again, she was the most important person in his life. After everything she'd done for him, he felt like she deserved to know. Is something the matter? Izuku twirled his spoon absent-mindedly. No dot 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 not really. I'll tell you later, mama. Now wasn't the time. He'd tell her when he had everything figured out. It was still possible that somebody was playing a trick on him. When he finished eating, he waited by the entrance as he watched Mama take out her bicycle from the backyard. Mama always took him to school on a bike, but today, Izuku wanted to try something different. Mama, can I ride my new bike to school? Mama bit her lips, frowning. Okay, but Mama's riding with you, and we're not riding on the street. It's too dangerous for you. Yeah, after getting her confirmation, Izuku eagerly brought out his new All Might bicycle. The red, blue, and yellow glowed under the morning sun much like All Might's presence in the face of danger. Do you have your security alarm on you? Izuku pushed his hand into his pocket, retrieved the item from inventory, and brought it out. It's in my pocket. Good boy. Mama smiled. She got on the bike, and Izuku did the same alongside her. Izuku, you ride in the front, so Mama can keep an eye on you. Okay. The ride to school was a totally different experience. Walking was too slow. Sitting in a car made it too fast. Bicycling was just the right pace to have a good look at the surroundings before the scenery changed. School wasn't very far from their house, so even with Izuku riding in a slow speed for safety reasons, they arrived at the school in less than 10 minutes. Perhaps it was his imagination, but Izuku felt like everyone was watching him dot 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 and oh, staring at his bike. When he entered the school, his mama waving goodbye by the entrance. For the first time, Izuku didn't cower under the stairs. He felt powerful, just like whenever he dressed in his mini All Might One Piece. He felt motivated and that he could succeed in anything. The bike seemed to have the same effect on his spirit. The day went by in a flash. Izuku had his entire mind on the YHP that he barely caught onto what the teacher was saying. The game of life screen also kept him distracted during class. After flipping through the dictionary, he decided to call it digitalization, which was, and he quote, the process of converting information into a digital format. There was no better name for a game that turned his entire life into a digital game. As it turned out, Izuku could use digitalization to observe other people's levels. It occurred when he stared at Kaken and wondered what Kaken's level was. You have learned. Back Hugo Katsuki LV1. Izuku was surprised to find that Kaken was the same level as he was. Perhaps a person's level was determined by their age or their grade in school. To testify his hypothesis, Izuku used observe on the rest of his classmates. Plus one, the notification popped up every time he used it, and soon observe had reached level two. As it turned out, Everyone in his class was level 1. It made Izuku feel a little bit better. That quirk didn't play a role in a person's level. Just for fun, Izuku also observed his teacher, Yama-sensei, a bald, middle-aged man with a triangle-shaped head. His features were all crumbled together and he made grumpy frowning faces at everyone, as if everyone owed him money. His quirk allowed him to blend into the mountain upon contact. He turned out to only be at level 5. Izuku continued playing around with Observe for the rest of the day. Kaken didn't seem to pay him any mind and he didn't actively try to initiate a conversation either. Kaken seemed to be in a bad mood after their homeroom teacher scolded him early in the morning for something Izuku was unsure of, and that caused him to literally explode every time someone talked to him. Everyone could sense his bad mood and stayed out of his path for the rest of the day. When school ended, Izuku met Kaken's mother, Mitsuki, at the gate who was there to pick up Kaken. When she saw Izuku and his mama getting on their respective bikes, she complimented them on how it was a good exercise and a good bonding time between family members. She wished she could do the same with Kaken, but that was even less likely than his being nice to her for once. That night, Izuku barely got any homework done because he was so excited for YHP tomorrow. He couldn't even sleep, so he reread all his superhero comics until sleep took over him. The next morning, Izuku woke up to his mama tickling his feet. He dodged and pushed her hands away, giggling. But in the end her flimsy fingers always wiggled their way to his ticklish spots. Emma, Mama, eh stop. Izuku laughed so hard he was crying. While avoiding those menacing fingers, he accidentally kicked Mama in the face. Now I got you, little devil, Mama faked an evil laugh. It was such a bad imitation Izuku almost burst out laughing again. And he did when Mama tickled his captured feet continuously until he surrendered. Im up, im up. Izuku sat up, clenching his stomach and wheezing. 
His cheeks still had tracks of tears on them, and his mouth was so sore from smiling he swore he would never do this to anyone, not even someone he greatly disliked. It was too cruel. Aside from waking up, Izuku did everything else as fast as possible. He brushed his teeth at a flying speed, splashed water on his face, wiped them dry, and rubbed lotion all over, making a mess of his face and had to have his mama fix it all up. He got dressed in his favorite All Might t-shirt and a pair of dark green shorts. As he wolfed down his cereal, Izuku asked after swallowing his mouthful, Is Kakin going? Unfortunately no, honey. Mitsuki signed him up for drum lessons on the weekends. Katsuki-kun asked for it himself, actually. He said it's a musical instrument befitting of his quirk and personality. Oh, Izuku resumed eating. He didn't like the feeling of satisfaction that rose within him upon hearing that Kakin wouldn't be a company and tormenting him in YHP too. It made him feel guilty, like he'd done something wrong. The rest of the breakfast was filled with Izuku bouncing around in his seat in excitement and his mama smiling softly. When the two were ready to leave the house, his mama paused in front of her bike and gave him a serious look. Izuku, you know, mama is very sorry. I've said something very awful to you back then. I gave up on you when you needed me the most. I was afraid to let you pursue your dream because I think it's too far out of the reach of a quirkless boy. And that fear of mine dragged you down. I should have been there for you, supporting your dream, giving you the push on your back you desperately need it, like a mother should do. I'm so sorry for realizing that too late. But starting now, you have Mama's support no matter what. Mama has faith in you. Izuku, you can be a hero. Can you forgive Mama? Familiar burning returned to his eyes. Izuku didn't say anything. He simply ran into Mama's open arms and hugged her with all his might, breathing in her scent, mesmerizing in her touch, not wanting to let go. He thought back to how he had wanted to end his life. Yet here Mama was supporting him deep inside, and he never knew. He was so glad Gentle had saved him yesterday. Otherwise, what would happen to Mama? I forgive you, Mama. The ride to YHP was silent. He caught Mama sneaking glances at him, and he just grinned, pressing a fist to his chest, eyes determined. As they pulled up to YHP, there was already a teacher at the entrance. She was a young woman with brown hair wrapped up in a loose bun. Her large, soft caramel eyes were clear like the cloudless sky. Welcome to Youth Hero Program. I'm Shimura-sensei. You must be Midoriya-san and Izuku-kun, Shimura-sensei said with a big smile. Nice to meet you, Shimura-san. I'll be entrusting Izuku to you. Mama turned to him as he got off his bike. Now, go become a hero, Izuku. Just watch me, Mama. I'll be the biggest hero you've ever seen. With one last hug and kiss from Mama, Izuku walked his bike towards the kind lady, watching Mama speed away into the distance. The new character who shows up in this chapter is a canon villain. She's a new character in the manga so if you're not up to date with it, you most likely don't know her. Just to point it out so you guys don't mistaken her as an OC. I feel like this chapter can be a lot better, but every time I rewrite it, my enthusiasm dampened a little. So I decide to publish it before I lose all interest in this chapter and make it a lot worse. YHP was the acronym for Youth Hero Program. It was an after-school program designed for children who dreamed of becoming a hero. It began many years ago when All Might made his debut as the symbol of peace. His debut inspired many people to become heroes, and the nation was in desperate need of an institution to satisfy those children's hero dreams when too many children got injured while attempting to commit heroic acts in public. And thus, YHP was established to take in those children and teach them how to use their quirks accurately, how they can be applied to save and rescue missions, and to give them a taste of the job as a hero by allowing them to commit heroic acts under safe conditions and pro-hero supervision. Over the years, rate of illegal public usage of quirks had decreased. Although the police couldn't punish the children for committing that offense, they could give warnings to the parents, but that often didn't do much. The legal use of quirks wasn't an extremely severe crime, unless the offender had caused serious injury to people and or the environment. The most they would receive was a verbal warning and probably a negative counseling on their first attempt. If they were a student, the school they attend may choose to suspend the student if they felt necessary. However, if destruction of property, and, or injury or even death to another individual was factored, then the minor would be placed in juvenile detention center for up to a year and their school could choose to expel them. If it was an adult, they would be in prison for up to three years, depending on the severity of the crime. YHP had also taught many current pro-heroes. Their reputation was fairly high in the public and was wildly registered as the program you must send your kids to if you want them to become heroes. There were many youth hero programs all around the nation to make up for the high registration rate. Each installation only had 30 or so children in the program at once. And as the oldest children leave the program, the youngest ones would be accepted into the program. YHP consisted of one big classroom and an outdoor pool. The staff consisted of roughly three teachers and three heroes. Pro-heroes were often invited to give speeches, classes, and demonstrations, and to supervise students and activities. 
They were paid but many refused and instead did it for free. Izuku paid close attention as Shimura-sensei gave him a quick tour of the place. He noticed the map tab of the screen now displayed a perfect 3D map of the schoolhouse. At the end of the tour, Shimura-sensei led him to the classroom, and here's where you'll meet your friends for the next six years. Are you ready? Izuku nodded, swallowing thickly. Oh, and put your badge on. It's identification that you're now officially a part of the YHP program. After Izuku proudly pinned the badge onto his shirt, Shimura-sensei gave him a confident smile and a thumbs up. You'll be fine, Izuku-kun. They are all very nice children. Izuku nodded meekly and braced himself as Shimura-sensei opened the door. To a sunny green field full of laughing children running around, Izuku froze. He cranked his neck to check the ceiling, which was a cloudless sky so real you wouldn't think there was a ceiling at all. Genji-sensei, the new students here. Shimura-sensei called out to a male teacher standing on a swing attached to a giant oak tree. Many children surrounding him were trying to drag him down from the swing. Genji-sensei perked up when he heard his name. Then he snapped his finger and the room returned to an ordinary classroom. Wait here, Shimura-sensei whispered to Izuku as she shut the door. Izuku paced back and forth outside the doorway, wringing his hands together nervously as the reluctant shuffling of the children and the sound of chairs scraping the floor filled his ears. Now now now, we'll continue after we introduce the new student, came Genji-sensei's voice. New student is here. One kid shouted, I heard it's a boy. I heard it's a girl. Is he cute? What's his quirk? Can he fly? Oh I wanna see someone fly ye. Class, calm down. You'll see in a second. Shimura-sensei called out in Izuku's direction. Izuku-kun, are you ready? Izuku nodded despite having no one around to see it. He took a deep breath as he placed his hand on the door handle. With heart pumping loudly against his chest, he slid the door open and stepped through the door with straightened back and head held high. Mama always told him that no matter how scared he was, if he walked like he got this, he would succeed. He made his way to the blackboard with his eyes staring directly forward. Without looking at his classmates, he turned around and scrawled his name on the board. Why don't you introduce yourself? Anything you want the class to know about you, Shimura-sensei said when he finished. Oh okay, Izuku squeaked as he faced the class. And my name is. His voice got caught up in his throat when he took a good look of his classmate. Gola, what is this? He thought. This means these people have quests to offer. Gola's voice replied in his mind. Izuku stared wide-eyed at three of his classmates who had an exclamation mark floating above their heads. How do I accept these quests? The quest notification will appear when you near them. Izuku-kun. Shimura-sensei's voice snapped Izuku out of his thoughts. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. My eyes spaced out. The class giggled at Izuku's frantic stuttering. His face burned in embarrassment as he finished his introduction quickly. And my name is Midoriya Izuku. I'm six years old and I'm from Aldera Elementary School. Um, my favorite hero is All Might, be but my idol is Gentle. The class murmured, who's Gentle? Never heard of him. Gentle is the hero who saved my life and gave me hopes for my dream. Izuku explained. And here came the bomb. I, unquirkless. Izuku had to force himself not to look down in fear of rejection. The class looked surprised, but they didn't look at him with pity in their eyes or contempt. It was just slight surprise. That was it. Everyone told me I can't be a hero because I'm quirkless, but Gentle was the first person who told me I can and I will. He made me feel powerful. He gave me confidence and a reason to live. That's why he's my hero. The class was quiet and there was understanding in some children's eyes. After a moment, Shimura-sensei coughed. That's great to hear, Izuku-kun. I'm glad you're able to find that person in your life. The one who inspires you, motivates you, and is the reason behind your strength. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share? Like hobbies, what do you do in your free time? Izuku felt his face heat up when he realized he had been talking about Gentle the entire time, and not a single thing about himself. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. He scratched his head awkwardly as the class laughed. Not a jeering laughter, but a light-hearted laugh. My hobbies are collecting hero cards and catching bugs. T that's all. Thank you, Izuku-kun. Your seat is between Henshin-kun and Manami-chan. There was only one empty seat. A boy with short orange hair and large, curious eyes was on the left of it, and a girl with messy hair hiding her face was on the other side. Interestingly, she had an exclamation mark above her head. To be safe, Izuku observed as he made his way down the rows. Plus one, Namamano Henshin LV5. Plus one, Eba Manami LV8. When he settled himself in between the two of them, he received the quest notification. Quest alert. Description. Aba Manami is a girl with lots of issues troubling her. Be a hero to her and make her smile. Time limit. None. Reward. 100 EXP. 1 reputation point. Failure. This was the first quest Izuku received. Of course he had to accept. The first option was selected as soon as his thought was received by the system. Aba's head was bowed, but Izuku could see her peeking at him through her bangs. When she was caught staring, she quickly smoothed out her hair in an attempt to act casual and cover up her eyes in the process. 
Hi, I'm Izuku. You must be a, I mean, Manami-chan. Izuku quickly corrected himself. He wasn't supposed to know her full name yet. Nice to meet you. He offered a hand, which Aba took in a loose grip. Nice to meet you, she whispered. How old are you? Eight. No wonder her level is so high, Izuku wondered. But then how come Yama-sensei's level is only five? So I guess you've been here for a while. I hope we can be friends. Maybe you can tell me what YHP is like later. Izuku added when she didn't respond. If you feel like it. After a while, Aba nodded. Izuku felt a tap on his shoulder. Namamoto took back his hand and whispered, Don't mind her. She's always like that. She's also quirkless. Izuku paled, a horrible feeling rising in his stomach. He thought of all the times he tried to make new friends, and would later see someone telling them he was quirkless. Later, the new friend he made would stop talking to him. He hated when people tell others that, especially people he was trying to be friends with. It made him feel like they were trying to say, He's quirkless, so don't be friends with him. Before he could hold back, Izuku blurted out, It's none of your business. If Minami-chan doesn't want me to know, then she won't tell me. It's rude to speak for her. Izuku was inwardly freaking out as Namamano's face turned red, then paled. He rarely, if ever, talked to someone like this. The few times he tried standing up to Kakan always ended up with him being a crying mess by the end of the day. He should have watched what he say, especially to someone he met for the first time. A quirkless kid like him shouldn't act so snarky towards someone with a quirk. Fearing Namamano's reactions, Izuku avoided looking at anything but the blackboard for the rest of the class. After the teachers explained to them their schedule for the day, their break continued. Genji Sensei, whose level turned out to be 25, turned the room into nature once again. As soon as words of permission left Shimura Sensei's lips, the active ones broke into a run across the clear horizon. The more reserved ones stayed in their own little groups, while the remaining children were by themselves. Izuku hurried after Aba who sat down on one of the swings. He flopped down on the swing next to her and began, Hey, Aba didn't respond. I'm really sorry for what Henshin Kun said today. I'm sure he didn't mean it. So, don't take it to heart. Aba was fiddling with her hair as she kicked the swing into motion. After a while, she murmured, I'm used to it. He's just an idiot. He always says things without thinking. See, she pointed at something, someone. It was Namamano. He rushed at them with both hands behind his back. Izuku stilled, hands clutching the ropes tightly. His fear grew with every step the other boy took towards them. For a moment, the image of Kakan overlapped with Namamano. Their form enlarged and their mouth cracked into a gaping, thirsty grin. Izuku shut his eyes when the beast arrived. Um, Eba-san. He heard. It was a timid, shy voice. The completely opposite of what he had envisioned. I'm sorry for being so rude to you. Izuku snapped his eyes open in surprise. He wasn't expecting an apology of all things. I wasn't thinking when I said that. I didn't mean to offend you. P please forgive me. Namamano bowed low, body quivering slightly. What is it this time? To Izuku's surprise, Aba sighed. It better not be your lunch. Your mom's meat buns sure are delicious but I'm not eating your lunch again and leaving you to starve. Stop punishing yourself physically every time you offend someone. That's not it. Namamano straightened himself and brought his hands to the front, opening his palm carefully, revealing a four-leaf clover. It's my treasure. I've had it for years and always kept it beside me as a lucky charm. I'm giving this to you to prove it to you that this will be my last time offending you. Don't give it to me. Aba glanced at Izuku. It was the first time Izuku saw her eyes. They were large, beautiful pink eyes with ringed pupils. It's our new student who you angered today, not me. So if you want to apologize, go to him. Izuku suddenly grew anxious when the attention shifted to him. Before his imagination could run wild with this situation, Namamano bowed low and presented the four-leaf clover to him. I'm sorry, Midoriya-kun. Please forgive me. I promise I'll think before I talk next time. Why you don't have to. Just accept it. Aba shook her head and actually chuckled. He won't leave you alone unless you accept his apology. Oh okay then. Izuku let out a dry laugh and took the four-leaf clover. Ping. You have received. Simply store the item into the inventory and equip it to use it. All the noise dimmed as Izuku focused on the notification that popped up the moment his fingers touched the plant. I thought I can only put non-living items inside. Izuku thought. Gola's voice replied instantly in his head. Yes, but this item has a special effect, which makes it a disposable item. That means it's something you can use once and throw away. Any items in the four categories, costume, gadgets, disposable items, and mist can be stored inside the inventory. Izuku willed the notification to close then examined the little lucky charm. It was amazing how something so small and easily overlooked could be this powerful. He marveled at it for a couple minutes more, then shoved it into his pocket, hiding his hand from plain view and storing it into his inventory to conserve its condition. So, Heba began. Yes, it was then that Izuku noticed the absence of Namamano, that gentle hero you mentioned earlier. You said he saved you and supported your hero dream. Yes he did. 
He didn't even know me. Yet he put his believed me that I can become a hero. Can you tell me? Ava began fiddling with her hair again. She bit her lips, hesitated. Then said in a voice so quiet Izuku almost didn't hear it. Where do you find someone like that? Someone like. Gentle. Yeah. Someone who tells you you can become a hero. I believe in you. Things like that. Where do you find such a person? Aba tilted her head and Izuku got a clear view of her face. Her watery eyes were filled with uncertainty and hopelessness as they fixated on Izuku with an insurmountable amount of force and resolution. Her entire body trembled and her grip on the ropes attached to the swing tightened. Hi. Izuku didn't know what to say. He had met Gentle by chance. Was there a second Gentle in this world? If there was, how to find them? The silence dragged on as Izuku wrecked his brain for something to say. Anything. I, I'm right here. Somehow those words were able to form from his blank slate of mine. I will be your gentle. What do you mean? Izuku placed a hand on his chest, unwavering gaze meeting Ava's eyes. This was the only thing he thought of and he just had to go with the flow. At this moment, Gentle's voice whispered in his ears, and Izuku let the words flow out of his lips. Manami-chan, I believe in you. Whatever dream you have, I believe you can achieve it. Don't ever stop trying. Remember, even if there's a very small chance of success, it's still a chance. You can't say something is impossible without taking every opportunity to give a go at it. You have to believe in yourself and tell yourself, I can do it. Aba's eyes was overflowing with tears at the end of Izuku's encouragement. He couldn't find a gentle for her, but he could become her gentle. Just like what gentle did to him, he would now pass down the wise words that motivated him to another quirkless person in need. And no, you're lying. Why? Ava's body shook violently with each sob that escaped her quivering lips. You don't even know me. Why would you? Because you look like a hero to me, Izuku whispered, and I'd hate to see you give up your dream. TT thank you. Ava choked out as tears streamed down her face. She covered her face in her hands, head bowed low so her hair could cover her tears. Izuku thought back to yesterday, when he wanted to bury his face into Gentle's shoulder and cry to his heart's content. Ava must be feeling the same way. The fire that burned in the pit of his stomach, the way his heart sped up at the words and his vision brightened, the adrenaline that coursed throughout his body and made him feel like he could punch through a wall if he wanted to, and the urge to hold onto someone and bawl his eyes out. So he rose from his swing and knelt down in front of Ava. He touched her shoulder gently to make sure he didn't scare her and that she was alright with physical contact, and wrapped his arms around her, letting her bury her face into the crook of his neck and allowing her sobs to be muffled by his shirt. After a while, the sobbing girl hesitantly wrapped her arms around him. They stayed like that for a while, not caring what others would think if they saw the scene. Izuku had dealt with worse kinds of reactions, so this was no biggie. He supposed Aba had too, judging from her reactions. When the scenery around them returned to their normal, spacious classroom, signaling the end of break, Aba loosened her hold and Izuku leaned back. She glanced away when Izuku asked, Are you feeling better? Yeah. Her voice was a little rough. Thank you, Izuku. Thank you for being there for me. A warm feeling blossomed in Izuku's chest, causing his lips to upturn involuntarily. You're welcome. You don't mind me calling you Izuku, do you? No no no, I don't mind. What about you? Do you mind me calling you Minami-chan? No, Minami smiled. It was a beautiful smile, like the first rays of sunlight that peeked through the curtains on an early morning. Not at all. During the next class, the teachers showed them a documentary on heroes and quirks. It was a film Izuku had watched so many times if he watched any more he was sure his eyes would bleed. While all the other students were giving their full attention to the screen, Izuku chanted Gola's name three times in his mind. On the third time, the metallic little cyclops popped into existence, the bacon hanging out of its wide mouth inches away from Izuku's nose. W-O-A-H-H-H. -H -H. Izuku jerked back in his seat, arms flailing and hitting the boy behind him. The wolf-eared boy hissed at him as he clutched his bleeding nose in pain. I, I am so sorry. The boy ignored his profuse apology and stormed his way out of class. The murmurs died down when Shimura-sensei made her annoyance shown. Gola had a nasty smirk on its face when Izuku glared at him. It's a pleasure to see you again, master. It sneered, and Izuku wanted so desperately to punch that fa, no, what was he thinking? That was something Kaken would do. He had to control himself. Do you even need to eat? Izuku grumbled instead in his mind. Do humans need cookies to survive? No, then why do humans eat cookies? Why do humans sing, dance, watch movies, do so many things that aren't necessary for survival? Izuku had no answer for that. The answer is because it brings them joy. Another slice of juicy bacon materialized in thin air and Gola snatched it inside its mouth with its long tongue. If humans are allowed to do things for their enjoyment, why am I not allowed? Why do I get questioned for enjoying myself? Don't you think that's unfair? Ugh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Izuku bowed his head in shame. The conversation curved downward so quickly he couldn't react in time. He could only go with what Gola said. Come on master, don't look so down. You just made your first achievement. You should be proud of yourself. 
Look, the profile screen appeared and Gola tapped a crown icon next to Izuku's name. A new screen override the first one, showing a bookshelf with dozens of locked trophies. The first one was unlocked and the nameplate said the lover. Cool. Izuku marveled at the sight. The trophy looked so real, almost like he could touch it. What does it do? Each title comes with a quirk. You cannot use your unlocked titles and quirks until you die and restart from a save point. At that moment, you're allowed to choose a title and when your game restarts, you will be gifted with that quirk and any additional effects that comes with it. So what's the quirk for the lover? Gola tapped the trophy and a description popped up. It read, The lover can be unlocked by charming a person. It comes with the quirk, charm, fall in love. Yuwa, Izuku pouted. Whenever someone mentioned love, there are always kissing and touching in inappropriate places involved. Izuku found them gross. He didn't want to taste other people's drool thank you very much. No thank you. Are you sure? You can gain your first quirk this way. Yeah, I'm sure. Plus, Izuku frowned. I can only use it when I die, right? I really don't want to die. Okay, whatever you say, master. I do agree though. No kissing. It's gross having to taste others' blood. Izuku glanced at Gola's sharp gleaming teeth. Yeah, he could imagine why. So how do I make a save point? Master, just simply call me and I will save the game for you. Game is saved automatically after quest completions and achievements. Oh, okay. Also, I gained a reputation point. Does that mean I can open the bazaar now? See for yourself, Master. Gola selected the bazaar tab and a wide range of items display. Quirks, One Punch 100, PTS. Time Travel 70, PTS. Shapeshifting 70, PTS. Shadow Manipulation 50,000, PTS. Mind Reading 50,000, PTS. Costumes, Digital Goggles 7000, PTS. Invisible Body Suit 5000, PTS. Smash Guard Steel Toad Running Boots 3000, PTS. Sap Defense Gloves 3000, PTS. Airwalkers 2000 PTS. Gadgets. Devil's Mask 50 PTS. Time Travel Microwave 30 PTS. Elmore Ghost Motorbike 10 PTS. Pistol. Beretta M95000 PTS. Portal Sticker Set 3000 PTS. Disposable Items. Cataclysm 100 PTS. Death Note 50 PTS. Remove Around 1000 PTS. Red. Blue Potion 500 PTS. Voice Changer Bubblegum 200 PTS. MISC. PS41000 PTS. Fake ID 500 PTS. The T4s 300 PTS. Toothbrush 10 PTS. Lifesaver Candy 1 PT. And there were much more. The only thing Izuku could buy with the one point he had in his possession was a piece of Lifesaver Candy. Even a regular toothbrush that didn't have any unique attributes cost 10 points. Izuku could only exit the page with a disappointed sigh. Well, at least he now knew that helping people solve their emotional problems could earn him reputation points. Before Izuku closed the screen completely, he checked his profile stats. Name, Midoriya Izuku. Title, None. LV, 2 EXP, 0 divided by 200. HP, 150 over 150. MP, 150 over 150. Age, 6. Quirk, None. STR, 3. DEF, 4. SPE, 4. DEX, 4. Attribute points, 1. Luck, 5. Rep points, 1. Techniques, observe LV2, observe other stats. MP usage, 5 MP per use. Izuku noticed that his luck had gone down from 8 to 5. Nothing horrible had happened today so he guessed 5 meant average. He hoped he would never go under that. Who knew what could happen? He also earned one attribute point, which he added to strength without hesitation. On the inventory page, an extra slot appeared, making it 5 sixth. Izuku then closed the screen and spent the rest of the films chatting with Gola. Apparently Gola had a lover who was the Gola for another digitalization. When Izuku asked if there are other people in this world with digitalization, Gola replied with only one game of life is allowed per world, otherwise it'll mess up the equilibrium. Izuku didn't know what that last word mean, but when he was about to ask, the film was over and it was lunchtime. One of the highlights of YHP was that they allowed students to experience real-life hero work and use their quirks in public under the supervision of pro heroes. Every week, they allowed students to form into groups and walk around the street, searching for opportunities to help people, with or without the usage of their quirks. They could also buy lunch if they haven't brought any. To become a hero, what do you have to do? Shimura-sensei cupped a hand around her ear. The class sang in unison, a good deed every day. That's right. You don't have to fight villains to become a hero. There are many types of heroes, and most heroes deal with search and rescue missions. Many more deal with everyday issues. A hero isn't measured by age, experience, or appearance. It's by what you do, and how you do it. As usual, today we're going to separate you into groups of five. Each of you will be led by a clone of Ectoplasm Sensei. The door opened and a tall, slender man walked in. 
He had a scary appearance. Large, soulless blank eyes behind a pair of glasses, exposed teeth, and arms so thin his skin appeared to be tightly wrapped around his bones with no flesh in between, very much like a skeleton that walked right out of a horror movie. His legs appeared to be prosthetic, making Izuku wonder about what he had been through. When the man's blank eyes glanced at Izuku, he couldn't help but cower into his seat. Don't be afraid of him, Namamano whispered, leaning into Izuku's personal bubble. He's as soft as a puppy. You should have seen the other time we caught him singing in the showers. It was. Namamano Henshin. Namamano flinched. He backed away from Izuku inch by inch until his head was back in his personal space. Then he squeaked. Yes, sensei. Perhaps you'd like to accompany me next time I go to karaoke. I'm sure we'll have a splendid time pouring our souls into songs. And no, thank you, as sensei. Namamano made himself as small as possible, refusing to meet ectoplasm's eyes. No, no, I insist. Ectoplasm gave a crooked grin. Even those used to his presence involuntarily shudder. If possible, Namamano curled even more into himself. Stop messing with the kids, Ectoplasm Sensei. Shimura Sensei laughed and hit the bony man lightly on the shoulder. Anyway kids, today we have invited a new hero to tag along. This got the class into a heated chatter. Izuku imagined All Might walking through the door. He knew it was very unlikely, since they couldn't have a famous hero walking with them on the street. That was just begging to be ambushed by fans and calling for the media's attention. So it must be an average hero, like the Waterhose couple, or a new hero. Let us welcome Eraserhead Sensei. The door slid open slowly and a young man around Gentle's age dragged his body through the door. He had shaggy dark hair that fell slightly over his dark eyes and was dressed in all-black clothing. Strange white strips of fabrics wrapped around his neck like a scarf. All the students hitched a breath at his grim appearance. Izuku had never seen a hero looking so gloomy before. One student tried to break the silence. I know. It's called being a mo. I read it on the internet. He exclaimed, jumping out of his seat and floating in the air. The hero, Eraserhead, responded by glaring at the boy. As if an invisible wind was blowing at him, his hair began to float, every single strand sticking up against gravity. His eyes also started glowing red. The boy who was floating previously suddenly lost control of his quirk and dropped onto his seat heavily. The class went dead silent. Even a pin drop could be heard. Eraserhead was the one who broke the silence. My quirk allows me to temporarily erase others' quirk. He drawled. If I see any of you brats using your quirks inappropriately, or using them for something that can be accomplished without the need to flaunt your powers, then I won't hesitate to erase your quirk. Are we clear? No one made a sound. Everyone simply nodded. The tense atmosphere lasted until everyone was separated to their groups. Some complained about not being with their friends, some didn't care. Izuku was in a group with Manami, a pink girl, and, fortunately for him, the remaining two of his quest targets. They were a blonde dazzling kid and a purple-haired boy with bangs so long they covered his eyes completely. When Izuku circled up with his teammates, he received the quest notification. Quest alert. Description. A Yama Yuuga has some traumatizing experiences with his quirk. Help him get over his fears of his quirk. Time limit. None. Reward. 200 EXP. 1 reputation point. Failure. Quest alert. Description. Shinsu Hitoshi sees his quirk as a dangerous, evil power. Help him realize that his power is nothing to be feared of. Time limit, none. Reward, 200 EXP, 1 reputation point. Failure. Izuku accepted both quests without hesitation. Alright everyone, now that we're a team, we should get to know each other's first. That'll make us easier to work together. The pink girl started. Manami tucked a strand of hair behind her ears so her vision wasn't blocked. Ayama rested his chin in both hands as he fluttered his long eyelashes. Shinsu wasn't looking at anyone in particular, not that Izuku could tell. I'll go first. I'm Ashido Mina. Just call me Mina. My quirk is acid. It's really strong and can melt your skin, so be careful not to be too close to me when I use it. Everyone in the group shuddered at her description. You're next, new kid. Mina pointed at Izuku, who jumped out of his seat when his name was called. Why yes, um, my name is Midoriya Izuku, and I'm quirkless, but I'll do my best to help. As soon as he finished, Ayama began in a flippant tone, Bonjour. My name is Ayama Yuuka. My quirk is naval laser and I can shoot laser out of my belly button. Izuku had to hold back his urge to flash out his notebook and jot down all the possibilities of such a quirk be traumatic. It was Manami's turn next. I'm Aba Manami and I'm quirkless, but I'll try my best. When it was the turn of the last member of their group, Shinsu merely murmured, Shinsu Hitoshi before turning away, not looking at them. What's your quirk? Brainwashing. What does it do? Can you, like, control people? Izuku asked. Pretty much. Izuku understood why he would think of it as an evil power. After all, it was the type of power a villain in a superhero manga would possess. Izuku could imagine the type of comments others had made regarding Shinsu's quirk, and these must have given the other boy a negative view on it. 
Sure, his power was evil, but it could also be used in many positive ways. Like in a situation where someone was about to jump off the roof, Shinsu could easily control them to step down then talk them out of it when they were no longer on the verge of death. A power like this could minimize so much damage in the usual hero fights and save the heroes so much time and money. How could Shinsu not realize it? Izuku had to let him know. Even without the quest, Izuku would make Shinsu realize that his quirk wasn't evil. Like with Manami, Izuku would hate to see Shinsu become a hero and yet still not using his quirk. The heroes would lose a major advantage if that happened. But now wasn't the time. Izuku would just have to wait until they have a time to themselves so he could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Shinsu. Everyone was given five minutes to get to know their group. Then they were led onto a bus parked by the entrance. According to Shimura-sensei, they would be taken to a more peaceful part of the town for their activity. The bus ride was short and anything but quiet. Izuku noticed a racer head rubbing his temples in desperation. Of course, a moody, dark, and emo person wouldn't enjoy such clamor. While they were on the bus, Izuku received another quest notification. Quest alert. Description. No matter if you're the symbol of peace, or the big bad boss, everyone has to start somewhere. Begin your first step to a hero by doing something good each day. Status. 0 divided by 1 completed. Time limit. 11 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Reward. 100 EXP. Failure. He was given 12 hours, which was until midnight, to do something good. That shouldn't be too hard. And even though there was no reputation point rewarded, Izuku wasn't disappointed. Because he didn't want to be a hero for rewards. He wanted to become a hero like Gentle, like All Might, who saved people simply because they needed help, not because they would be rewarded for saving that person. When they arrived, Ectoplasm created six clones, one for each team. While the teachers were huddled together discussing plans, Namamano's group went up to Izuku. One of the kids, the wolf-eared boy who sat behind Izuku, snickered. I can't believe it. Two quirkless kids, two with dangerous quirks, and a nobody with a useless quirk all in one team. You guys are in for a hell of a day. Hey, Ahagami, stop insulting my team. Mina was quick to defend them. Besides, your werewolf quirk is just as dangerous as mine. At least I can control who I bite, but you can't control who you accidentally splashes your acid on. Mina wasn't backing down. Oh yeah, is that a challenge? The werewolf boy crouched down, baring his canines and growling. Mina slouched with hands positioned like claws in front of her chest, hissing. At that moment, a vain throbbing hand landed on their respective heads. Shimura-sensei popped in between them with an angry look. Stop fighting this instant or both you and your teams are staying on the bus while everyone else participate. Mina and the werewolf boy didn't say anything but they straightened their postures. When Shimura-sensei left, he threw Mina a dirty look and stalked away. Namamano hurried to apologize. I'm so sorry for what he just did. Agami just has a habit of insulting everyone he meets. He didn't mean it. Hey, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Mina grinned and patted him on the back. We aren't affected by it, right guys? Everyone nodded. Izuku said, yeah, we're all good. No harm done. Namamano looked relieved. He apologized once more before returning to his team. Agami stuck out his tongue at them before wrapping an arm around Namamano, jokingly giving him a headlock. Agami's always making fun of people. Everyone's already used to it and no one took his insults seriously. So just ignore him and you'll be fine. Okay, thanks. Izuku nodded. Besides, there are a few more quirkless kids in our class who are friends with Ahagami. He'll be nicer once he gets to know you. I'm sure we'll do just fine, right? Mina asked casually. Like Sensei said, there are tons of ways to help people without using our quirks. At this time, the teachers were done with their hushed whispers. Clones of Ectoplasm went to their respective groups. Izuku was amazed at Ectoplasm's hero costume. He looked hulky, and nothing like his original self, except his exposed teeth. To his surprise, Eraserhead also came to their group. What are you doing here, Eraserhead sensei? Mina wondered. To keep an eye on our new kid here. The Eraserhead groaned. Please stay out of trouble to the best of your capabilities and make my job easier. I I I promise I won't cause trouble. Izuku insisted. I'll see to it. The groups were then led to different sections of the area. It was lunchtime so the streets were filled with people, but not crowded enough for everyone to have a hard time keeping up. Class session officially started. Izuku's group began on the lookout for potential targets. Mina walked in the front, loudly describing her past experiences in different types of situations. Izuku and his other three teammates trailed after her. The two pro heroes followed behind them in a distance, watching their backs and making sure nothing went wrong. As they were searching, the four YHP kids all took out their respective lunches. Izuku paused with his lunchbox in hand. Uh, bad idea. Midoriya-kun, Mina gave a nervous laugh. We don't stop to eat, so we always bring something simple like rice balls or sushi. Izuku felt his anxiety hit him again. He panicked, almost dropping his lunchbox. W.W. What do I do? 
Here, Mina handed Izuku one of her rice balls. You can have one. Before Izuku could accept or refuse, a half of a yakisoba bread was pushed onto his hand. Sharing is caring, Minami mumbled with her mouthful. Seeing the girls taking the initiative, the boys weren't far behind. Ayama gave Izuku a cheese stick. It's very healthy. And Shinsu offered Izuku half of his tuna sandwich. You're not allergic to fish, are you? To be surrounded by so much kindness, Izuku felt that undeniable warm feeling in his chest once again. His eyes got a little teary but no one commented on it. T thank you, everyone, he mumbled, voice dry. As they continued their search while eating lunch, they found their first target. It was an old lady who dropped her purse, but couldn't bend down due to her back issues. She was holding a hot pink walking stick that really stood out in the distance. The floating exclamation mark had appeared when Izuku was around 20 feet away, and he mentally took note of the required distance. Seeing her struggles, the group rushed to her side but Izuku got there first. He had a feeling everyone else ran a tad bit slower on purpose, in order for him to arrive first. Here you go. Izuku offered the purse to the old lady. Ah, uh, thank you. The old lady accepted her purse with a trembling hand, her other hand on the walking stick. What would I do without you young heroes? Kahaha. <laughs> the old lady chuckled as she patted Izuku on the head. Well, I have to go meet up with my granddaughter. See you kids later. <laughs> reputation point one. Note, continue helping people to earn more reputation point and EXP. For the next 20 minutes or so, Izuku had earned almost 10 reputation points and a dozen EXP by helping people. Many of these situations didn't have a quest alert. Izuku noticed. Only the more important ones that would take longer to complete would have a quest notification. Most of the problems his team encountered didn't require any of them to use their quirks. Once, Mina tried melting down an entire tree to save a cat that was stuck, but was fortunately stopped by a racer head, who pointed out the existence of a bird nest higher up in the tree. Heroes also need a good situational awareness. He had said, you don't want to save someone but have your actions indirectly cause the injury, or worth, death, of another civilian due to your neglect. As they walked into a shopping street, Izuku noticed a familiar mop of furry silver hair, twitching wolf ears, and a wagging, bushy tail. Agami noticed him as well, as he quickly made his way over with a smirk. How many people have you helped, I wonder? Namamano and the rest of his team caught up with him with an exasperated groan. Not again. He mumbled as he ran his fingers through his hair, his neatly trimmed bangs sticking to his forehead with sweat. We've already helped 15 people, each with different incidents. Agami continued to boast. Hands on her hips, Mina retorted with her head held high. So what? That doesn't make you any better than us. Just because you've been in the program a few weeks longer than we have doesn't mean you can pressure us with your experience. Just as another stare down was about to occur, white strips of fabric shoot out from behind and wrapped around the two YHP students. Their limbs locked tightly against their sides restricting their movements. The racer had trudged his way over. Stop this foolish argument. You're training to be heroes, and heroes don't fight against each other's. But Sensei, the racer head's eyes glowed red and his hair began to float. The two kids gulped visibly. A second later, a racer head blinked and the effect wore off. He released them, kneeling down and placing a hand on their shoulders. In a softer voice, he said, Remember, the moment you turn saving people into a competition, you're no longer heroes. What matters most isn't how many people you've helped or how much you've helped them. It's the simple fact that you've helped somebody in need. That is what makes a true hero. Both of them stared at the ground guiltily and murmured a quiet apology. The racer head stood up and folded his arms. You two need to learn to get along. Now, as punishments for fighting during a class session, you two and your teams will work together for the remaining of this class period. What? A chorus of groans was the response. But a flash of red in a racer head's eyes and the slightest movement of his hair shut everyone up. Izuku stayed in the back of his team as he observed the two teams' awkward reaction around each other. Most of them are okay with working with another team. It was Agami's scowling face and Mina's grumpy look that put everyone on guard. Suddenly, something, or rather, someone rammed into Izuku's back. With an oof Izuku fell forward and had to steady himself with Ayama's shoulder to not face blunt. What was that? Groaning, Izuku turned to look at the pressure on his back, but only saw. Clothes, floating clothes, with an exclamation mark above it. Whoa. Loud sniffling came from the floating clothes and Izuku felt a grip on his shirt. It then downed to him that he was possibly seeing an invisible person for the first time in his life. Um, do you need help? Am in my grandma's lost. Vua. The invisible girl sobbed loudly. Quest alert. Description. Help Hagakir Toru reunite with her grandmother. Time limit. None. Reward. 100 EXP. 2 reputation point. Failure. This time Izuku didn't even pay attention to the notification. He vaguely remembered accepting it as he had his whole focus on the wailing girl. The two YHP groups gathered around her. 
The more experienced ones who had probably dealt with this kind of situation began shooting off questions that would help locate the grandma. But they were all ignored by the girl who couldn't stop crying. We, we gotta do something. Mina exclaimed. But what? Agami frowned. He watched as Ayama handed the girl a cheese stick, which slid out of her slack grip as she continued to cry, shoving the blonde out of the way. Agami crouched down in front of her with his head bowed. Hey, look, his ears twitched. Wanna feel my hair? It's pretty soft. That didn't seem to work. Maybe she's a cat person, Namamano offered. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes. His body began to twist and swirl, morphing into a tiny orange cat. Namaniko yowled and patted his way over to the crying girl and placed a kitty paw against her invisible leg. The girl stopped crying and shrieked. She backed up so fast Izuku almost fell over with her steel grip remaining on his All Might t-shirt. Cats. And she continued screaming. H. Hey, Shinsu. Izuku called out to the purple-haired boy who was currently petting a content Namaniko. Can't you maybe control her and make her stop crying? Shinsu nervously rubbed the back of his neck. My quirk is scary. Instead of helping, it'd probably scare her if I take control of her body. So I don't think that's a good idea. So that was what he was afraid of. Then what else can we do? Mina grasped her hair in exasperation, her horns knocking back and forth frantically. Izuku looked around. Everyone had a look of uncertainty on their face. The two pro heroes were leaning against the wall a few meters away, watching them silently. Izuku looked back at the quivering floating clothes next to him, and he made his decision. Gently releasing her tight grip on his shirt, Izuku spread his hands in front of him, palms up. Look, the little flowery headband around the invisible girl's head tilted downward an inch, showing she was sparing Izuku a glance. Nothing's in my hand. He squeezed both fists, and when he opened his left hand, a piece of lifesaver candy was sitting quietly on his clammy palm. The sobbing paused. Whispers of Gomidoriya reached his ears as he closed his left hand around the candy and opened his right hand. The same lifesaver candy appeared on his right palm. He then closed both hands. How many candies do you think I have? T2. Izuku grinned. He opened both hands to reveal them empty. Check your pockets. The invisible girl stuffed both hands into the pockets of her skirt and pulled out a handful of lifesaver candies. How? Secret Izuku teased. And finally, the crying ceased as the girl giggled. Ayama Yuuga almost killed his father when his quirk first manifested. He had been standing on a chair and painting on the walls of his room when he felt a strange surge of heat developing in the pit of his belly. It was hot, uncomfortable, and he wanted to get rid of it. His father chose that moment to enter his room. Yuuga, turning to face his father, pushed the energy out of his belly button. A strong beam of blue laser shot out and hit his father in the stomach, tearing through the flesh and creating a gaping hole that forever haunted the young boy's mind. The force of the beam also threw the boy backward, slamming his head against the wall and knocking him out. He had woken up in the hospital with multiple stitches on the back of his head and his beautiful blonde hair shaved off. His exhausted mother had appeared by his side the moment he opened his eyes. It took him a while to decipher her frantic rambling and realize that his father had almost died on the surgery table. His father didn't blame him for what he had done, but Yuga, traumatized by the experience, sworn to never use his power again. He didn't want to hurt anyone, nor hurt himself ever again. His head throbbed in phantom pain every time he thought back to the incident. The scar hidden deep among his thick blonde hair forever reminded him of his crime. For half a year, Yuuga managed to refrain from using his quirk. But the heat in his belly was piling up, making him feel bloated and full. He lost his appetite and couldn't keep anything down. His weight dwindled significantly and his change in appearance was worrying his parents. Even the other kids at kindergarten had noticed his shift in demeanor. Yuuga talked less, ate less, sparkled less, and often spaced out during activities. Some nasty kids began teasing him for never showing his quirk. They called him quirkless, loser, nobody dot all sorts of names. Yuuga learned to ignore them. But the heat in his belly was getting harder and harder to ignore and the urge to let it all out was eating him away. Yuuga was a ticking bomb but no one noticed the signs. Every name thrown at him was a second closer to his impending explosion. And then one day, as to be expected, the countdown reached zero. When Yuuga came to realization, he was lying face down on the ground, his body covered in cuts and scratches from the force that had apparently flung him backward, and he was facing the destruction of all the trees in a straight line directly in front of him. There was also a gnawing hunger in his stomach that he hadn't experienced for the past six months. All the kids around him had frozen in shock. Whatever toys they were playing with clattered onto the ground. Only then did the adults snap out of their stupor and began with the repair. But the damage was done. Nobody talked to Yuuga anymore after the incident. They acted like he wasn't there. Like he wasn't a person worthy of their attention. Like he was just a pebble on the street that people either stepped over or kicked to the side of the road. Yuuga's parents immediately found out the way their boy had been treated and they quickly pulled him out of the kindergarten. 
The entire family moved to another city so Yuuga could start anew in a place where no one knew his past and the terror of his quirk. There hadn't been another incident ever since. Yuuga was still feeling the inflating heat in his belly, but it was easier to control now after his experience with it last time. There were still kids at school who believed the fact that he never showed his quirk must have meant he didn't have a quirk. Yuuga had learned to ignore them. He still wasn't eating much, so his mother made sure what he did eat had enough nutrition and calories for his entire day. Things had been peaceful for the next few years. Yuuga turned six and joined the youth hero program with the hopes that the teachers and heroes there would teach him how to control his quirk. The kids there were friendly. There were a few actual quirkless kids, but no one seemed to pick on them. Yuuga had no issues getting along with everyone, even though he did get quite frustrated whenever Mina interrupted him when he tried to say something. He had gotten used to it and written that off as her being her usual brash and carefree self. He eventually made a few friends and began to sparkle more, gradually returning to his old self. Time flew past and soon a new kid enrolled in YHP, Midoriya Izuku, a green-haired bright-eyed quirkless boy. The first thing he did on his very first day was make Ava smile, a stunt no one had ever been able to pull. Yuuga continued observing in the back of the group as their lunch activity began. Midoriya seemed extremely eager to help others. Every time he brought a smile to another's face, an equally bright smile appeared on his own freckled face. His enthusiasm never lessened and only grew as time passed. Ironically, a quirkless boy was the one person in Yuuga's life that truly sparkled. Then they met an invisible girl, who later told them her name was Hagakir Toru. Everyone seemed equally amazed at seeing an invisible person for the first time. Yuuga and the others who had handled lost kids before asked her questions that would help them locate her missing grandma. But all efforts went down the drain as Hagakir couldn't stop crying. She even refused his cheese stick. Yuuga was offended. How could anyone in the world say no to the exquisite delicacy? That was cheese and anything made of cheese. He felt a bit better when everyone else's attempts also ended up in failure. And then Midoriya stepped up. Everyone watched curiously trying to see what a quirkless boy can do. Look, Midoriya showed her his empty hands. Nothing's in my hands. Then he closed both hands and when he opened one, there was a lifesaver candy on his palm. For a second, Yuga thought Midoriya might actually have a quirk. And from the looks on the others' faces, they were thinking the same thing. But on a second thought, it may just be a magic trick. After all, many magic tricks were so incredible you couldn't help but suspect that there was quirk usage involved in the act. Although there were tricks that actually did have quirk usage involved. Every day there was media revealing a magician or two lying about absolutely no quirk involved in their magic tricks. So magicians nowadays had pretty much lost all trust from the public due to how many lies were revealed. Mina fired questions after questions at an increasingly uncomfortable Midoriya while Hagakir stuffed her mouth full with candies. It was strange watching candies disappear into thin air. If she wanted, she could probably be a great assistant for magicians. She just have to become completely invisible then she can make things float and disappear all she want. How did you do that? Mina grabbed Midoriya's shoulders roughly and shook him back and forth. That's so cool. I thought you didn't have a quirk. Uh ah, -uh, T that's BB because Midoriya's eyes seemed to spin as he tried to speak without stuttering. Let him talk, Mina, said Ava as she patted the pink girl on the shoulder. Midoriya finally learned how to breathe again. He steadied himself as he finally revealed his secret. It's just a magic trick. I'm quirkless and for a while I was afraid of people finding out. So I learned magic tricks to hide it. And people thought my quirk is to make things disappear and appear. That's so cool. I've always wanted to learn magic tricks. But it never works for me because everyone can see through everything. Hagakir mumbled, depressed. You can be a great assistant, Midoriya offered and gave her a bright smile. Yuuga perked up, surprised that someone else had reached the same conclusion as he had. Usually he would be the only one to notice the things others ignored because he was always observing, staying in the background and watching others interact. And that was another reason many treated him like an outcast, since he always suggested ideas that were so out of the blue, so unusual that it seemed totally impossible at first glance and were often rejected by his classmate. Since no one can see you, they'll just assume the objects are floating by themselves, Midoriya explained. But then it would be cheating. You're not allowed to use quirks in a magic trick. Hagakir huffed. Magic tricks can't be done without the trick. It's either tricking the audience with a trick or with a quirk. Both are cheating. I believe the goal of a magic trick is to make people smile. It doesn't matter whether you use a quirk or not. My mama said sometimes you gotta make white lies that will do more good than bad. Hagakir thought about that for a moment before grumbling. I guess you're right. Midoriya cracked a smile at that. Guys, can we stop wasting time here? Nina snapped around and rounded on Namamano angrily jabbing a finger into his chest. You idiot. Now's not the time to bring that up. We're having a serious conversation here. Namamana's shoulders sagged under her heavy grip and he mumbled, so I'm not included in the we. Before Mina can retort, Agami pushed her away with a glare. 
Back off from him, you alien queen. Who are you calling an alien queen? Mina screeched. The one hissing and spitting acid every time she talks to me. Who? Yuuga turned away from the commotion and smashed his forehead against the wall. A shadow loomed over his face giving him a sullen look. Grimacing, he prayed for their fight to end quickly and quietly. He hated fights and arguments. He was more of a pacifist and would rather take a step back and apologize even when it wasn't his fault just so he didn't have to deal with fights any longer. Gee guys, um um. Hey guys. Midoriya tried to get their attention. Both heads turned towards him, throwing him a stink eye. Yuga was glad he wasn't on the receiving end of it. Let's fight later, okay. With his back towards Hagakir, he nudged his lips towards her discreetly. Fine, Mina spat. This isn't over, Agami glared. Midoriya gave them a pointed look before turning to Hagakir. Sorry you have to see that. Let's start searching for your grandma. Do you remember where you last saw? And he was pushed over. Move. Agami walked up to the girl. I have a better idea. Aba moved to help Midoriya get up, who seemed to sparkle as he gave her a bright smile. So bright Yuga almost saw glitters coating his form. You see, my quirk allows me to do anything a wolf can do, which means I have a strong sense of smell. I can find your grandma if you can give me anything that smells like her. Hagakir rummaged through all the pockets on herself but couldn't seem to find anything. I don't have anything. Have you touched her clothes? Or held her hand before she went missing? Ogami tried again. No, my grandma needs to walk using a cane. She gets better balance if she doesn't hold on to me. Wait, is her cane pink? Yuga asked the same time Midoriya did. Yeah, how did you know? We met her earlier today. Midoriya exclaimed. She dropped her purse and I picked it up for her. Oh, that means your hand should smell like her purse. Mina pointed out as she wiggled her eyebrows tauntingly at Ogami. Ogami made a disgusted look. I am not smelling your hand. Everyone snickered at the mental image. Stop laughing you bastards. Ogami's face went up in flame and his tail swatted around wildly. And stop thinking about it. Shinsu stepped up from his position by the wall and sneered at Ogami. You can either do it yourself or I can make you do it. Oh ho ho, so you're gonna use your evil quirk on an innocent kid huh? Someone from Ogami's team looked around sarcastically, innocent kid, where? And was rewarded with a heated glare from their team leader. I will use it if it's on you, Shinsu said. I reserve it for those who deserve it. Ogami's face darkened as he glared, canines bearing. Shinsu stood his ground firmly. His messy purple bangs shrouded his eyes but the rest of his face was stoic and indifferent. There seemed to be a sparkling string coming from both of their eyes and connecting in midair with sparks dancing off of it. Iwuga shook his head to get rid of that image. His mother always said his imagination was his biggest weapon but could also lead to his downfall if overused. The glaring contest ended as quickly as it began with Agami reluctantly accepting his fate, grumbling under his breath the entire way. He stalked up to an antsy Midoriya and yanked his hand up. Agami sniffed the palm as quickly as possible and threw the hand down, waving at the air in front of his nose as if something reeked. So, did you smell anything? Midoriya asked, hesitant. Yeah, sweat, urine, seaweed, fish, cheese, food, an ant, and cranky old people. Midoriya glowed. Everyone waited as Agami spun around sniffing the air. He even got on all fours at one point and sniffed the ground. No one commented on that. Not even Mina, because they knew Ogami would be so embarrassed he might refuse to help out anymore. After a while, Ogami pointed at a direction and said, It's that way, about 400 meters away. The two groups began making their way over. Yuga caught a glimpse of ectoplasm and Eraserhead Sensei following them before they disappeared into the shadows. As they walked, Midoriya and Mina made small talks to Hagakir. Ogami and Namamano chatted in the front of the group while the former sniffed the air every now and then to make sure the grandma didn't suddenly change directions. Yuga, Shinsu, and Abel walked in silence between the two groups, and the rest of Ogami's team was in the very back. On their way there, the two teams spotted a few people who needed help with small tasks. Mina and Ogami were always the first ones to run up, with Midoriya following right behind them. Ogami helped break apart a dogfight and the two owners thanked him gratefully. Mina helped a man melt the lock of his briefcase open when he lost the key but needed the documents inside for a meeting. Midoriya comforted a kid who dropped his cheesecake takeout and couldn't stop crying. In the end, the parents of the kid appeared with a new box of cheesecake in their hands and thanked Midoriya before leaving. Yuga had to force himself not to drool over that cheesecake. He had wanted to visit that newly opened cheesecake factory for a long time. But he lived too far and his parents were too busy with work to take him over. He also didn't bring any money either, and it wasn't like he would buy it if he did. Now they had to focus on finding Hagakir's grandma. Everything else had to wait. Next to the restaurant was a vacant building for rent. Yuga briefly fantasized his family moving into this building so he could eat cheesecakes whenever he wanted, and only snapped out of it when everyone else paused to stare at him. After that little incident, they walked past a subway station and went under a bridge. According to Agami, they were less than 50 meters away. 
Midoriya halted in his steps and pointed at something in the distance, yelling, I found her. Yuga followed his finger and found the old lady they had helped before struggling to walk with her pink cane, her purse slipping off of her grasp and appearing to be on the verge of dropping again. Just then a large burly man stumbled around a corner and ran up behind her. He yanked the purse out of her weak grasp, causing her to falter and drop onto her knees. Give it back. The grandma struggled to get up, and a random person next to her helped her stand back on her feet. The robber was rushing towards the two teams with a sickening grin on his large face. Agami and Namamano froze up. They were both standing a little to the side of Yuuga's vision, leaving him directly in the robber's line of sight. Move out of the way you little brats. The man brandished a knife and waved it around threateningly. Or I'll kill y'all. Yuuga couldn't move. He had never felt so afraid in his life. The closer the man was the bigger his form seemed to be. He was so big and tall Yuuga's height didn't even reach his waist. His eyes locked up with the man's, and a wave of cold terror washed over his body. The ghostly sensation left him trembling and gasping for breath. His fear was a living creature, writhing in his chest, clutching at his throat, cutting off his breath. The man was directly in front of him as he ran, like those trees at that time. If he shoot out his laser now, he could hit the man head on. It would be so fast the man wouldn't even be able to dodge. But, the phantom pain returned to the back of his head and Yuga was reminded of the sensation of his head cracking open and the numbness after the surgery. Memories of the gaping hole in his father's stomach, the blood all over the ground, and his classmate's horrified cold eyes flashed before him. Yuga just couldn't do it. He didn't want to go through that again. It was bad enough showing his quirk in a classroom setting. He could only imagine what could happen if he hurt someone with it in public where everyone could see it. There would be nowhere to hide from the exposure. Moving away wouldn't erase the pictures that people would take and the rumors that would surely spread. But if he didn't do anything, his friends could get hurt, or worse, killed. He was the only one with a long-range defensive quirk so he had to do this. He had to use it. Iwuga tried to concentrate on the heat in his belly but none gathered. They were scattered and refused to ball up at his belly button. The man was getting closer and there was nowhere to run. Everyone was frozen in fear and because Yuuga was such a coward they were all going to die and be stabbed slash killed and blood would everywhere dripping pooling on ground and his parents would be sasa sasa so so sad and disappointed and wouldn't able to be a hero well how could when couldn't even stand up for himself and his friends he was just a loser a coward a hero when aim nobody. A figure darted past Yuuga and moved protectively in front of Ogami and Namamano. A flash of green. Midoriya. A quirkless boy. He was shaking from head to toe like an autumn leaf, trembling so much the air around him seemed to vibrate. And yet, he stood his ground. He faced against a man four, no, almost five times his size despite being so obviously terrified. Out of all of them, a quirkless boy was the first to move. He had no power and he knew he couldn't win. And yet, a feeling of self-disgust clawing his throat. Yuga stared at Midoriya's back and somehow the small stature of the shorter boy suddenly seemed so much bigger. His shoulders appeared wider and his form gave Yuga a sense of protection. And then the man arrived. The imagery form of Midoriya instantly collapsed under the overwhelming size of the robber. Yuga, Midoriya, and everyone else could only stood with growing horror as the man drew back the blade and got restrained by white bandages. The fear and immobility remained even after a racer had sensei tied up the robber as tight as possible, making sure his arms were growing purple and he was gasping for breath. In reality, the time it took for the man to get to them was only a few seconds, but to Yuuga, it felt like hours. When Ectoplasm Sensei asked him if he was okay, Yuuga nodded in response, not trusting his voice yet. His tongue felt thick and heavy and if he was to speak right now, his words would probably come out all jumbled and incoherent. Their lunch activity ended by the time Hagakure reunited with her grandma. Algami insisted that the credit should go to him since he contributed the most. But everyone else agreed that Midoriya was the MVP today, since if he hadn't made Hagakure stop crying, they'd never get any information out of her. On their bus ride back, the other teams loudly shared their stories, while Yuuga and Ogami's team remained silent. Obviously everyone was affected by the incident. Yuuga wondered briefly what the others were thinking at the moment. They didn't know the power of his quirk so they probably didn't know he was in the perfect position to shoot the robber. But still, out of everyone, Midoriya was the one who overcame his fear and stood up. The others were probably also thinking how useless they were for being one-upped by someone without a means to defend himself. By the time they arrived at YHP, Yuga was so deeply wallowed in his self-pity that he didn't remember how he got off the bus or how he returned home. It wasn't until he was relaxing in his sparkling bubble bath with a rubber duck clutched tightly in his hand did he come back to reality. Lying back in the bathtub, Yuga closed his eyes as he tried to remember the fear he felt today. He wanted to remember that feeling so he could get used to it and overcome it. That feeling would forever be ingrained in his body, reminding him of how he should start getting his acts together and stop being a petty little loser. If the heroes weren't here today, they would have died. 
and Yuuga would never forgive himself if he let his friends die when he could do something to prevent it. It was time for Ayama Yuuga to stop being a coward and start becoming a hero. Next time this happened, Yuuga would use his quirk. As he daydreamed about a giant evil villain coming up to torment him and his friends and his using his quirk to shoot a giant hole in the villain's stomach and then being held a hero, Yuuga slowly fell asleep. Mama was crying when she picked him up at YHP. The moment they got off the bus, everyone visibly flinched as a hoarse cry split the air. Izuuku. Mama threw down her bike and stumbled towards him with open arms, enveloping him in a bone-crushing hug. I was t-told that why you were attacked. Are you okay? Are you hurt anywhere? How are you feeling? Do you need to see the doctor? And Mama. Izuku's heart gave a jolt as he took in Mama's face. Her eyes were red from crying. Her lips cracked, and snot dripped down her nose and over the curves of her lips. Izuku didn't care how disgusting her face looked when he hugged her back because his face probably didn't look any better as he wailed and blabbered gibberish. After what seemed like eternity, they finally broke apart. A quick glance around showed the other students interacting with their family in a distance to give them some space. The teachers then came up and reassured Mama that everything was fine and no one was hurt. Shimura and Genji sensei apologized over and over again for putting them in danger. Mama looked like she wanted to yell at them but she held her tongue and instead forgave them and thanked them for protecting him. Mama didn't let him ride his bike home that day, because she was worried his legs were still jelly after being so scared by the scary man. She asked him many times what exactly happened in his words. No matter how many times Izuku reassured her she was still worried. It was then that Izuku made his decision. The moment they arrived home, Izuku sat Mama down on the couch as he prepared his words. Mama, I have to tell you something. Mama froze up like how she usually did when expecting bad news while on the phone. She grabbed his hands with both hands and cradled them gently. Tell me, Mama's listening. And so, Izuku told her everything. Leaving out his near-death incident and encounter with Gentle since it would destroy her and Izuku didn't want her to live with the knowledge that her son had almost committed suicide while under her watch. She would blame herself forever for failing him and not being there for him. Mama didn't say a word as she listened. When Izuku finished talking, Mama pulled him into a hug. Burying her nose in his fluffy hair, she murmured, I'm so proud of you, Izuku. Why? I didn't do anything. Izuku hugged her briefly. When he attacked us, I couldn't do anything. My friends could have died if not for Eraserhead Sensei. If only I wasn't so weak. Izuku, look at me. Mama cupped his cheeks tenderly and stared into his eyes. Her gaze was like an arrow on fire that bored into his very soul. In an extremely soft voice, she said, Listen, you're not weak. In fact, you're strong, stronger than anyone I know and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Despite not having a quirk, you still stood up to protect your friends. What defines as strong as being able to overcome your fears. And you did just that. A physically strong person is useless if he can't be strong in the face of obstacles. Remember, Izuku, no matter how powerful you are, if you can't use that power during the times of challenging, then you're as good as powerless. E but how can I face my fears without power? I need to become stronger. Fast. Mama chuckled, leaving Izuku more confused. Did he say something funny? Izu-chan, how old are you? Hey, six. Do you really think this is the type of problem a kid your age should be worrying about? I don't know. Izuku, you're only six. Mama laughed as she caressed his round cheeks, making Izuku pout. Whenever she did this, he always felt like a baby. And Izuku was not a baby anymore. Normal six-year-olds don't worry about things like this. Enjoy your childhood. Play games, make friends, have fun. Leave the thinking to when you're older. For now, allow the heroes to do their job and protect you. That's what they're there for. But then, how am I going to become a hero if I don't start now? What are you saying? Mama tapped his nose gently, making him go cross-eyed. You're already a hero to me, Izu-chan. Izuku felt heat rushing to his face. Besides, Mama smirked. The evil grin looked so wrong on her face. I'm sure Manami-chan and hagakure chan thinks the same way. I didn't expect my Izu-chan to be so good with girls. Mama. Izuku whined. His face was definitely on fire now. I don't like them that way. Which way? Mama looked like a scheming fox. The, the, the face-sucking way. That sent Mama in a round of laughter while Izuku pouted, fuming silently. After a while Mama calmed down. In all serious, haha, Nesto, you have many years to get strong enough to be a hero. With that game thingy you got, you don't have to go out of your way to become strong. Just go with the flow, do a good deed every day, help people when you can, stack up experience points, and eventually you'll save up enough reputation points to buy a quirk, or reach level 10 and gain a free quirk. No need to rush, just do it at your own pace. The way Mama put it made it sound so easy. Perhaps he was overreacting. Mama will go with you every day. One hour of quest hunting. How does that sound? Sounds great. Izuku cheered, raising his hands high in the air. Yeah. Mama slapped his palms gently. After seeing the last student walk out of the courtyard with their parents, Shimura Eiko stifled a yawn as she stretched, 
her joints popping sending pleasure down her spine. It had been a long and tiring day at YHP. The villain attack on the two teams of students near the end of the lunch activity brought her a lot more paperwork and phone calls than the usual. Lucky for her, though, she wasn't a witness and didn't have to help with the police report. Her phone buzzed in her pocket. Aiko grabbed it and unlocked it swiftly. The group chat she was in had a few new messages. YHP group chat. Erased. Definitely a bad idea to accept this position. Jinjutsu user, la 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 la. Armasugakuki, poor boy. Come here I'll give you a hug. Erased. I politely refuse. Ergasm. Just left the police station. I miss my son. Armasugakuki, me too. Jinjutsu user, me three. Ergasm. Ergasm is typing. Just for the heck of it, Eiko typed. AI Red Heart Coco, me four. Ergasm. Anyone want to join me and Genji on karaoke? The chat group was deadly silent for the next five minutes. Eiko chuckled and tucked her phone away. Just the mention of karaoke brought Ectoplasm's nightmarish singing voice to her mind. It was like a screeching banshee clawing the ground as she gave birth, while being stabbed repeatedly by a wailing demon. Not planning on going. Genji, Aka Jinjutsu user, walked up to her with his phone in hand. He was carrying his backpack looking ready to leave. No, not today. It's our weekly movie night. As Eiko grabbed her pack, Genji turned off the light and locked the door after they exited the building. Walking across the courtyard, Genji asked, How's Tenko doing? Oh, just the usual, you know. He's more attached to Tenki than me, and that doesn't seem like it'll change anytime soon. Eiko finished with a sigh. Genji patted her on the back reassuringly. Hey, kids are always like that. They prefer one parent over the other. He'll give you two equal treatment once he hits puberty. Eiko glared at him without putting much force into the look. That's not funny. Genji chuckled. As they began to part ways at the entrance, Genji said, Well, wish you good luck. I'm about to have my ears abused by ectoplasm singing. Can't say no to him, huh? Yeah, unfortunately. He wants me to change the room into a live concert stage, with imaginary fans cheering him in the audience. Aw oh man, poor you. I'm about to enjoy myself over Ready Player One. Let's hope it's better than the book. Eiko waved at Genji, who sported a distressed look as she headed her way. Shouta hadn't become a hero for long, and he already hated the police station. Or more specifically, the police's way of handling things. Just a simple robbery took them hours of investigation. They droned on and on about every tiny little detail about the incident. Whether the attack was coincidental or intentional, why the grandma was targeted, the relationship between the victim and the kids, how the kids reacted, how they took down the robber, why they were there, what time, how long. And then they had to stay in the waiting room as the officers spent three hours writing their Gotham report. Even the ever-so-collected ectoplasm began getting impatient as he drummed his fingers on his knees, his humming of some random song starting to irritate the hell out of Shouta. No wonder the police couldn't become heroes. Their work efficiency and time management would become their downfall in a villain encounter. When they were finally allowed to leave, Shouta practically ran out of the hellhole. He had never appreciated the sunlight so much. It's just how it is, Ectoplasm said as he trailed after Shouta. They have to make sure they get every detail right. Reports are important after all. You'll get used to it. That's why you always bring a book with you to the police station, or download some on your phone. Shouta glared at the offending phone waving at his face and decided to turn on his heels and walk away. He wasn't in a good mood right now and he'd rather return to his apartment and his lovely cats as soon as possible. Aw cats. Just the mere thought of them brought a smile to his face. Do you want to go to karaoke with me and Genji? No. The older hero stopped him with a hand on his shoulder. Shouta clicked his tongue. It's a lot of fun. You look like you can use some music therapy right now. No thank you. I'd rather go home. What's so fun about home? Karaoke is more fun. Shouta whipped around. The word cats on the tip of his tongue before he changed it at the last second. I have an essay to write. Oh, yeah. You're in college, right? What's your major? Shouta answered as he began to walk. Teaching. Oh, why do you want to become a teacher? The questions. They just. Won't stop. Shouta, barely containing his impatience, tried to speak as nicely as possible. After all, despite how annoying this man was, he was still a senior and therefore should be respected. Ectoplasm senpai. I really need to finish this essay. Can we talk at a later date? Sure, I don't mind. The older man tapped something on his phone and shout his phone buzzed. I started a new chat with you. Just reply whenever you're free. Ectoplasm turned around and was about to walk away, before looking back and saying, By the way, I work as a math teacher at UA. Then he left, leaving Shouta deadly still in the middle of the street. Maybe he should have been nicer to the man. The week after Izuku's first day at YHP was fun. Like Mama promised, she went with him on his daily quest hunt. Every day after school they would walk into town and Izuku would complete his daily good deed quest and help a couple more people before his hour was over. Sometimes if their schedule allowed, they would stay a bit longer. 
And whenever that happened, Izuku always walked with a skip in his step, happy to be able to help more people in need. When the next sat rolled by, Izuku had reached level 4 with 634 out of 800 XP. With every level he leveled up, the required EXP doubled. When he became level 5, he would need 1600 XP to level up, then 3200 XP for level 6, 6400 XP for level 7, an overwhelming 12, 800 XP for level 8, and so on. Of course, Mama was the one who calculated those numbers. Izuku didn't understand the bigger numbers, but he knew it'd take much longer for him to level up later on, which meant he wouldn't be reaching level 10 and getting his hands on a quirk anytime soon. Reaching level 4 had also gained him two more slots in the inventory. He now had his security alarm, mini flash bomb that exploded upon impact, and that took six seconds to explode, hero analysis notebooks, four-leaf clover, and his bicycle, which his mama had allowed him to store inside because it would conserve its condition so the bike wouldn't rust or be bothered by the weather conditions, and not to mention it'd never get stolen. He left two slots empty in case of emergencies, like for that lifesaver trick. After helping an average of 8 to 9 people every day with simple tasks, Izuku had saved up 67 reputation points. He hadn't encountered a situation where he needed to purchase anything, so he refrained from spending a single point. His observe was now at level 5, and he could now see people's name and level as well as their age and personality when he observed them. He practically observed every single person on the street within his proximity whenever he stepped out of the house to quickly level up, seeing how observe was the easiest technique to level up. It turned out that when a technique reached level 5, it would gain an upgrade, unlocking more power and lasting longer. Izuku had also learned a few more techniques. Name, Midoriya Izuku. Title, None. LV, 4 EXP, 634 800. HP, 340 over 340. MP, 340 over 340. Age, 6. Quirk, None. STR, 4. DEF, 4. SPE, 5. DEX, 5. Attribute points, 0. Luck, 5. Rep points, 67. Techniques. Observe LV5. Observe others' stats. MP usage, 5 MP per use. Search LV3. Search for your target in the crowd faster. MP usage, N, A. Sprint LV2. Provide a 25% boost of speed. MP usage, 20 MP per use. Last 5 seconds. Jump LV2. Provide a 25% boost of strength in your legs when jumping. MP usage, 20 MP per use. He gained search during the Hagakure quest. Sprint and jump were gained while running around during recess. Kaken had looked at him all strangely when the useless Deku started prancing around like a dog seeking attention, as he put it. Izuku had bounced around all recess trying to discover more techniques, but in the end jump and sprint were all he got. When he leveled up to level 4 after completing the Hagakure quest, Izuku received two attribute points, which he added to speed and dexterity after careful consideration. He had thought about it for a while. Being quirkless, it'd be stupid to fight his opponents face on. Strength and defense wouldn't do anything to people like Kaken, who could burn you no matter how strong your defense was, and fighting him with fists was useless when he could just throw an explosion at you to knock you away. That was why Izuku chose speed and dexterity, to gain faster reflex and dodge incoming attacks, and escape faster. Like Mama said, he was still young. There was no need to carry everything on his shoulders. It was fine to share the burden with heroes and run away until heroes come to save him. Childhood was supposed to be enjoyed, not filled with training and fights. There was no reason for him to quickly become stronger. He had lots of time. It was fine to take it slow. The rest of the week flew past, and before Izuku noticed, Sat had arrived and he was riding alongside Mama as they made their way towards YHP. Watching the scenery as they flashed past him, Izuku wondered what Gentle was doing right now. Clash. A plate shot past his ear, cutting his cheek and shattering against the wall behind him. Tabita flinched, squeezing his eyes shut as he felt a line of blood dripping down his cheek. A worthless, useless piece of shit. Tabita kept his eyes closed, refusing to look at his mother's terrifying expression. Do you know how much we've spent on you? Raising you, feeding, clothing, putting a roof over your head. We don't care if you become a hero or not. All we ever wanted was a peaceful life without any troubles. And now look at how you repaid our kindness. A hand slammed against the table. Tabita blinked. His expulsion letter lay on the dining table. It was wrinkled with ripped edges. Obviously someone had been squeezing it very hard. The fuck you do that for? His father, who was sitting with his head down at the table, roared at his mother. The hell are you talking about? You saw me, sitting here, right next to you. Yet you slammed your fucking hand right next to my fucking ears. You trying to start something? Oh yeah and now it's my fault huh? It's my fault for not raising my son better. It's my fault for not getting rid of that stupid hero dream of his. Everything's my fault right? Are you satisfied now? 
When did I ever say it's your fault? Listen you goddamn woman. No, you listen. Tabita couldn't hold it any longer. He ignored his parents shouting match and ran into his room. Slamming his closet open, he grabbed a few random clothes and stuffed them in his school bag after dumping out its content. He ripped his charger out of the outlet and threw it inside his bag, along with a few bags of snacks and bottles of water. As he was about to zip up, his eyes landed on his little notebook. He paused, weighing his chances, and in the end dropped it inside his pack. He wasn't giving up yet. He changed into something comfortable then grabbed his backpack, phone, and wallet before skidding down the stairs. Without looking back, Tabita left his house. It was already night time. Tabita stood outside, eyeing the spray paint of the word garbage next to the nameplate of his house. His heart felt empty as he thought about leaving his home forever. The place he grew up in, where he had his first tea party, celebrating his victory of a calligraphy contest, where his father threw him into the air and dropped him for the first time, where his mother brought him his favorite tea and cakes when he worked past midnight, where he stole his father's computer to watch YouTube videos before receiving his first laptop, where he took his parents' kindness for granted and never gave anything in return. I will be back. Tabita forced himself to look away from the house, the normal house that looked just like any other houses on the street, the house no one would give a second look at except him. The house wasn't anything special, but to him, leaving it was like throwing away a piece to a puzzle. Tabita dragged his foot along the pavement, half hoping his parents would notice his absence and chase after him. Seconds flew past. Minutes went by. Their voices diminished and soon Tabita was all alone in the middle of the night on an eerily silent street with nowhere to go and no plans for the future. He brought his hand up to his cheeks. The blood had dried and left an impressionable mark on his face. He had to get rid of it. There was a park near his house which should have a water fountain he could use. It wasn't very far, just about a 10-minute walk. When Tabita arrived, he noticed many homeless people sleeping on the benches, some in the bushes. They looked no different from him at the moment, just a bit dirty. The thought of himself possibly joining their rank brought a wave of fear over him. Tabita shook his head, getting rid of that thought. Worrying about the future wouldn't do anything except slow him down and make him doubt himself. He had to keep being optimistic. Believe that the future was bright and filled with singing birds and sunshine. Besides, besides, Izuku believed him. He had to live up to his promise and be a hero. Even if it wasn't for him, he'd do it for the boy, his very first fan. After drying his cheek with his sleeve, wincing a bit as the rough fabric of his jacket grazed the cut, Tabita sat down on an unoccupied bench. The next bench over had a man, around the age of 40, sleeping on it. It was kind of hard to tell, since all the unshaved hair probably added at least 10 years to his real age. Tabita shivered as he imagined himself looking like that in a few years. Suddenly, there was footsteps pounding on the ground. Someone was coming this way. Tabita froze, his body on high alert. Who could it be at this time of the day? A villain? No, don't jinx it, Tabita. It's probably a random jogger. Yeah, probably some guy doing his daily night jogs. Or someone on their way to the convenience store. Or, the stranger had almost reached the park. Their footsteps extremely loud in the silence of the night. Acting on his instincts, Tabita lay down on the bench, hugging his backpack tightly to his chest. He squeezed his eyes shut as he turned, leaving his back facing towards the entrance of the park. The person running paused at the entrance. There was a moment of silence before they stepped into the park. Without hesitation, they began making their way towards Tabita. Tabita didn't dare to move, or breath, or blink, or do anything. His entire body was stiff all the way down to his toes. All sorts of terrifying thoughts regarding this situation occupied his mind. Thoughts that he desperately wished would disappear at the moment because they were not helping. The stranger stopped inches away from his bench. They shifted around. Then something, Tabita couldn't see but he felt, moved towards him, which he assumed was a hand. It stopped on the cut on his cheek, rubbing it gently, the soft touches causing goosebumps to form all over his body. Now the thoughts in his mind were going in a whole new direction reaching a whole new level of creepiness and disturbance that he didn't dare to dwell on. Before he could think of a way to get out of this dot this strange situation, the person whispered, Tabita. The voice was familiar. Tabita snapped his eyes open to a familiar face. Takshida. Well, Takshida jerked back and landed on his rear, his eyes wide in shock. I it thought you were asleep. Ah, uh, Tabita also sat up in surprise, pressing a hand to his chest. Don't scream right next to my ear. Both stared at each other's for a moment. Then both laughed at the same time. Man, I thought you were some rapist or serial killer. I totally thought I was dead. Tabita sighed as he relaxed against the bench. It was nice to see a familiar face after something like that. Although the familiar face belonged to the last person he wanted to see at the moment. Sorry I scared you. I didn't meant to do that. Takshita rubbed the back of his neck as he apologized. I couldn't sleep so I decided to take a walk. I thought I saw you but I wasn't sure so I decided to take a look. Sorry, I really didn't mean to creep you out. It's fine. You're forgiven. 
So, Tom Idol looked away from the curious gaze of his popular classmate, ashamed of being seen in his disgruntled state, especially by the perfect and popular Takeshita. He feared how the popular boy would react to his being a disgrace to his parents and a failure in life. He feared rejections. You can stay the night at my house if you want. I live alone. Wah. Tom Ida spluttered, shaking his head and waving around frantically. No, I can't bother you that way. It's not a bother. Besides, Takeshita stopped his waving hand and pushed them down. I can't just turn away when a classmate of mine is in need of help. I'm trying to become a hero. And that's not something a hero would do. Takeshita's eyes were bright and honest, like the brilliant sun that was too far out of Tabaita's reach. It was physically impossible to say no to that look. All right then. Thank you. You're welcome. The breakfast table was silent except the sound of Hitoshi's eating. His parents, sitting across from him, were staring vacantly at him, not even noticing their chopsticks were slipping out of their fingers. Clack. The chopsticks clattered onto their plates, slashing food everywhere. Hitoshi took a bite out of his grilled fish. When his parents still didn't react, he said, the soup is dripping. Oh, oh right. His parents then jumped out of their seats and scrambled to clean the mess they had made. Hitoshi chuckled. You look stupid. Toshi Chan his mom, Shinsu Kaioken, whined as she dried the stain on his dad's apron. His dad, Shinsu Haka, flushed red and embarrassed and kept rubbing his neck. It was a habit Hitoshi had unfortunately inherited, as he also rubbed his neck when he was embarrassed or nervous. So, Hitoshi, did something happen? Haka asked. Aside from the incident yesterday, of course. HM. Nothing. Really. Hitoshi nodded. Then why did you slick your hair back like that? Kaioken asked as she put away the towel and sat back down at the table. We've been wanting to cut your bangs for years, but you keep refusing to. Refusing. More like growling like a hound dog and biting whomever that dares to touch his hair. Hitoshi glared at his dad, lowering his head and putting as much force as he could muster behind the glare, trying to look intimidating. JK JK. Hitoshi growled. Hey he don't start biting me now. I'm not a fish. That's a good one. Kaioken laughed and slapped Hako on the back. But seriously though, did something happen? Have you heard of a hero called Eraserhead? Kaioken and Haka traded a glance. Nope, never heard of him. Maybe he's a new hero. Well, Hitoshi munched on the grilled fish, his favorite dish. He helped out with our lunch activity yesterday. His quirk is a race and he can erase anyone's quirk temporarily. His eyes glow red and his hair floats when he uses it. His parents traded another glance. Stop staring at each other and listen to me when I talk. Hitoshi pouted, slamming his fist down on the table. Ouch, that hurt. No, keep a straight face. Don't show it. Be a man and don't cry. His hands shook in pain and he hoped his mom didn't notice that. Her quirk was empathy and she could feel others' emotions. But only when she wanted to. Itoshi could only pray that she wasn't using her quirk right now. Sorry sorry. Continue the story. Anyway, when that villain attacked us, Eraserhead saved us and I just thought he looked really cool with his hair all floated up and all that. So I changed my hairstyle a bit. A bit. Kaioken cried in mock horror as she pointed at his hair. You call this a bit. This, this monstrosity, this chicken nest, this, this, that's a bit too much, don't you think, darling? Hitoshi agreed. That did hurt. A bit. He didn't wake up an hour early to do his hair just to be laughed at. I, I can't stand it anymore. Seeing Hitoshi already finished with his breakfast, Kaioken grabbed his arm and dragged him to her room. Come, let mom show you how it's done. An hour later. A-H-H-H I'm late. And whose fault is that? Hitoshi grumbled. Kaioken ran around panicking as she gathered her stuff. Need a ride. Haka offered. No, I'm there to promote my story, not to scare the living hell out of the editors. Kaioken slipped on her high heels then looked herself over in the full body mirror by the entrance. How do I look? Good, good. All right then. I'm off. And she left, answering her own question. Mom's story will probably get rejected again. Don't raise the flag, kiddo. Aye aye. Yesterday was the last day of school before the summer vacation began. Kaken was ordered to go to some type of summer swimming camp to cool down, according to Mitsuki. Izuku didn't have anything in particular planned for the 40 days of vacation. To him, attending YHP was enough fun. So, the usual lunch activity is cancelled today. W-H-A-T-T-T. And that was how their day started. Why, Sensei? What do you mean it's cancelled? What I mean is, Shimura Sensei bent down behind the podium and held up a giant poster stand of five pro heroes in their respective, well-known poses. Today, we're going to sell hero cookies to raise money for the charity. Hey, that's boring. Can we eat em cookies? I want all might. Now now, settle down, kids. Shimura Sensei passed the stand to Genji Sensei, who leaned it against the blackboard. Being a hero isn't all about helping people in need. You also need good communication skills. And selling cookies to the public is a great way to practice that skill. Shimura Sensei is right. Besides, the money we collected will be donated to Shinsekai Charity.
who then allocates the donation for various circumstances, like survivors who lost their homes in a disaster or medical fees for victims of villain attacks and the such. You're still helping people, just in an indirect manner. Izuku had heard of Shinsekai many times on the news. Apparently it was the largest charity in Japan. Anyone who publicly donated to Shinsekai would immediately gain popularity, and their reputation would instantly skyrocket. Truth be told, he was a little disappointed that he didn't get to help people today. Helping people was fun. It made them happy and seeing them happy made him happy. The EXP and reputation points were just a bonus. But like Genji Sensei said, donating to charity meant you were doing something good right. His mama had never donated money before but that was because she was already in a pinch raising him by herself with what little income she earned. His papa never helped, always sending them useless strange things. But mama did donate his baby clothes and toys, saying they would go to the babies who lost their home in disasters. Not donating didn't make you bad, but donating definitely made you a good person. After a brief explanation of the event, they were placed into a team of five again. This time, Izuku was placed with Manami. Ayama, a kid he'd never met before, and Dot Wait. Shinsu, W what happened to your hair? I felt like doing something different today. Shinsu replied as he ran his fingers through his messy purple hair that was slicked back, allowing his beautiful purple eyes to be seen. They were big and pure in a deep shade of purple that reminded Izuku a lot of grapes. Their eyes are very pretty. The compliment slipped out of his lips before he could run it through his brain-to-mouth filter. Oh oh. Shinsu's face turned three shades of red in a split second. He ducked his head and rubbed his neck, which was also flushed red. T thank you. Wow, it's my first time seeing your eyes. Namamano came up and leaned close to Shinsu, inspecting his eyes. Shinsu stepped back from the eager boy a bit uncomfortably. Don't they remind you of grapes? Your eyes look delicious. Makes me wanna eat th, ak. Namamano stumbled forward, a footprint on his rear. Algami stood behind him with his hands in his pockets, frowning. Don't be a creep, Mamo. Let's go. Our team's waiting for you. Namamano was dragged away from Shinsu's delicious grape eyes while Minami shook her head with a sigh. He just never learned, did he? W well, that's that. Izuku chuckled nervously. He turned to the kid he's never met before and introduced himself. We already know each other's from last say, but we don't know you yet. I'm Midoriya Izuku. What's your name? Observe plus one. Nakiromansa LV7. 7YO. Quiet, reserved, pessimistic. Nikiro Mansa. Also quirkless. Nice to meet you. Nikiro had a gloomy appearance. His hideous dome of black, dry hair matted over his face like a seaweed. Ladybug eyes bulged from his sunken face. His lips were dry and cracked, as if he hadn't drank a single drop of water for a day. His body, pale skin and jutting bones, made people worry about his home situation. When asked, Nikiro said that was how he looked like when he was born. On one hand, Izuku was happy to find another quirkless kid. On the other hand, he felt bad for Nikiro. The groups chattered for a bit before they were ushered onto the same bus from last week. The bus ride was just as loud as the first time. The outgoing kids laughed and bickered. The more reserved kids kept to themselves. Shinsu was sitting alone when Izuku decided to pop next to him. Hey, hello, so I've been wondering about your quirk. What about it? Izuku scooted closer to Shinsu. You said Hagakir-chan would be afraid if you used your quirk. And that got me really curious. Can you show me your quirk? You can use it on me. I promise I won't be afraid. No, why? Izuku groaned. You were gonna use it on Agami last week. That, Shinsu turned away and glanced out of the window, rubbing his neck absent-mindedly. That was just a bluff. A bluff? Yeah, I wasn't really gonna use it on him. I was just scaring him. Cause I know if I use it you guys would all hate me. I would never. You would? Shinsu turned around to look him into the eyes. The moment I use my quirk, you, along with everyone who sees it, will hate me and think I'm a villain, just like everybody else. You're just like them. So no, I'm not using it, ever. That stung. Shinsu's words cut through him sharper than any of Kaken's insults had ever done. The fact that Shinsu thought that he was so blind and ignorant like all those other kids were, offended him. It was like saying Izuku was no different from Kaken, from everyone who had ever mocked him for being quirkless. He knew nothing. He had no idea what Izuku had gone through. How could he assume Izuku was that type of person without knowing him first? I, I, I'm not like them. Why would you say that? Tears pricked his eyes and Izuku stood abruptly, staggering to the seat he shared with Manami without waiting for Shinsu's reactions. You okay? I'm fine. Izuku wiped away his tears and forced a smile to his face. He didn't want Manami to worry. This was his issue. He could deal with it himself. All right then. But if you ever want someone to talk to, I'll always be there for you. The shorter girl smiled and comforted, just like Izuku had done to her. Thank you, Manami-chan. The bus slowed to a stop near the entrance to Quirky Lake, a famous tourist spot. Many years ago when Quirk first manifested, 
There was a huge battle between the quirkless and the quirk users, who, at the time, were called superhumans. A large crater marked the end of the battle. Over time, the crater became what was known as Quirky Lake. There were rumors that skeletal remains of the fighters remained buried deep in the lake. Some said they caught human bones while fishing. Izuku didn't know, and didn't want to know, if the rumors were true or not. Once everyone gathered in front of the bus, the teams were led away by ectoplasm clones with a couple teenage volunteers carrying the equipment and poster stands for each team. Izuku's team was followed by a protein boy with wings who manipulated his feathers to lift the equipment into the air. Their location was by the little convenience store that sold fishing gears among many other things. As they set up their tables next to the shop where shade was offered by an overarching tree, a quest notification popped up. Quest alert. Side quest. Selling cookies. Description. Heroes can't be afraid to speak to strangers. They also need to be convincing in certain situations. Sell cookies to strangers to practice these two skills. Status. Zero divided by 50 boxes sold. Time limit. Hours. 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Reward. 300 EXP. 10 reputation point. Failure. Accept decline. Izuku banished the window by selecting the first option. Now he had four ongoing quests, Shinsu's and Aoyama's, the daily good deed for the day, and this cookie quest. After the talk on the bus, Shinsu had avoided looking or interacting with him. Izuku had never dealt with this type of situations before since he never had any friends other than Kaken. And when Kaken was pissed about something, he showed his emotions through fists and curses, instead of clamming up and ignore the other like Shinsu did. Since Izuku had no idea how to go about it, he decided to set Shinsu's quest aside for now. The other target of his quest, Aoyama, was currently organizing his boxes of hero cookies by arranging them into five by six rows neatly with their front side facing up. The hero he got was Iron Man, a popular hero in America. Izuku got All Might, but not before blabbering on and on about his obsession and all the All Might merchandise he owned and films he'd watched and annoying everyone into surrendering. Shinsu got Jackie Chan, a quirkless hero from China. He didn't look too happy, but ever since Izuku met the purple-haired boy, he'd never seen him smile. Minami got Sombra, a hacking hero in Mexico who was mostly active on the internet. Apparently Sombra was her favorite hero, seeing how she literally fell onto her back giggling as she threw her hands into the air. And last but not least, Nikuro got Deadpool, an immortal hero from Canada. Izuku dragged his cardboard parcel of boxes next to Aoyama, mumbling an excuse me to Nikuro who was next to the blonde boy. Hey Aoyama-kun. Aoyama perked up with a dazzling smile. Ah, uh, bonjour, Monsieur Midoriya. Bon jour. That means hello in French. Monsieur means mister. Ah, be bonjour. You can just call me Midoriya. All right then. Midoriya-san. That's better. Izuku took some boxes out of the parcel and began arranging them the same way Ayama did. So, um, I've been wondering your quirk. You said you can shoot laser out of your belly button. We. Oui, that's correct. What can it do? For a split second, Ayama's expression turned forlorn but it was gone as soon as it appeared and was replaced by his trademark dazzling smile. Baby one day you'll see. That marked the end of the conversation. By that time everyone had finished setting up the boxes. Ectoplasm and the winged boy stood on the side, watching as their first customer walked up to them. A boy about a few years older than they were pulled his father over their direction while pointing at the poster stand of the five pro heroes. They were both carrying fishing rods and a container for lures. The boy didn't even hesitate, immediately running over to Izuku. All Might. Dad look. It's All Might cookies. The father picked up a box, looking it over. How much is this? I it's only a hundred yen sir. But you can give more if you want to. All the money will be donated to Shinsekai. Izuku gestured to an empty box labeled 100 yen. All right. Here. The father took out two 100 yen coins and dropped it in the box. I'll take one box. Thanks kids. Keep up the good work. The boy grabbed the box out of his father's hand, ripping open the packaging and began pouring All Might into his mouth. Izuku let out a breath he didn't even realize he was holding. Talking to strangers wasn't his forte. The teachers were right, he did need to work on that. Time passed by quickly as everyone lost themselves in the cell. All Might was sold the fastest. Second was the American pop hero, Iron Man. Third was the Chinese hero, Jackie Chan. By the time Izuku had sold all 30 of his boxes, there were 5 Iron Man left, 10 Jackie Chan, and 17 Sombra. As for Deadpool, only 3 boxes were sold. The Kiro hunched over in his chair sullenly. His seaweed hair casting shadows over his eyes. Nikiro Kun. Izuku moved his chair next to him. Let me help you. You can't do anything about it, Nikiro mumbled. No one likes Deadpool. They don't even let us kids watch his films, so he must be an unpopular and bad hero. That doesn't make sense. Izuku retorted. If he's unpopular then they wouldn't have put his picture on the cookie box. I see people talking about him all the time on the internet, and they seem to like him. So there must be another reason why no one buys them. As they talked, a mother-son pair walked up to them. 
The boy glanced between the boxes, unable to decide. The mother picked up Iron Man and said, Look at this. Isn't he cool? I don't like him. This guy's cooler. The boy grabbed a box of Deadpool cookies, and the mother immediately paled. She yanked it out of his hand and placed it down. No, we're not buying that. Why not? Ken, why don't we buy something else? Jackie Chan seems pretty cool. No, tell me why not. I like Deadpool. The mother sighed. Deadpool isn't good for children. He's not appropriate for your age. So what? You always say that but from the clips I've seen he's hella cool. Ken, language. At this point, Izuku decided to interject. Ma'am, both heads turned to him. Izuku, standing up, resisted the urge to fiddle with his fingers and spoke. I, I, um, I understand where you're coming from. I mean, my mama tell me not to watch Deadpool because he's bad. So I never did. But from what I've seen of him, he seems like a good person. He may not be a pro. Appropriate for children but he's still a hero and he's doing good things. Yes, he may be a good hero, but he's not a good person. There is a reason why your mama didn't let you watch his films. The mother tried to reason with Izuku, but he wasn't buying it. He didn't know much about Deadpool, but no matter how bad a person he was, he was still a hero. And at the end of the day, that was all it mattered. Heroes saved people, and that made them a good person. B but this is just a box of cookies. Izuku grabbed a box of Deadpool cookies and pushed it in front of the mother. This isn't a Deadpool film, or Deadpool himself. It's just a box of cookies. It's just snack, food. Eating this won't make you bad. I promise. The mother didn't speak, but instead glanced down at her son. Look, Izuku ripped open the packaging and stuffed a Deadpool cookie in his mouth. See, nothing happens. It's just a cookie, ma'am. Please, give us a chance. Give Deadpool a chance. We're not doing this for our sake. All the money goes to Shinsekai. Please help us. Help the people in need by buying a box of Deadpool cookies. The mother looked a little convinced. Her eyes darted back and forth between Deadpool and the other heroes. Then she asked her son, Ken, what do you think? The boy, Ken, accepted the Deadpool cookie Izuku offered and chewed slowly. It's delicious, mom. It's just a cookie. You should try one. Izuku gave the mother one. She ate it, swallowed, and sighed. Fine, I'll buy a box of Deadpool cookie. Ken let out an excited yell as his mother took out her wallet and dropped a 500 yen coin into the coin box. Izuku was gonna hand her a new box, but she insisted on taking the one he already opened. Tea that went well. All the energy left his legs and Izuku collapsed onto the seat, his body turning into mush and sliding off of it. That was amazing. Nakuro gawked at him. How did you do it? I don't really know. It just happened. Izuku tried explaining. I just feel kinda bad for Deadpool to be judged like that, and I really hate being judged. So, me too. I hate when people judge others based on what little they know about them. The two boys shared an understanding look, and both cracked a smile. The next few customers were also easily convinced just like the mother. Izuku managed to help sell nearly 20 boxes of Deadpool cookies in around 30 minutes. At this rate, he would reach 50 in no time. Only 8 left. Izuku exclaimed. We're almost done here, Nikuro-kun. Nikuro didn't respond. Nikuro-kun. The seaweed-haired boy was arching over the table clenching his head so tight veins bulged from his pale skin. Brows knocked against each other and eyes squeezed shut. Nikuro hissed through tight lips. Am I? Head hurts. W what's wrong? I'm not sure. It feels like. Something's clawing in my brain. And. He shivered violently. I'm SS so. Cold. Wait here. I'll go get Ectoplasm Sensei. Izuku darted towards the lake where he last saw Ectoplasm and the winged boy. Ectoplasm Sensei. Ecto. His cry for help was cut short by a terrified scream. Ectoplasm and the winged boy were backing up slowly, cautiously staring at something. That was crawling out of the lake. It. Appeared to be a human. Izuku was a little too far to see and had badly ripped clothes on, but, oh my god. Izuku halted in his tracks, eyes widened in realization. The people around him also noticed the being, as they began running around screaming and panicking. Underneath the ripped clothes was a bare, ghastly white rib cage. The bones clacked with every movement it made, the end of the bones rubbing against each other and causing ear-splitting noises of nails on a chalkboard. The worst part was the head. No, it couldn't even be called a head. Now, it was just a skull. Iecto. Plasm. Sensei. Someone collided into Izuku roughly, sending him sprawling on the ground. Move out of the way and run for your life, idiot. The person ran off, not even bothering to apologize. Izuku pushed himself onto his knees, his hands scraped raw from the fall. More and more skeletal creatures crawled out of the lake. The ectoplasm clone was having trouble fighting all of them on his own. The original ectoplasm was probably on his way here, but Izuku wasn't sure if he could make it in time. Hey, you. Get up. A hand grabbed his bicep and yanked him up. Izuku stared, shocked, at the winged volunteering boy. Now's not the time to lose in your thoughts. Hurry up and let me get you guys out of here. Oh okay. 
The winged boy looped an arm around Izuku's midsection and flapped his wings. Izuku marveled as his feet slowly lifted off of the ground. Hold on tight. Okay. With a strong flap of his wings, the duo soared through the sky. Izuku's body felt like nothing, as if he was a mere feather gliding along the wind. In a few seconds, they arrived above the tables, and the scene they saw alarmed them. A horde of skeletons had surrounded the remaining four children. Manami, Shinsu, Ayama and Nakura were huddling together against the overarching tree, trembling in fear as the otherworldly beings closed in on them. Shit, the winged boy cursed, scowling. How do you expect me to not fight in a situation like this? Izuku bit his lips. Before the winged boy could come to a decision, a skeleton stretched a bony arm towards Manami. Damn it, a few feathers fell out of his wings and shot straight towards the skeleton. But before they could reach it, the creature was blasted away by a bright, blue stream of laser. Ayama-kun, Izuku gasped. The blonde, dazzling boy was standing in front of the others with his arms stretched to his side defensively. His face set in a determined grimace, after the blast of laser shot out of his belly button, ripping a hole open in his dress shirt in the process. His body flung backward and smashed into Minami, who was caught by Shinsu and Nikiro. They all seemed unharmed, much to Izuku's relief. That kid has some talent. The winged boy chuckled as the feathers he controlled shot through the remaining skeletons, demolishing them in a second. He then descended and set Izuku gently on the ground. You guys okay? Um don't yeah. Thank you, Shinsu said. Manami and Nakura were gaping at the winged boy, while Ayama appeared to be lost in his thoughts. Come on, let's get you guys out of here. Hey you. A gruff voice cut through their conversation. Everyone turned to look at a group of armed police officers charging towards them. The one in the lead, a big and fat and angry looking officer was yelling at them. Me, the winged boy asked. Yes, you. Do you know that public use of quirk is not authorized? The pro hero ectoplasm gave me permissions to use it to get them out. We're with YHP. With a swipe of his arm, the angry officer sent his team over to assist ectoplasm while he made his way in front of the winged boy. With his hands on his hips, he leaned over, a menacing aura radiating off of his postures. But did he tell you to fight? No, the winged boy shrugged. But what else do you expect me to do in a situation like this? Just watch them being attacked and not do anything. That's pretty inhuman, don't you think? I may have wings and I may have been called a bird or a chicken many times. But I still see myself as a human and I'd rather not be described as inhuman. Laws are there for a reason. And laws are not meant to be broken. Really, I've heard the opposite quite a few times. While the officer and the winged boy bantered, Izuku inched over to Nakura. PSS. Hey, how are you feeling? Much better. Oh, that's good. All of you are coming with me. The angry officer cut them off roughly and ushered them to a police car parked nearby. Izuku stared longingly at the leftover boxes of cookies before Minami pushed him forward. Let's go before he gets even more mad at us. He could only sigh as he dismissed the notification window with a thought. The quest was a failure. Yuga was still in a daze when he got into the police car, squeezing in between Midoriya and Shinsu. He stared vacantly at the bars separating the driver and the backseat as he thought back to the rush of adrenaline that coursed throughout his body when he shot his laser. He did it. He actually did it. He had used his quirk without hurting anyone. He was caught by his friends and didn't hurt himself either, so he could use his quirk without getting hurt. The revelation downed on him like a drop of water dripping into a still lake forming ripples across the surface. Iwuga felt his entire world lighting up. Finally his hero dream didn't seem that far out of his reach. Why are you still here? Yuga jerked back to reality and saw a large pink face inches away from his own. Get. Out. Of my car. The police officer ceased and practically kicked Yuga out of the car. Yuga stumbled a few steps to steady himself then looked around. The officer had dropped them off at the entrance of the lake. There were ambulance and paramedics around helping people who were injured. Midoriya was talking to a paramedic who was bandaging his hand while Nakuro stood next to him as another paramedic checked his temperature. Shinsu and Aba were sitting on the grass next to the YHP bus along with all his other classmates and the volunteers. No one looked severely injured, which was a relief. Yuga headed over to the bus and sat down next to Shinsu and Aba. Shinsu-san, Aba-san, he started. I want to thank you for catching me earlier. If you haven't, I would probably have hit my head on the tree and get hurt. So, merci Bokup. It's no biggie. You fell back so I caught you. It's nothing special. Shinsu waved it off casually. What he said. Aba shrugged. Plus all I did was act as a body pillow between you and him, so you don't need to thank me. Non non. Yuga wasn't having it. You still protected me from the tree even though it was unintentional, so I owe you my thanks. He crossed his arm and pouted, as if he refused to leave if they don't accept his gratitude. Both of them shared a glance, then sighed in reluctance. And Yuga beamed. He proceeded to make small talks to the other two kids. He chose his wordings carefully making sure not to offend anyone on accident. The two of them were both quiet kids, and so it was a rare occurrence to have them actually join in on a conversation. Not only that, 
Never had anyone actually paid attention to what Yuga said. To be able to finish what he said was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And Yuga couldn't help but take advantage of this chance. By the time they had warmed up to each other's, the teachers have returned with Midoriya. Ectoplasm Sensei had stayed behind with Nakuro to speak with the police for some unknown reason. When asked, Shimura Sensei just waved off their concern and told them not to worry, and that Nakuro wasn't in trouble. Of course, that didn't stop everyone from gossiping about it on the ride back. Yuga sat with Midoriya on the bus. As soon as the other boy's bottom touched the seat, he launched into an array of compliment about Yuga's quirk. I think you have a really awesome quirk and you should use it more. I bet others would like it, too. Merci, Midoriya-san. Yuga couldn't keep the grin off of his face as each compliment lifted off the weight on his shoulders little by little. The radiance of Midoriya's smile never wavered throughout the ride. It was as if he actually meant what he said. Was Yuga's power really not terrifying, or dangerous, or bothersome? Was it really likable? These questions clogged his mind as he followed the rest of the students off the bus and into the classroom. Genji sensei then turned it into the familiar field once again. The cookie cell ended sooner than the teachers expected, so they gave everyone an hour of free time before their parents would arrive. In the past during free time, Yuga always sat on the side and watched the others play their quirks, but today, Yuga would join them. Midoriya had begged him many times on the bus to show him his quirk again and Yuga eventually gave in under the boy's powerful puppy eyes. When free time started, Midoriya immediately pulled him to the side with many trees and eagerly waited for him to begin. With his back against one tree, Yuga focused the energy to his belly button. They gathered without resistance and he pushed them out in one go. The beautiful sparkling blue beam of laser shot straight through the opposite tree, the force pushing Yuga back but the tree he was leaning against stopped him from going back further. Excitement bubbling in his chest, Yuga couldn't help but let out an excited cry. Before he could see if Midoriya shared the happiness, a foreign voice put a dam on his excitement. Well, Yuga whipped around in surprise. Their standing behind them was Namamano wearing a disbelieving look. That's so cool. I why didn't you show your quirk earlier? Namamano clasped his shoulders and patted it for good measures. And mercy, Yuga coughed out. He wasn't used to be touched so nonchalantly, but he didn't want to brush him off and risk offending the other boy. Do that again. Namamano urged, letting go of his shoulder and taking a few steps back. Come on I wanna see it. Okay. And Yuga did so. Another hole formed on the opposite wall. Some sparkles remained in the air after the blue laser disappeared. But this time, a cramp also formed in his stomach. Well, Midoriya and Namamano were awed. Seeing their amazed face made Yuga feel giddy. Knowing he and his quirk, the power he and his old classmates were so afraid of, was being praised and liked by others made him happy. That is so cool. Do that again. Please. Yuga was about to refuse, but he was afraid that if he said no, they might be mad and lose interest in him. And he didn't want that. No one ever gave him any attention, so Yuga would do anything to be noticed, to gather people's interest. And if he had to continuously use his quirk, then so be it. Wait, are you sure? It's fine, Midoriya-san. I can handle this. And so Yuga did it again. And so the cramp got worse. The pain was dulling his senses, and Yuga bent over slightly, face scrunched up in pain. Beads of sweat formed on his forehead, and the familiar clogging sensation returned to his throat and Yuga swallowed thickly. Hey hey Yamakun, are you sure you're okay? You look like you're in dot pain. Aye aye. Before Yuga could say anything, Namamano interrupted him. That's amazing. Wow wah. Do that again. One more time. I don't think it's a good idea. Yuga murmured through tight lips, his breathing becoming shallow. But the excited boy didn't seem to notice it. Oh come on. Don't be a spoil sport. Just one last time. Last dot time. Yeah. Yuga's visions were swaying and he had to lean against the tree to not face blunt, the bark digging into his spine painfully. He made his decision. All right then, Ayama kun Despite the warning bells ringing in his ears, Yuga ignored Midoriya's cry and struggled to gather the remaining energy. The cramp grew worse the more energy he tried to gather, as if someone had grabbed a hold of his intestines and twisted and tied them into knots. As he readied himself to shoot out what little energy he could gather, bile rose to his throat. Here dot we go. The laser shot out. Along with Yuga's last restraint, Piwa, in an instant, the foul odor of bile filled his lungs. Bending over a growing pile of his breakfast and lunch, Yuga gasped as he tried to breathe through his clogged nose and throat. More and more vomit escaped his mouth and some even made its way to his nose. Tears blurred his visions. He couldn't breathe, he couldn't see. What was going on? Holy, what the hell, Ayama? That's disgusting. What's wrong with you? That sounded like Namamano. Yuga blinked away his tears and glanced to the side, his eyes widened. It was those eyes again, those fearful, alarming eyes, as if he was a freak who was so different from everyone else. Now it was even worse. There was also disgust. Why was it so difficult? He just wanted to be like everyone else. He just wanted someone to spare him a glance, and treat him as if he mattered. 
as if he wasn't any different. He had worked so hard. He thought he could finally use his quirk without hurting anyone now. He thought people would finally accept him now. But that wasn't enough. It was never enough. Why did he have a quirk like this? Why did it have to be him? Why was he so different? Ayama kun I'm, I'm gonna go get the teachers. So, Namamano kun Please take him to the restroom. A. Why me? Please. Ayama kuns my friend and he needs help. Fine then. Someone, presumably Namamano, grabbed his arm and hooked it around his neck. Yuuga flinched on reflex and tried to push him away. But the stronger boy kept his hold and walked him out of the classroom. Yuuga kept his head down the entire time. Refusing, or rather, afraid, to acknowledge Namamano's presence. He didn't even need to ask to know what the other boy was thinking. Disgusting. Scary. Freak. It was getting too predictable. Tears filled his eyes to the brink and Yuuga let them fall over the threshold willingly. He bit his lips to contain his pitiful sobs. He didn't need any more harsh mockery, or pity. Not that he expected any from someone who was friend with a big bully like Agami. At least, that was what he thought before. I'm sorry. He received an apology out of all things, from the person he least expected it from. A crowd had gathered around the scene when Izuku arrived with the two frantic teachers on his heels. Ayama and Namamano were already gone. Hopefully the latter would realize his slip of tongue and apologize for not thinking before speaking once again. Everyone calm down. Shimura-sensei bellowed. Yuuga-kun is fine, and I'm sure he wouldn't want everyone to worry. Leave the rest to us teachers and go back to whatever activity you were doing before. The crowd began to scatter but some remained around the scene. One girl scrunched up her face in disgust as she exclaimed in a mock, high-pitched voice, You were disgusting. Ayama smells. Another sniggered, PFFFT what do you expect? He's always making a fool out of himself. Izuku felt his face heating up in fury. Anger boiled inside of him and just when he was going to lash out. Shut up all of you. The voice surged over the whispers like a high tide in the low hours. All eyes turned to the purple-haired boy glowering with his purple eyes ablaze. Silence only lasted a mere second before mock laughters crept up again. Why are you defending him anyway? One girl scoffed. It's not our fault he always dot pff dot embarrasses himself. Shut up. Just shut up. The girl suddenly snapped her mouth shut, her eyes staring into space and her entire body frozen. You have no idea how painful it is to be different. Don't talk about what you don't understand. This time the silence lasted until Shimura-sensei coughed behind her fist. Hitoshi-kun, I'm glad you stood up for Yuuga-kun, but it's not right to use your quirk to attack another classmate like this. The girl who just fell out of Shinsu's control puffed out her chest in pride. But then, and you too, Sakura-chan. A hero trainee should never make fun of other hero trainees. That's not only very unheroic, but would also create a barrier between you and your comrades. You may think it's no big deal, but small things like this can be used by the villains to weaken you down. You need all the help you can get as heroes. No hero fights alone. Even All Might has a team supporting him from the shadows. So it's incredibly stupid of you to push your future hero comrades away from you. Sakura blushed furiously in humiliation. Ducking her head down avoiding everyone's eyes, she ran off not looking back. The rest of you, go enjoy the rest of your free time. When Yuuga-kun comes back, please don't bring this up again. The poor child already had enough. He didn't need more rejections. Receiving permission, the kids all ran off to play with a few remaining with the teachers volunteering to help clean the mess, including Izuku and Shinsu. Sound of the wet mop sloppily wiping the ground, to which Genji-sensei had turned the small patch of grass back, was the only noise in the clearing besides the artificial cicadas chattering in the trees. Izuku kept stealing glances at the other boy, but ever since Shinsu used his quirk on Sakura, he had his head lowered and a gloom casting shadows over his face. Shinsu-kun Izuku shuffled closer to the other boy, his mop creating a wet stripe across the wooden classroom floor. Shinsu stilled for a second, then turned his back to Izuku and continued mopping. Hey, I think that it's very heroic of you to stand up for Ayama-kun. So, Shinsu still didn't turn around, so Izuku walked around to face him. So I think you should use your quirk more. At this, Shinsu dropped his mop and retorted, Did you not see their faces when they saw me control her? They were afraid of me, of my power. It was a bad idea to use it. Why do you care so much what they think? Izuku spread his hands out as he argued. You used it to help Ayama-kun. It doesn't matter what others think of your power. You did it for something good, something heroic, and that's what's important above all else. Even if I used an evil quirk to do that. I don't think your quirk is evil, Shinsu-kun. Izuku picked up his mop and handed it to the other boy. It's not like you did anything evil with it. Sure, you controlled her, but that's no different from having, say, a rope quirk and tying someone up with it. It's only evil if you did something evil with it, and I know you would never do that, right? Of course not, Shinsu declared. Then what's there to worry about? If others think you'll use your quirk for evil, then just prove them wrong. Use it for good, to save people and do other heroic things. Eventually, they'll see your effort and their opinions of you would change. What if they never see my effort? 
Well, Izuku smiled. I'll always be there to see it. Silence fell over them as Shinsu stared at Izuku with a rising blush on his face. Are you really not afraid of my quirk? No, what if I use it on you? Still, I won't be Afer. Izuku's body froze up and he felt his consciousness falling to the back of his mind, as if someone else had taken over it. Turn around three times. Izuku saw his body follow obediently. Then as soon as it was done, his consciousness returned to its original spot and the world became wider as if he had just taken off his glasses. Shinsu waited with obvious anxiety for Izuku to react. He probably expected him to act different now that he'd been on the receiving end of the stick. If he thought Izuku would turn on his friend for something stupid like this, then he couldn't be more wrong. I felt like a puppet. Shinsu snorted, a twitchy grin on his face. That's the first thing you say. Well, that is the first thing I thought of. And how do you like being a puppet? It's nice to just sit back and relax as someone else pull the strings for you. Shinsu's shoulders shook with barely contained laughter. He shook his head, perhaps for having his belief turned over, or maybe he just found Izuku's reaction funny. Either way, the fact that the sheen of ice barrier he coated all over his body was gone probably meant this was a good thing. So, are you going to use your quirk more now? You wish. Izuku smirked when Shinsu turned around to continue mopping. Despite what he said, Izuku knew it was just a bluff. After all, digitalization had just proved him wrong. Plest, fear of quirk, completed, leveled up, reputation point plus one. Ayama was hugging a tiny orange cat when he returned from the restroom with a smile on his face. It took some while for Izuku to recognize the cat as Namaniko. That realization brought a fit of laughter to him, clenching his stomach and wheezing. Izuku shook his head with a soft smile and mouthed, I'm fine to the human cat duo who threw him concerned glances. Whatever had happened in the restroom, Izuku didn't know, but apparently it had served to bring the two closer to each other. Quest, fear of quirk, completed, reputation point plus one. By the time the parents came to pick up their child, Nakuro and Ectoplasm still hadn't returned. Izuku and the others would later learn that Nakuro had quit the program since the incident. The teachers refused to tell them what exactly was the cause, but a kid with an expendable ear quirk eavesdropped on them and found out that Nakuro was a late boomer and the skeletons were actually due to his quirk's manifestation. The class had mixed reaction on this matter. Some were terrified of his quirk, some were glad he had quit, while the quirkless ones were motivated to see Nakuro who used to be a part of their little group now joining the 80% of the world with quirks. This showed them that late boomer wasn't impossible and they do have a chance to get rid of the quirkless title. Izuku's mama was about to throw a fuss when she heard him getting involved with dangerous stuff again. But he quickly explained to her that it was just Nakuro's quirk causing the scene and she gradually calmed down. Izuku could tell that Mama was still worried from the creases on her forehead and the frown that she tried to hard to hide. But this was the road he chose and he'd go down with his decision. Even if his path to Hiro was filled with deadly vines and creatures, Izuku believed, with his loved ones by his side and digitalization. He'd one day be able to fulfill his dream. True, it may be dangerous and Mama would worry, but Izuku couldn't turn back now. Thankfully, nothing truly dangerous happened in the following weeks. Izuku studied hard at school. Went on daily quest hunts with Mama, had fun with friends and YHP, slowly stacking up EXP and rep points. Things were going just fine. He had became closer friends with Ayama, who explained to him about the nature of his quirk and how it was hard to control and caused him pain if he used it for more than a second. Izuku didn't like seeing his friend in pain, or rather, he didn't like seeing anyone in pain. So he promised himself inwardly that one day, he would save up enough reputation point to buy Ayama a gadget that would help with his quirk. The bazaar and digitalization had everything he could and couldn't think of. Surely, there would be a gadget that would help. And just like that, time passed, days flew by, months, years. And soon, two years had passed since Izuku first received digitalization. And he was close to reach level 10 and getting his first quirk. Shimura Eiko had been a teacher at the Youth Hero program for almost five years now. She had seen students grow and mature and had her fair share of tear-jerking farewells with some memorable students. But never had she ever seen a boy like Midoriya Izuku who went after troubled individuals like a beast. He was a fairly normal boy when she first met him, but recently he had changed. The moment they got off the bus for their usual lunch activity, his bright green eyes would sharpen and dart around frantically searching for even the tiniest signs of distress. When a cry of help split the air, he would rush there so fast it was almost as if he had a speed quirk. He could always come up with the fastest and most efficient way to help others, and immediately after the individuals said thanks, he would run off for the next one. It confused her to no end how Izuku was able to locate all those people in need without actually searching for them. It was like he had a GPS in his head tracking down all their locations so he knew them before and exactly where to go to find them. Eiko was the type of person who couldn't let go of something once it took root in her mind. Izuku's situation had been stressing her day and night. How could a quirkless boy possibly track down people so fast? 
What pushed him to this extent? What was his motivations? Aiko thought about it when she taught, when she ate, even when she was with her family. It bothered her so much that she couldn't help but eavesdrop on Izuku one day during lunch when their activity was cancelled due to the rain. Watch this, Midoriya Izuku and Ayama Yuuga were sitting together next to Namamano Henshin, who crouched slightly with his eyes shut and teeth bared, placing his fingers into a cross symbol in an imitation of a certain fictional character whom Aiko swore she had seen somewhere. He inhaled and growled, Hench. His body twisted and pulled like it was been sucked into a vortex. Colors blended together forming patches of orange and stripes of black. His form cowered and shrank, his limbs shortening and a tail emerging at the base of his spine. Tada! The cat exclaimed, but no one seemed to share his excitement. Yuuga smiled, that's a cat. It's Nayat. It's a tiger. Izuku smiled, no, I'm fairly sure that's a cat. It's Nayat. Mamo. Yuuga lifted the cat off of the ground, ignoring his frantic scrambling and brought him to the edge of the lake by the clearing they were gathering at. Look, you're a cat. Henshin stared into the water for a long, reflective moment before hanging his head in disappointment and morphing back to his human form. Maybe a tiger's too much for you. Why not try something smaller? Izuku unwrapped his bento and Eiko stifled a giggle at how cute it was. It was an All Might printed lunchbox containing rice balls, squid sausages, rabbit apples, and broccoli monsters, definitely the type of bentos his mother would prepare. Eiko had met Midoriya and Ko about a dozen time in the past two years. The woman seemed like the quick-to-worry and happy-go-lucky kind of mother. She was the kind of mother who would join her son in video game tournament and throw huge birthday parties for her child. The exact type that Eiko wished to be but could never be. That thought brought a frown to her face. Eiko was married and had a son named Tenko. She wouldn't consider herself a bad mother, per se. She did everything she could to teach her son the clear line between right and wrong. But when her husband was the type of cool dad who would let his son ride around the yard on the lawnmower or trash the house when she wasn't around or maybe both, right after they had spring cleaned the house the day prior, the child more often than not would prefer the dad over the mom. Eiko had pondered every time Tenko looked down guiltily when she scolded him. Was she being too strict on him? Did she need to be more of a mother than a teacher? Was she doing her job properly? Eiko snapped out of her thoughts when someone shouted, Smaller animals aren't intimidating enough. I need something like a tiger or a lion that's strong and fierce and scary. Big is power, small is cowardice. Henshin took a big angry bite out of his apple and chewed with gusto. Where you get that from? Anyhow, I'm going to the zoo with my parents next week. Hopefully after seeing a tiger for the first time, I'll be more familiar with its form and can get a better grasp of it. Have fun, Yuuga said as he cut his cheesecake into three slices, offering one to each of his two closest friends. Eiko was still amazed at how fast children made friends. All her years of experience showed her that children weren't good at holding grudges. Take Ayama Yuuga for example. She had witnessed the brutal verbal abuse other children put him through that day two years ago when he had puke. But immediately a week later, he was getting along just fine with the rest of the class. Yuuga even became best friends with Henshin who, she later found out, contributed the most to his breakdown. Children, Eiko shook her head. She could never understand these adorable little creatures. You know, I still can't believe you sold your soul for a box of cheesecake. Izuku stuffed the entire slice into his mouth. Hey that's mean. Henshin pouted. What do you mean sell his soul? I didn't bribe him or anything. Well, the main reason I became your friend is due to that cake. Yuuga hummed in relish. Henshin sighed. I was trying to make up for making you puke, and I saw you staring at the cheesecake factory so I thought you might like it. I wasn't trying to bribe you and force you to be my friend. I'm not that despicable. I know, I know. I'm just joking, Monami. As Yuuga and Henshin began another round of bickering, Eiko simply made herself comfortable in the bushes and enjoyed the show. Ever since the incident two years ago, Yuuga and Henshin had gotten closer, so close that they went everywhere together. No one ever found out what happened between them in that restroom. But the week after that, Henshin surprised Yuuga with a box of cheesecake and immediately they became attached at the hips. Yuuga even started calling him by his nickname, Mamo, which was only used by his former best friend, Agami Jin. On the other side of the clearing under the shades of the trees, a roar of laughter exploded from a friend's circle. Eba Minami was lying on her back laughing so hard she was crying while her other friends were staring bewildered at her strangeness. Two years ago Minami was still a shy and reserved girl, but ever since she became friend with Izuku, she had opened up more and was no longer afraid to openly express herself. She was accepted for who she was, allowing her to do what she wanted to without letting others' opinions stop her. Many children who interacted with Izuku ended up becoming more confident at socializing. Izuku was like a beacon, prominent amongst others of the same age and drawing them towards him almost magnetically. Even without a quirk, he would definitely have a bright future. Eiko could see it. The boy had it in him to do something great in the future. If he keep it up, he might even become an icon, a symbol, someone who would be marked in history. 
All the great people in history had been either praised for their talent or ostracized for being different. But one thing they had in common was that they naturally stood out in a crowd. A few minutes later, Minami's laughter finally died down. She sat up, clenching her stomach, traces of laughter still visible on her face as she turned around and happened to meet Izuku's eyes. Then she blushed. Huh, what was that? Before Eiko could dwell more on the sight, Manami whipped around, her twin pigtails swinging and almost slapping one of her friend on the cheek. Was that what she thought it was? And see this. Yuuga lifted the hem of his dress shirt and pointed at a circular pad on his stomach, a gel-like sticker on his skin that didn't seem to hurt him or cause him any discomfort. A mysterious sender gifted it to me on my birthday this year. He said it's called PSS, Portable Sticker Set. It helps me control how much laser I push out and now I can use my quirk without hurting. Hey, hey guys, Izuku whispered, cutting him off. What? What does it mean when a girl blushes when she looks at you? She likes you, both replied simultaneously. Huh, did our dear Izu baby get an admirer? Henshin snickered. Wa well, no, I, I don't think so. Oh, both Henshin and Yuuga were grinning gleefully at him. Izuku swallowed thickly and looked away. Okay then, I won't ask. But tell us if you ever get a girlfriend, or a boyfriend. Both stared incredulously at Yuuga, and Eiko spluttered, ducking further into the bush to hide her presence. What? The power of love is strong enough to break through than any gender barriers. There's nothing wrong with being gay. My uncle at France was married to a man and his life couldn't be any happier. It was good to be so open-minded, Eiko thought, still recovering from the shock. But she wouldn't deny that Yuuga did have a talent at surprising people with surprising information at the surprising moment. Chirp chirp. And at this exact moment, her phone buzzed with a new message alert. Damn it. Eiko hissed, shoving her hand into her pocket and ripping out her phone. She unlocked it with a swipe of her thumb, effectively shutting it up, then dared a peek through the cracks of the bushes and was relieved to find the boys still chatting. Thank God her notification ringtone was the sound of birds chirping. Eiko jabbed the message app so hard the screen protector nearly cracked. The few seconds it took for the app to load felt forever long as she lay there flat on the grass, her other hand tapping the ground impatiently as she silently cursed the asshole who sent her a message at a critical moment like this. When the chat finished loading, the newest message stared blatantly at her. YHP group chat. Erased. Mike and will be starting the writing exam now and no comm devices are allowed if there's anything urgent PLZ contact ectoplasm. Mike, wish us luck. Aiko could never get herself to dislike the scruffy man. Despite how lazy and disorderly and unprofessional he could be at work, she had to admit that he was a good teacher. He was strict like her and almost never showed affection towards the students. But there was something about him that made him a likable person. If it was anyone else who sent the message, Eiko would probably be sending them death threat emoticons right now. But since it was Aizawa, she just couldn't gather herself to do it. And so she settled with AI Red Heart Coco. Good luck and hope both of you make it into UA. You're both great teachers here so I have no doubt that you'll do well on the exam. MIC, thanks, erased, THX. It was just like him to send a one-word reply to a long, two-sentence text. Eiko could only smile softly as she put her phone away and picked herself up. Lunch was about to end. The rain was still pouring down mercilessly when YHP ended that afternoon. Children were told to stay inside the classroom while Eiko and Genji shared funny stories with them as they waited for their parents to arrive. One by one, the children began to leave. If there was any children whose parents didn't come, Eiko and Genji would take them home themselves. When a fancy car pulled up near the entrance, all the remaining children pressed their cute, chubby faces against the window trying to see whose parents were this rich. Eiko didn't recognize the car, and from Genji's facial expression, it appeared that he didn't either. That's my parents. Everyone turned around to the source of the voice, Shinsu Itoshi, the least person they expected to secretly be a rich boy. They agreed to drive Izuku and Minami home. Is that okay? Of course. Stay dry, okay. See you guys next week. The three adorable children smiled and waved at Eiko before bringing out their umbrellas and stepping out into the rain. By the time all the children had left, the rain had died down to a drizzle. An umbrella wasn't even necessary, but Eiko used it anyway because why not? It was like what Aizawa loved to say, if you can sit, then don't stand. If you can lie down, then don't sit. If she could stay dry, then why should she get wet? Even slightly so. No karaoke today. Genji shook his head as he locked up the classroom. Nah, I have a high school reunion dinner at 6. I'd rather not attend looking like I'd just been assaulted over and over again by a giant 10-feet monster. Plus, the class president is paying so I'd rather spare my appetite and take good advantage of that. My wallet is borderline underweight now and it needs immediate medical attention. He chuckled dryly. Eiko snickered. Wanna be my sugar baby then? Only if you don't tell your sugar daddy. Genji winked. Eiko faked a disgusted face and hit him lightly. You wish. Genji broke out into laughter. And Eiko also cracked a smile. 
They parted ways at entrance, each going their separate ways. The way back home always felt a little lonely, even during the days when the sun was shining casting a warm glow over her. The rain didn't make the loneliness go away, but instead made it a lot worse. With the umbrella tilted down to cover her face, Aiko trained her gaze at the ground to make sure she didn't accidentally step into any puddles or slip and embarrass herself. Plop, plop, small drops of water hit the puddles, swishing, swashing, and then, as if her body had just sunk into a tub of ice water in the middle of a blizzard, Aiko froze. Goosebumps danced across every inch of her exposed skin and she couldn't hold back a violent shook that rocked her body. She cranked her neck, the movement strangely sluggish and difficult. Fear gripped her chest as her body turned with the motion. Her eyes dilated, afraid of what she was about to witness. Would it be a serial killer raising a knife high in the air ready to stab her a thousand times? Or maybe the gaping mouth of a monstrous villain ready to swallow her whole? Slack-jawed and ready to scream any moment now, Aiko took in the scene. No one was there. Was it just my imagination? Nothing revealed signs of another presence in the street with her. But as she walked, the horrible feeling followed her all the way to the train station. It wasn't until she got on the train when the feeling disappeared. Even when she was pressing tightly against the other passengers around her as the train sped through the underground tunnel, Aiko continued shivering to the lingering sensation of being watched. Pulled sweat clinging to her back, she whispered quietly to herself, It's okay, nothing will go wrong. Everything's going to be fine. Eventually she was lucky enough to find an empty seat. After sitting down and relaxing for a few stops, the chill gradually dissipated. Nothing was out of the ordinary as she approached her house. I'm back, she announced as she entered. A movie's opening sequence was playing in the living room when she passed, with three cans of unopened soda sitting on the table. Tenki, Tenko, L over here, honey, came her husband's strained voice. Fear twisting her guts, Eiko rushed towards the source. Are you okay? Oh, the scene was a nightmare. Her husband, Tenki and her son, Tenko, were sprawled out across the kitchen tiles holding their heads down in fear. Shard popcorn filled every inch of every square tiles on the floor as if her husband's quirk had gone haywire again, just with popcorns instead of rain. The microwave was busted open with charred hinges and the smell of something burned reached her nose. Aiko saw red and raw anger burned inside her chest. Her husband cringed, readying himself for the storm to appear. T-E-N-K-I. T-E-N-K-O. Tenki stood up lightning fast and gave an army stance, hands flat against his trouser seams while Tenko hid behind his father, eyeing Eiko fearfully. Why yes ma'am, explain, right now. It's not Papa's fault, Tenko whispered, refusing to meet Eiko's eyes. I'm the one who caused that. Tenko's soft, sugary voice immediately melted her heart. All her anger vanished and Eiko crossed her arms, sighing. Tenko, you should know better to be careful with popcorn. This isn't the first time this happened. Do you how long it'll take me to clean up this mess? Sorry, Aiko just couldn't stay man when faced with those adorable puppy eyes. Children, they truly were the spawn of Satan. Wait, wouldn't that make her the... And Tenki, I told you to look after him. Why didn't you do your job properly? She ignored Tenki's AB but I tried. And walked over to Tenko, crouching down and patting him on the head, running her fingers through his soft, light blue locks. Tenko stared up at her cautiously. The avoidance in his gestures gave her heart a squeeze. It pained her to see him so distanced with her. She had never raised her voice at him, not even when she got mad at him. Never once did she lay her hands on him. When she scolded him, she always did so when her anger had gone away so she could have a clear and focused mind and wouldn't accidentally say things she didn't mean. So what was the cause? Was it because the way she acted towards Tenki scared him? And he feared she would one day do the same to him. If only he could tell her, she would fix herself. She hated seeing her family like this, a perfect image with cracks forming in the background. Tenko, is everything all right? Tenko nodded. You know you can tell me anything, right? Tenko nodded once more. I'm fine, mom. He managed a small smile, seeing him reluctant to say more. Eiko merely smiled and gave him a comforting squeeze on his shoulders before standing up. She knew what pressuring children to spill their real thoughts could lead to. So the best course of action in this situation was to stop pushing and wait for them take the step themselves. Now, you two clean up this mess while I go take a shower. Tenki, the kitchen better be immaculate by the time I'm done. And Tenko, please don't eat the popcorn off of the floor. Tenko stopped with a charred popcorn midway to his open mouth. He frowned and pushed it a bit further into his mouth, testing the limits. No, Tenko, a no is a no. The popcorn dropped onto the ground as Tenko pouted, his big red eyes expressing the complaints he refused to put into words. Eiko had to force herself to look away from those adorable eyes and walk upstairs. As she walked, she heard Tenki whisper, Hey, hey Tenko, you can eat it now I won't tell mom. And then came the sound of chewing and a gleeful humming. Sighing, Eiko pushed open the door to the master bedroom she shared with her husband. She dropped her backpack on the drawer and took out her phone. There was a dozen more texts in the group chat from Aizawa and Hizashi. 
Apparently, they'd passed the written exam with flying colors and were now waiting for the practical portion. Eiko sent a quick thumbs up before placing the phone on her bed. Gathering a change of clothes, Eiko stepped into the bathroom. She laid down the clothes then turned on the water. Hot, steaming liquid flowed into the tub. The water was crystal clear, translucent enough for Eiko to see the bottom of the tub. After removing her makeup and wedding ring, she started undressing, humming a song to herself as she did so. The sound of the stream of water roaring out of the faucet and slapping against the water bank continued resonating in the small enclosed space. Eiko washed her body as she waited then turned off the faucet when the tub was full. She then felt the water, testing its temperature, before stepping in and immersing herself into the heavenly sensation. Ah, uh, she let out a content sigh and leaned back. Her head hit the soft cushion she placed on the back of the tub. It was so relaxing she could even fall asleep right here, right now. The water was no longer transparent and now had a green tint to it. Had it always been like that? Aiko couldn't remember. That didn't matter right now. But somehow it caught her attention. She kept staring into the water. Had it just gotten greener or was it just her imagination? She was pretty sure it was just a light green a while ago, but now it was forest green. Then she felt a slimy substance entangling her legs, and what appeared to be an eyeball swimming around in the substance. And she screamed. She jumped out of the tub and threw a towel around her body as she kicked the door open and ran right into Tenki's broad chest. Eiko, Eiko what's wrong? Eiko had never heard him sound so concerned. T.T. there was s someone. Inside. T. the W.W. water. She cried, broken words trickling out of her trembling lips. Her wide eyes darted around frantically and caught sight of a frightened Tenko hiding behind the staircase. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Tenki's voice was strong and steady, as if nothing could break through its walls. He patted her on the back before telling her to stay outside the bathroom. Then he stepped inside, a kitchen knife in his hand as he approached the tub. Eiko watched with dread as Tenki placed a hand in the water and splashed it around. Every motion he made had her imagining hundreds of possible danger lurking in the corners. After a minute, Tenki turned around, the hand holding the knife dropping to his side. I don't see anything. Are you sure? The water rose into a wall of green slime behind Tenki. Two large eyeballs swam around and a wide, open mouth grin split across underneath the eyes. You saw something. Everything happened so fast. Eiko and Tenko could only let out a terrified wail before the slime smothered Tenki. The knife clattered onto the ground. Eiko and Tenko stood scarily still as the slime completely submerged a struggling Tenki and tried to stuff itself into his mouth and nostrils. Eiko was the first to recover from the shock. Tenki, gug. Tenki clawed at the slime in vain. His fingers sank into the substance not being able to grab a hold of it. His face was starting to turn purple from the lack of oxygen in his eyes. Wide and fearful, glanced at Eiko. Get away from him. Eiko charged towards the villain and threw a power punch into Tenki's gut, punching the air out of his lungs. Some of the slime was coughed out but they immediately went back inside. You little bitch. You get the fuck away. The villain hollered as a slimy appendage shot out slamming into Eiko, sending her flying into the door of her room head first. Mom. Eiko barely registered Tenko's voice on her position on the ground. The towel had flown off of her naked body but that was none of her concerns at the moment. The safety of her family came first. She forced herself onto her knees as the sound of tiny footsteps ran towards her. Tenko dropped down next to her and he placed a small, soft, warm chubby hand on her bleeding forehead. There were tears in his eyes as he pleaded, Mom, please don't die. Mom, Eiko forced a smile onto her face. Don't worry, Tenko dear. Mom is fine. She wiped off the blood with the back of her hand and stood up shakily, using the wall as support. The door had broken off the hinges from the force and the object on her bed was in full display. Her head spun and her vision wavered from the injury. She couldn't walk straight and the blood flowing into her eyes really wasn't helping. She wiped it again. Now, what's this? Let's see let's see. Came the villain's voice. Eiko barely made out Tenki's slumped form when she stepped out of her room. The villain had almost completely overtaken her husband's body. His body was enclosed in the substance with only his head showing. The lower half of his face was now a grotesquely oversized mouth. The carbon copy of its original on the villain's body. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Let's try it out shall we? The fusion form raised their hand and a lightning bolt came striking down the roof and shooting through the floor. The lightning bolt almost hit her if not for her legs giving up on her. Casting a shaky glance down the hole, Eiko could see another hole in the carpet in front of the TV in the first floor living room. Weather, is it? Very powerful. Amazing quirk. This is the perfect host. The monster made her husband raise his hand again. And this time, hailstones, lightning, thunderstorm rained down from the sky like meteors, hitting their house with perfect precision. Screams filled the house along with the maniacal jeering of the monster. A piece of the flooring crumbled as each stone and bolts hit the ground. They were running out of space to dodge. Eiko lost track of Tenko during the devastation. 
When she saw him again, her heart leapt to her throat. Tenko, no. Her boy, her precious little boy, was rushing towards the gigantic creature blocking the bathroom with a battle cry while he barely held onto the fallen kitchen knife. You think that can harm me? Bae, you think you can cause me injury? Aiko moved to drag her boy back, but she was too late. The same slimy appendage that sent her flying crashed into Tenko's small, frail body, wrapping around his midsection and flinging him out of the bathroom window. On the second fucking floor, T-E-N-K-O, a raw, blood-curdling scream cracked the air like a whip. For a split second, Tenki cracked an eye open, just in time to see Tenko's body shattering the window. Somehow, he managed to move his body despite the slime coating his form. He shot forward and grabbed onto Tenko, who was hanging outside the window. Hold on to me, he shouted. Aiko couldn't see what was going on, but as soon as he said that, he fell backward clutching onto his bleeding, missing hand. Then there was a sickening crack outside. Aiko paled. Is that? Tenko. The thought brought bile to her mouth. What a pity. I gave you control momentarily but you still couldn't save your kid. What a pity. The slime uttered. Each word was like an invisible hand grabbing and twisting her guts in the most painful way possible. Tenki slumped over. This time, he didn't move. The villain controlled his body to pick up the fallen knife. It looked at the weapon, then a twisted smile ghosted over its lips. I don't need you, so die. The villain began striking her continuously with the knife. Aiko had taken some martial art classes but still could barely keep up with the speed. Her headache was getting worse and her vision kept swimming, knocking her sideways. It only took one foot misplacement for the villain to cower over her with the knife raising high above her, prepared to die. Beautiful. It stared down at her naked body with a wanton grin, the large, gaping slit it called mouth extremely disturbing in the form of a smile. But before it could make its move, for a split moment, light returned to its eyes. Tenki spat, I won't let you. Touch my wife. And he slashed the knife across his throat. Aiko froze, not yet registering what had just happened. The slime's disgusting round eyes glanced down at Tenki's stilled body. Then they glazed over, as if distracted by something. And it slowly began seeping out of his mouth and nostrils. Leaving a quiet curse, it slid past a frozen Aiko and down the stairs. When the slimy squishy sound finally vanished, Aiko snapped out of her stupor and finally took in the scene. T. Tenki. She crawled towards his body and placed a hand on his chest. It wasn't rising. She pressed two fingers against his neck. It was faint, but there was still a pulse. She stared into his eyes. He stared back. You'll be fine, Tenki. I won't let you die. She cradled his face with all five fingers and activated her quirk. The spot where his hand was missing began sprouting bones and flesh. One of her hands cradling his face began disintegrating bits by bits. The wound on his neck slowly sewed together leaving no scar. On her neck a giant slash ripped open her skin, allowing blood to gush out. Tenki gasped and his eyes snapped open while Aiko slumped over him. He rubbed his neck with his newly grown hand, dazed, then noticed her. Aiko, Aiko, wake up. His frantic voice was growing faint. Did you, oh my god, why do you? She felt her energy leaking out along with the blood. With the last bit of strength, she uttered, as safe. Tenko, be a G good dad. No, Aiko, make us sure. He eats properly. And, she coughed out blood, darkness chewing away the edge of her vision. D don't let him. P play games. Too late. S S sleep. Early. Aiko. Tears fell onto her face. Were they tankies? Anne. Don eat. Shard P popcorns. Off of the G ground. Don't M make M. E by M. No. Tanky's voice was growing faint. They echoed in the space around her, as if she was submerged in water. I am sorry. I couldn't keep O.R. promise. Tenki's hand shook as he grabbed her hand, squeezing it as if he was trying to provide comfort. I, I love you too. A.I.K.O. And she let out her last breath. The house was deadly silent when he entered. He carefully closed the door behind him and stepped inside, his well-polished shoes clacking against the ground rhythmically like the requiem of death. As he approached the living room, his pawn slid down the stairs. The sludge caught sight of him and quivered, causing a wave-like pattern to spread across its liquid surface. Yes sir, why you're early? The pathetic thing stuttered. I only am managed to kill too, but if you give me more time I promise. No need. The man raised a hand effectively shutting it up. A scream came from upstairs. I'll take care of the last. He began making his way up the stairs. The slimy thing got out of his way by rolling over the railing and landing soundlessly. The first thing he saw when he made it to the second floor was the slumped form of a man weeping over a dead, naked woman. Pathetic. He couldn't understand why anyone would bother crying over the death of someone. Death was inevitable. It was just another stage of life. It was common sense. They should have prepared themselves for separation when they fell in love. Not to mention a dead body was no longer a human. It was just a stack of decaying flesh that served as food for the insects and animals. Why would humans cry over things like this remained a mystery to him. The weeping man turned around when he heard the footsteps. His face was a disgusting mess of tears and snot. 
The weeping man was instantly on guard upon sight of his overwhelming stature, turning around fully and shielding the decaying corpse with his own body. W who are you? What do you want from us? Us? The word was chewed and savored slowly in his mouth. I don't see us. You're the only alive human being I see here. It should be me, not us. I don't fucking care. The pathetic man scrambled to grab a hold of a kitchen knife and pointed at him defensively, as if a mere knife could hurt him. Did you cause this? Tell me. And what if I did? What are you doing to do? The man's eyes widened almost comically. Then rage burned in those eyes, his lips curling into a sneer. I'm gonna kill your ass. He threw the knife towards him and raised his hand. Thunder clapped in the sky as lightning bolts began raining down the sky at an alarming speed. Well, I suppose this would be considered self-defense. In the next instant, what remained of the house collapsed, crushing anyone who wasn't preparing the annihilation into a grisly death. The front door that was barely rooted to the ground swung open and the suited man walked out with grace and poise unfitting of such a sight. After the sludge also squeezed out of the narrow doorway, he gently clicked the door shut. So, um, sir, about my pay. Go ask my assistants. When Tenko crashed through the window, he honestly thought he was about to die. And so he didn't stop to think when his papa grabbed his arm and shouted at him to grab back. The danger of this situation grabbed the logical side of his brain and completely threw it out of the window. And so, he grabbed his papa's wrist with all five fingers. And so, his papa's wrist disintegrated, causing his hand, and Tenko, to drop from a two-story high window. Tenko remembered landing on his side, a loud crack telling him his arm, and most likely some of his fragile ribs, were broken. The pain that wrecked his body knocked the wind out of him. He opened his mouth wanting to scream but no sound came out, sitting against the wall in the alley behind his house. Tenko clutched his arm in pain as he pleaded someone, anyone, to save him. He was in so much pain, and his parents, oh god his mom's head was bleeding, so, so much blood, and his papa was overtaken by that monster in his hand. Tenko saw the fallen hand next to him and snatched it, clutching it to his chest and reveling in its remaining heat. Would Papa be mad at him? He promised to never use his quirk ever again after he accidentally killed their pet parrot Tenko. Would he be disappointed? How was Papa going to live on without a hand? Was he still alive? Was anyone going to help him? Some people walking past the alley spared him a glance and gasped. No one approached him. They all stood at a safe distance and either walked away or called the ambulance. No one came up to help him. P. Please, help me. His voice cracked. Some of the people stared at him sympathetically. Some replied, I'm sorry but I can't do anything. The heroes will come. Heroes will save you. So hang in there, okay. But no one helped him. Tenko didn't understand. Why was no one helping him? Why were people just looking at him? Staring at him with those pitiful eyes and snapping pictures of him and apologizing, but refusing to help him. It hurt. His body hurt so much, and he wanted to cry, to scream, to scream all his anguish and pain away. Click, click. Tenko looked up when he heard a rhythmic sound. The crowd began to disperse and a stranger, a tall, very tall man dressed in a fancy suit walked up to him. Each step he took seemed to echo in the space around them, although there were still people around them, although other people were walking, too. Strangely enough, Tenko only heard his footsteps echoing in his ears. They were confident, strong, and steady strides. Just hearing the beats made him feel safe, like nothing could ever touch him again. The man stopped a few feet away and said, No one came to save you. You must be in a lot of pain, Shimura Tenko. Heroes will come. Heroes will save you. Everyone says that and no one comes to help you. Whose fault is it that society ended up this way? You did nothing wrong. And you will be fine because I am here. The man's words were strong yet soft. His presence was oppressive yet comforting. And Tenko allowed himself to be taken into the man's strong arms and towards a safe haven. It was near 90 degrees and Shouta questioned yet again why he had put himself through the torture that was kneeling on the scorching ground for over five minutes already while being barbecued by the glaring sun. Miawa. And just like that, all his self-doubt disappeared. No matter how much he was sweating or how uncomfortable the way his suit was clinging to his body, as long as Shouta was in the company of cats, that was all it mattered. With an indifferent face, Shouta wiggled the crested dog's tail hoping the adorable cat would fall for it. Come on, just a little closer. The cat followed the plant's every movement. Slowly but surely, it began coming closer. Yes, come on. Shouta had a hand out ready to pet the cat when he heard a rustle behind him. Before he could stop the idiot, Hazashi jumped out of the bushes. E-O-O-O. The cat screeched, all its hair sticking out like a Pomeranian. Then it dashed away. He is a sh- E-K. Seeing his best friend slowly backing away from him as if he was his worst nightmare brought a sense of satisfaction within him. Sorry, I didn't mean it. As Ashi clapped his hands together and bowed his head, his expression truly remorseful. Shout aside, he dropped the dog's tail and stood up, swaying slightly when the extent of the heat finally hit him. Shouta, you okay? As Ashi rushed to support him, 
I'm fine. Shouta pushed him away gently and started dragging himself towards the auditorium. The moment he pushed open the door, cold air brushed past him ruffling his hair and he let out a content sigh. That's why I told you not to go outside in this heat. What if you passed out? You would have failed the examination. You would have woken me up with your scream before they would fail me. Uh, fine, you win. The auditorium was filled with applicants applying for the teaching positions. UA rarely, if ever, fire its teachers because they were all picked after careful consideration. So it was also extremely rare for it to have a spot open. Hence why so many people came all the way here in this blazing heat just to have a chance at it. Shouta and Hizashi sat down against the wall with two applicants next to them. Together they formed Group C. The written exam was already over and now was time for the practical portion. And then came the interview. It was common knowledge that most people were eliminated during the practical portion. Apparently, they would be given some type of scenario and they would either pass or fail according to the actions they took. The scenarios differed for each group so no one could cheat. Group B had already entered the examination room, which was soundproof for obvious reasons. Very soon it'd be their turn. Do you think ectoplasm would be one of the examiners? Hizashi nudged him slightly. I don't know. I didn't think about it. Well, think about it then. It doesn't matter. It's not like we'll get an easy way in if we knew one of the examiners. UA isn't that type of school. And ectoplasm isn't that type of person. You're right. Both of their phones buzzed at the same time with a new message alert. Shouta took out his phone with a lazy glance. And instantly tensed up and widened his eyes when he saw the content. A Coco, help. Bicklane Aftak me Hauser. Shit. As Ashi cursed. What should we do? Shouta didn't speak. He continued staring at the words, letting it sink into his head, rereading it as if that would change what it said. Shouta, Shouta exited the app and dialed Shimura Eiko's phone number. Once, twice, she didn't pick up. It says she's in a call right now. Call her again, then. Shouta waited, then called her again. In a span of five minutes, he had called her over ten times, but she's still in a call. His ashy jumped, hands waving around frantically. We gotta do something. What if she's hurt? Or worse, what if she's dead? Shouta clicked his tongue, rubbing the bridge of his nose with a frustrated sigh. He glanced at his phone again and, after a moment of contemplation, shoved it in his pockets. I'm going to check on her. You stay here. What? No, I'm going with you. There's no point in both of us failing together, idiot. I thought it's your dream to be a teacher at UA. But there's no point being a teacher at UA if you're not doing it with me. Hizashi huffed, crossing his arms and glaring defiantly at Shouta. Shouta face palmed. Fine, then. Your choice. The duo ran out of the auditorium, gathering many curious glances as they passed by. The humidity hit them the instant they left the building. Heat filled their lungs with every breath they took. You got the address. Yeah, I have it saved up in my foe. Where are you two going? A voice halted both in their tracks. They turned, stupefied, as an old man walked towards them from behind the building while carrying a can of coffee. I asked you a question. The old man repeated, where are you going? We, we are going to check up on a friend. Yeah, as Ashi declared. The old man didn't look convinced, so Shouta stepped forward. My friend is in danger and I can't just sit here doing nothing and knowing she could be dying right now. What about the examination? If you leave right now, you'll fail. You do know that, right? Yes, but I'd rather fail the exam and save my friend's life than pass it and have to bear the guilt for the rest of my life. With that said, Shouta turned tail and ran out of the campus with his ashy closely at his heels. Not knowing this conversation would mark the turning point of their lives. Medical and the law enforcement were already there by the time Shouta and Hizashi arrived. Due to their status as pro-heroes, they quickly got a brief overview of the situation. Two dead and one missing. Villain attack was probably due to revenge. Or some other personal reasons, since no jewelry or money had been taken from the house. Other than the obvious evidence of a fight, the house remained untouched. Shouta had to look away when Eiko's covered body was placed into a black bag. To see someone, especially a friend he had known for over two years, who was so alive and well earlier this week turn into a cold, dead body in just a few days was like a nightmare. No, it was even worse than a nightmare. Shouta never imagined a civilian teacher like Eiko would be attacked and murdered by a villain. Unlike heroes who had tons of enemies and the likelihood of one of them holding a grudge was incredibly high. It was almost impossible for a kind-hearted person, not to mention a youth teacher, like her to do something that would piss off a villain to the point of murdering her entire family except, wait, any lead on the kid. Shouta pulled an officer aside who had just finished questioning a witness. The villain must have a reason to kidnap him, and only him. I assume they won't kill him before they get what they wanted. There must be something, some connection, that the villain has with the Shimuras. I thought so too. The officer with the head of a cat agreed. Shouta glanced at his name tag, which read Officer Tamakawa. From what we can gather at the moment, the Shimuras is a pretty peaceful household. The neighbors all have good impressions of them. 
They never had any enemies or confrontations with anyone that can result to this. They have no living relatives so the suspect isn't some vengeful family member either. Of course, a more detailed investigation might prove me wrong. But with the information we have now, the suspect is more likely to be someone from work that they've interacted with. By the way, don't you work at YHP too? I volunteer there from time to time, to help supervising the kids and sometimes giving classes. As Ashi, too, goes there often, Shouta nodded his head towards the blonde hero, who was staring sullenly at the body bags. Is there anyone there who you think could be a suspect? Officer Tamakawa flipped his notebook to a new page, pen ready to take notes. No. Okay. Shouta inwardly cringed when the conversation was cut off so abruptly. His bluntness had brought him many embarrassing awkward moments in the past and even after he became a pro hero, it still followed him everywhere he went like an annoying mosquito. He thought about adding more to his answer. But before he could, the officer continued. Now, one last question, Eraserhead. Where have you been and what have you been doing for the past two hours? Thirty minutes later, Shout arrived at UA in a police car along with his Ashi. The examination had already ended. A few people in the auditorium were putting away the chairs while being yelled at by the old man from earlier. After Shout pointed him out, the officer went straight to the old man. Mister, may I have a moment? The old man who was yelling at a young lad turned around with a grumpy look. He glanced at the name tag then gave a dry chuckle. Officer Tamakawa, eh? Never seen you around. I assume you're new. Yes, you can say that. Ha, huh? good, good. The old man turned to the young lad and yelled. Just put the broken ones aside and deal with them later. Why yes sir. HMPH. The old man then plopped onto the ground and patted the wooden floor. Come on, sit. No need to be so uptight. No, mister, I can't. Yes, you can. A man should never say no. Now, now, you wouldn't want an old man to stand during questioning would you? Officer Tamakawa appeared to be conflicted. Shouta could relate to him so well. He remembered coming across similar situations when he first began his days as a pro hero. There are so many rules on the dos and don'ts. And as always, when there are rules, there would also be loopholes. And these loopholes were what threw him into a dilemma every single goddamn time. In the end, he had learned to not give a fuck no more and just do what felt right to him. To hell with the hero rulebook and customs and courtesies. And that was exactly what the officer did. He threw away all his etiquette and situated himself across the old man, crossing his legs and looking a bit stiff in his postures, while Shouta and his ashy followed suit. The questioning only lasted a few minutes at most. The old man, whose name turned out to be Gran Torino, didn't ask what warranted the interview but instead answered all the questions skillfully with precise statements that left no place for further questioning. Shouta and his ashi were quickly cleared off of the suspect list. He doubted Officer Tamakawa even suspected them in the first place. He probably went through the process just because it was part of the procedures. And if this case ever went to court, he would have the necessary information to back himself up. After all, lawyers were nasty beings who would poke into every hole they found. A case could be completely overturned by one tiny loophole in the investigation and that was how many infamous murder case suspects were able to get away scot-free. When the officer left, Shouta went up to the old man and thanked him. Gran Torino simply waved it off like it was nothing. No need to waste your breath on this. I don't need thanks. If you really want to thank me, then stop wasting my time and get on with it. Right? Shouta nodded and began heading out with his ashy. Where are you doing? Shouta stopped in his tracks, causing Hizashi to bump into his back with a yelp. We're going back home. Hizashi groaned, rubbing his reddened nose in pain. Yeah, I mean, we already failed the exam so there's no point staying here further. Who said you failed? Huh? Shouta blinked. Even Hizashi stopped moaning in pain. You two have good judgment. You know what your priority is. And that's an important trait we need our teachers to have, because they need to know how to react under dire situations and make the right choice in the split of a second. You're putting your friend's life before the UA exam shows you have what it takes to pass the practical portion. So, Gran Torino paused on purpose, his eyes glinting mischievously. Shouta and Hizashi both held their breath. Congratulation. You've passed. Y-H-H-H. The entire building rumbled. Ground shook and windows shattered causing glass pieces to rain upon the unlucky ones nearby. Chairs sprinted across the auditorium as if they had grown a mind of their own. The lights flickered rapidly before going out altogether. When the earthquake finally stopped, the terrified occupants raised their heads cautiously, unsure if the threat was really gone. Being the closest to Hizashi, Shouta and Gran Torino received the worst of the blow. Shouta was already used to it, but the tremor still left him frozen, rooted to the ground. The old man, on the other hand, appeared to be paralyzed by the shock. His eyes had rolled back and his mouth was opened as a line of drool dripped down from the corner of his lips. When Shouta tapped his shoulder just to make sure he was still alive, Gran Torino fell back stiffly like a statue and landed heavily on the ground. Gran T-O-R-I-N-O-O-S-A-N-N-N. The old man cracked open an eye, 
glaring at his ashy while tripping over his words, I I, I may be rethinking my decision. In the end, Shouda and Hizashi had to clean up the mess all by themselves before they were allowed into the interview room. Albeit they passed with flying colors, Gran Torino didn't let them leave until he made sure Hizashi was repenting and reflecting on his actions. By the time they arrived at their shared apartment, it was already 10 o'clock at night. Both were utterly exhausted that they immediately passed out on the bed. But one question lingered on their mind. How the hell were they going to explain this to the kids at YHP? All Might had just saved a kid from committing suicide when he received a call from Chief Inspector Tsurigami. The moment he heard that single, dreaded name, he vanished from the top of the rooftop. The kid's excited scream could be heard from miles away as he leapt from rooftop to rooftop, rushing towards the police station. He made a beeline towards the Chief Inspector's office when he arrived. Tsurigami was rummaging through some paperwork in his drawer with his beagle head down. He shouldn't be able to see All Might, but he apparently did as he said, You're finally here, woof. I've been waiting. All Might sat himself down on the rolling chair next to the desk, his weight causing the chair to squeak in pain. You said you might have a lead to all for one. Yes, look, Surigami placed a document in front of All Might. Murder. Out of the three victims, two were killed while one was kidnapped. Shimura Tenko. S-H-I-M-U-R-A. And here's more, woof. All Might had to suppress his shock as he continued reading. Evidence of DNA in the trachea. Possibly left by the attacker. DNA profiling. I I is that. Only one suspect turned up from DNA profiling. Surigami angled the monitor so All Might could see what was on the screen. The picture of a disgusting, slimy creature was pasted under a name. It appeared as though the picture was taken with a phone, seeing as how it was a blurred photo of the creature sliding past the photographer. The gang we took down last month revealed their informant to be a green, slime-like creature, woof. They said he was their only means of contacting all for one. And with the victims of this murder case being the Shimura family along with his involvement, Woof, there's a high possibility that All For One has something to do with this. All For One, that bastard. All Might crushed the documents he was holding as an intense aura radiated off of his person. Killing my master isn't enough. And now he has to come and destroy her only remaining family. Calm down, All Might. Getting worked up over it now won't be of any help. You're right. All Might squeezed his eyes shut, frowning as he took a deep breath. I'm sorry, you're good. Right now we need to focus on finding this suspect, Woof. He can lead us to Shimura Tenko, and, ultimately, all for one himself. And one last thing, Surigami pushed a sketch across the table. This is a sketch of the man who was last seen interacting with Shimura Tenko, according to a witness report, woof. We suspect him to be all for one, but seeing you're the only one who has ever caught a glimpse of him, we want you to confirm whether or not. It's him, All Might murmured, his eyes trained on the image. From the build to the suit to the face to the hair, there was no mistake. This is the man who killed my master. Great, that'll make things easier, then. We'll focus on tracking down these two villains. And hopefully we can find them before anything happens to the boy, woof. Who knows what they want with him. All Might left the station with more questions than he had before. The main issue he had was, what did all for one want with Shimura Nana's grandson? Whatever it is, I'll stop you before you can taint him with your filthy hands. All Might vowed with silent fervor. I will stop you this time, all for one. It was a promise to all for one to his master, to Shimura Tenko, but moreover, it was to himself. Due to the fact that the most wanted criminal in Japan was possibly involved in this case, the chief of the police threw all the available man hand into the investigations and all other cases were put on a hold. Efficiency sure skyrocketed when everyone was focusing on a single task, especially when said task was personally assigned to them by the superintendent himself. In less than a week of time, they had gotten a possible location of the sludge's hideout. All the evidence pointed at a run-down house near the edge of the city surrounded by abandoned factories. There were reporting of suspicious gooey noises and a blob of moving shadow in the back alley near a convenience store a mile away. The task force had then investigated every suspicious location, including the sewer, and ultimately found their way to the house. Units were dispatched to nearby observation locations to keep an eye on the hideout 24-7. While taking shifts of course, the planned attack was scheduled to be 6 p.m. sharp, which was the time reported for the suspicious sighting. They couldn't engage the sludge while the possibility of the kidnapped boy was kept in the house remained. The boy could be used as a hostage, or worse, be injured from friendly fire. So their best bet was to have a team watching the convenience store for any suspicious movements while another raid the house. Most of the manpower stayed with the team that would raid the house, including the number one hero, All Might, and a few other pro heroes. Most officers weren't disclosed of the relationship between All Might and the Shimura family. Only Chief Inspector Tsurigami knew the significance of saving Shimura Tenko personally to All Might. They still have yet to find any traces of All for One's activities. But they believed that if they were to save Shimura Tenko, the man would definitely show himself. 
If that didn't work, maybe they could get something out of the sludge when they caught him. Crouched on the rooftop alongside a police unit, Shouda had his goggles lifted over his head to act as a hairpin as he swiped through the photos in his phone taken during his time at YHP. Aiko was in almost every single one of them, smiling warmly, laughing with the children, eyes crinkling in mirth, arms around an uncomfortable Shouda and a cheerful Genji. She had always been the sun in YHP, casting warmth to everyone she interacted with and pulling them together by the strings of their hearts. And now that she was gone, it was as if something was missing. Her absence was like a hole in his chest, reminding him constantly that something was amiss, but it would all be over soon. She could rest in peace because today would be the day her death would be avenged. All unit status check, the commanding officer of this operation ordered through the radios. As the units all rogered in precedence, Shouda cast one last look at the photos before stuffing his phone in his pocket and pulling his goggles over his eyes. When it was their turn, an officer beside him murmured, Control West Window, everything code 4. And with that, Operation Avengers began. The dim television screen was the only source of light in the room. Light bulbs had ran out of battery a long time ago, and the owner of the house didn't bother to fix it. It had been a while since the owner returned. The only occupant was the boy currently tapping the video game controller rapidly without the use of his pinkies. His dull, empty eyes were staring at the flickering TV screen unblinking, not reacting even as he set off a massive explosion wiping out a quarter of the characters in the market. Terrified screams of fictional characters echoed around him but the boy didn't even flinch as he took down the guards. One after another, that tried to come after the protagonist. With the aid of the darkness, the sludge poked his head out of the drain and peeked from inside the sink, taking note that it had been ten hours since the boy last drank a drop of water. He knew Sir wouldn't be happy with this information. Not because he was worried of the boy's health, but rather he needed the boy alive. The sludge couldn't care less if the boy died, but he needed the boy alive to get his money. Because he had failed to eradicate all the members of that family last time before Sir arrived. His pay was pushed back until after he completed the next task. The thought of that pissed him off. Not just the pay. Well, he did want his money. But rather the way Sir's assistants acted pissed him off. All the money matter was handled by those two assistants. Even his pay. Sir didn't say anything about docking his paycheck or pushing it back. But when he asked them for the money, they dared to tell him no. And when he complained to Sir about it, Sir didn't do anything and simply let those two arrogant motherfuckers do whatever the fuck they wanted. The sludge would have killed their asses if Sir allowed him or if he knew what they looked like. The only way to contact them was through the VOIP phone in the house and the phone number he was forced to remember. The sludge had tried, and unfortunately, no other phones could reach them. No matter how much he despised those two assistants, he could only keep his anger in check and wait for his paycheck. Once he got his slimy appendage on that money, he'd get the hell away from the boy who forgot how to act like a normal human being and the sir who was never a normal human being to begin with. Not that the sludge was any more normal himself, appearance-wise. The sludge knew Sir wanted to act as the man who saved the boy from the evil villain, which was him, the poor sludge, and so letting the boy catch him wandering around the house was a big no-no. Staying out of sight was incredibly easy, since the boy wouldn't look away from the screen once he started playing the game. No matter what happened, once the sludge tried overflowing the sink and letting the water flood the room, but even when the boy was knees high in the water, he still didn't even bat an eyelid. In the end the sludge had to drain the water slowly out of a hole in the floorboard. It had been almost a week since he was tasked with this babysitting job. All he had to do was endure until this Sunday. Then he'd get his money. For some reason, the assistants only worked on Sundays. Perhaps they'd get more freedom once they worked alongside Sir long enough. The sludge didn't know. Not that it mattered to him since he couldn't stand Sir's overwhelming presence and wasn't planning on staying any longer than necessary. Now he just needed to focus on keeping the boy alive for two more days. The sludge squeezed down the pipe and landed into the sewer, making a splash of the nasty, foul-smelling sewer water as he moved with the water current. The green slime that made up his mutant body blended in perfectly. About a mile ahead was a convenience store. Time to steal some dinner for the boy. It wasn't until the sound of gunshots was no more did Tenko notice the thirst that had been trying to grab his attention for the past few hours. Leaving the controller on the couch, he made his way towards the sink, climbed onto a stool, and poured himself a bottle of water. The only container was an empty Dr. Pepper bottle on the counter. It had been roughly six days since Tenko followed his savior to this house. He had noticed the destruction of his original house as he passed by. Nothing needed to be said. It was obvious his parents were dead. And yet, no heroes came. The man had told him that he would be safe if he stayed here. Everything would be fine, and the sludge that killed mom and dad would be dealt with, so there was nothing to worry about. The man was never around. But even so, he would bring him food three times a day. They were just cheap convenience food, but they were able to sustain Tenko. 
With enough food and water, and the newest and famous game and console, Tenko was having a blast living in this shabby house. True that he missed his parents, but he was even more mad at the people who didn't help him when he was injured. His anger pushed his sorrow to the back of his mind as he unleashed his rage upon the innocent civilians in the game every day. Please don't hurt me. I don't want to die. Watching the civilians cower in fear as he shot past them and seeing them begging for help before he executed them always brought a sense of satisfaction within him. Scum, they would call him. Hope you die in hell, they would say, but none of that fazed him. They'd be dead the next second anyway. The water from the faucet tasted a little weird, but it was enough to soothe his dry mouth. Tenko took a gulp, kept it in his mouth, letting it soak his tongue. His mom had told him that when he was thirsty, the best way to get rid of the thirst quickly wasn't to take big gulps of water, but rather to take a gulp and just hold it there, letting the water moisturize his mouth. Thinking of his mom brought tears to his eyes once again. Tenko willed them away, licking his dry lips as he took the bottle with him towards the couch. The best way to forget about her was to drown himself in the game. As he picked up the controller, getting ready to kill some activists, he heard a noise by the entrance. And the next thing he knew, dozens of armed police officers barged through the door, pointing their weapons at him. Wah! A single sound uttered out of his lips before it was crushed by an officer barking orders. It's the boy. We found the boy. One of them lowered his weapon and ran up to him, looking as if he was about to grab onto Tenko. Tenko shrieked, backing away to the other side of the couch and waving his hand wildly. Get away from me. Don't touch me. Be careful. Another officer yelled. He'll disintegrate you if he touches you. The first officer lowered his hand and glanced at Tenko with a look as if he was a criminal, a dangerous beast, an animal who should be kept in the zoo. That look brought up the anger within him, overriding his sorrow. Tenko got off the couch and hunched slightly, glaring defiantly at the armed officers. Before either side could make a move, a familiar voice spoke up from the corner of the room. What an awful thing to say to a child. Don't you agree, Shimura Tenko? All the eyes in the room landed on his savior who emerged from the shadow. Tenko watched in confusion as terror fell on the faces of the officers the moment they caught sight of him. What were they so afraid of? His savior was the good guy here. Why were they pointing their weapons at him as if he was the villain? Stay back. Don't come any closer. His savior continued walking towards the police while Tenko stood there, unsure of what to do. It's a pleasure meeting you, Shimura Tenko. His savior said as he passed him. You've served your purpose and I don't have use of you no more. Before Tenko could voice his questions, the window behind him exploded as a flash of red, blue, and yellow burst through, enveloping him in a hug before any sharps could harm him and, in the blink of an eye, reappearing outside the shack where dozens of police officers and a couple heroes stood. The number one hero, all freaking might, set him down on the ground with a gentleness uncharacteristic of his statue, patted him on the head with his bright, signature smile, and dashed inside the house moments before an explosion rocked the compound. Be careful. A female officer rushed towards him, trying to grab onto him. Tenko pushed out his hands in reflex, his fingers almost touching her wrist before. He actually touched her wrist, and her skin didn't disintegrate. What in the world was going on here? Thank God you're here, eraser head. The officer let out a sigh of relief as she smiled at a man with floating hair who was boring his red eyes into Tenko. Come on, let's get you out of here. Too confused to argue, Tenko allowed himself to be dragged away and pushed gently into a police car. The last thing he saw was the house going up aflame as two contrasting individuals went up against each other in a heated exchange of attacks before the view disappeared over the horizon as the police car drove away. As he sat next to the hero named Eraserhead while clenching his father in his pocket, one thought stood out in his mind above all others. He forgot to save the game. Mom, how much longer? Inko replied without turning around. Just a few more minutes. Hurry up mom. I don't want to be late. It'd leave a bad impression for Toshi's parents. Izuku exclaimed as he bounced up and down on the couch, occasionally jumping from one couch to another. Normally he wasn't this hyperactive. Today was just a special occasion. I'm sure Kaioken-san and Haka-san already have a good impression of you. After all, you've known Hitoshi-kun for over two years already. Inko turned off the stove and flipped the pancake onto a plate. She then proceeded to cut the pancake into the shape of a cat's face. Izu-chan, I know Hitoshi-kun likes cats, but are you sure he likes sweets as well? Yeah, I'm sure. He asks me for candies every day. That last part was not completely true. What Izuku didn't tell her was that Shinsu, along with everyone else at YHP and elementary school, treated Izuku as a candy vendor. For one, he had unlimited number of candies of all types and brands. And secondly, he would sell them for half the price on the market, or he'd give them out for free in return for a favor. For those who didn't like candies, Izuku had other treats like chocolates, soda, and even those cans of coffee that adults banned them from due to their young age. Everyone was already very familiar with Izuku and his magic backpack that contained every treat they could ever imagine. No one would be surprised if Izuku magically pulled out a frozen ice cream on a hot, sunny day. 
Of course, it wasn't actual magic that helped him pull his tricks, it was digitalization. After two years of stocking up reputation points, Izuku had thousands saved up with no place to spend. He had used up 3,000 rep points to exchange a gadget for Yuuga over half a year ago and didn't give it to him until his birthday around two months ago. Izuku had mailed the package to his friend anonymously with the help of Gola not because he wanted to play mysterious, but rather because it'd be troublesome if words got out and he was questioned the source of the gadget. So far Inko was the only person Izuku had spilled his secret to because he knew he could trust her. Digitalization was too powerful of an ability to share with just anyone. Not only could you commit theft, smuggling, and many similar crimes with the inventory, you could also buy dangerous items like Death Note that could kill anyone whose name was written in it and Cataclysm that could destroy this planet. Just imagine the chaos that would ensue if this got into the wrong hand. Maybe digitalization couldn't be transferred to another person. But that didn't mean others would stop trying. Izuku could very well end up having his head plastered on a wanted poster in the black market with hundreds of criminals on his tail, not to mention mad scientists and quirk specialists who would want to dissect and experiment on him to see the extent of this power. If Izuku wanted to live a normal life, revealing digitalization to others would be the stupidest thing he could ever do. Pulling sweets out of his bag could be seen as a magic trick. Suddenly having a quirk could make him a late boomer. But for a quirkless eight-year-old to have a hero gadget that rivaled the capabilities of those currently on the market would definitely rouse suspicion of the many, hence why Izuku was forced to give Yuuga PSS anonymously. Before spending 3,000 on portable sticker set, Izuku had already spent a thousand buying himself a new PS4. Inko had volunteered to purchase it for him so he didn't need to spend his rep points, but he turned down her offer. The purpose of earning rep points was to use them for his benefit. There was no point saving up tons of points and never using them. Plus, every year he would earn around 3,000 points so whatever he spent would soon get replenished. After that, he still had a couple thousand left, and so the candy business began. The inspiration came from the magic trick he performed for the invisible girl, Hagakir. She was so happy after seeing his magic and a simple piece of candy was all of a sudden so much more magical when given out like that. Izuku thought that if a simple magic trick could make someone smile like that, couldn't he also use it to make friends? That turned out to be an excellent idea. With candies and magic trick as enticement, even a quirkless kid like him was able to quickly rise in popularity among his classmates. His being quirkless made his tricks more authentic, because they were bona fide skills unlike many magicians out there who used their quirks to perform fake magic acts. Those who used to mock him along with Kakin were now hanging out with him every day. Even Kakin bullied him less. He still laughed at him for being quirkless and how Izuku would never be as strong as he was but he didn't make any negative comment about the tricks. Izuku caught him staring once when he was selling candies. And when Izuku volunteered to perform his iconic disappearing act, Kakin simply grunted in response and stormed away. Selling candies didn't use up a lot of reputation points. After taking out those spent from the total he gained every week, he was still making profit. While waiting for Inko to prepare the pancake, Izuku pulled up his profile. Name, Midoriya Izuku. Title, None. LV, 9 EXP, 15,555, 25,600. HP, 3,375 over 3,375. MP, 3,375 over 3,375. Age, 8. Quirk, None. STR, 8. DEF, 8. SP, 10. DEX, 10. Attribute points, 1. Luck, 6. Rep points, 4658. Techniques, Observe LV10, Observe People Name, Level, Age, Personality, and Status and Item Stats Title, Description, Durability, and Ability, MP Usage, 50 MP Per Use, Search LV5, Search for Your Target Faster, Taking in More of the Surroundings Faster, MP Usage, NA, Sprint LV7, Provide a 25% Boost of Speed when Running, Use 25% Less Stamina, MP Usage, 100 MP per use. Last 5 seconds. Jump LV6. Provide a 25% boost of strength in your legs when jumping. Can now jump as high as your physical height. MP Usage, 100 MP per use. Izuku took out a pencil and a notebook from his inventory. 25,615,555 equals. He wrote, 26,016,000 equals 2616 equals 10. So I need about 10,000 more EXP points to reach level 10 to gain my first quirk. Izuku sighed. That would take quite a while. Now that his level was higher, the rewards he earned from quests were much higher than they were before, but no quests would reward him 10,000 EXP all at once. Recently during lunch activity at YHP he would use all the time he had to ravage quests like crazy. Even others had noticed his urgency and questioned him his behavior. He couldn't help it. 
He had waited his entire life and now he was finally so, so close to getting his first quirk. Mere words could not describe his excitement. Izu-chan, the pancakes are ready. Coming. Izuku hurried to the kitchen where Inko was carrying a box of pancakes, smiling. Thanks mom. Izuku placed a hand on the box and it vanished, reappearing in his inventory, which now contained his security alarm, bike, notebooks, candies, ice creams, four-leaf clover, flash bomb one, flash bomb two, bag of cat food, a bottle of milk, a bowl of cereal, complete set of 100 eating utensils, and the pancakes. Throughout the year he had earned all sorts of weird things from quests. Some came and went, but he had never found the instances to use the cat food, milk, cereal, and eating utensils. If one day he needed more slots, he would trash these items. But for now he decided to leave them there. They might come in handy one day. Who knew? Wow, no matter how many times I see you do that trick, it's still amazing. He, Izuku giggled. He grabbed his magic backpack and pulled his bike out of the inventory. See you tomorrow, mom. Be careful. Make sure you ride on the sidewalk. Be nice to the Shinsis and wake up on time tomorrow morning. I will, mom. The door closed gently behind him. Izuku scrunched his eyes up when sunlight shone directly at them. The sun was setting and very soon it'd be too dark for a young kid like him to walk the street alone. Hitoshi's house was about a 10-minute ride from his house. Izuku had only been there once and that was when they accidentally switched their identical water bottles. He had marked the house on his map before he left so he would know how to reach Hitoshi next time something happened, with the map virtually showing a flashing dot representing his current location. Izuku sped down the street heading towards his destination. The agreed time of arrival was 6.30 p.m. Izuku didn't want to be late so he left the house at a little past 6. He was pretty sure he would make it on time. Just as that thought entered his mind, an exclamation mark popped up on the map along with a series of loud explosions in the area to his right. Izuku's bicycle gave a long screech when he sharply pulled the brake. He tapped the exclamation mark mentally and was astounded by the information he saw. Quest alert. Main quest, killing all for one. Description. All for one is the most dangerous villain in all of Japan and he is currently fighting All Might. Help All Might defeat all for one. If not, the future may be jeopardized. Time limit, hours, 4 minutes and 59 seconds. Reward, 10,000 EXP, 100 reputation points, the Punisher. Failure, all might could die, except decline. Izuku was completely immobilized, shocked beyond belief and filled with uncertainty and dread. Never in his two years of using digitalization had he ever seen a main quest, or any quest that gave out a skill and 10,000 EXP all at once. Not to mention such an ominous quest that actually encouraged him to KK kill someone. Sure villains were evil, be but they didn't deserve to be killed. Time was ticking and Izuku knew he had to come to a decision soon. Could he really kill someone? Did he have the capability of killing someone? He was just an 8-year-old kid. What could he do? 356, 355, 354. E but if he didn't do this, All Might could die. He may have spoken some harsh words to Izuku but he didn't deserve to die. No one did. 320, 319, 318. But he had to choose. Either the villain die or All Might die. 244, 243, 242, and this may just be a shortcut to quickly reach level 10. If he let this opportunity slip, it would take at least a few months for him to level up and get his first quirk. 138, 137, 136, the answer was obvious. 120, 119, Izuku accepted the quest and roughly manhandled his bicycle around the corner and into an alley that led him onto a path of total destruction. Debris and collapsed buildings blocked the road and Izuku was forced to jump off his bike and sprint his way across. 059, 058, 057, Sprint LV7 is activated, remaining seconds 5.4.3, Sprint plus 1. Finally, after climbing over a flipped over remains of a wrecked truck, Izuku saw a lone figure standing proud and tall on top of a pile of rubble in the distance. Two strands of blonde hair barely sticking up on his forehead, a fantastic mix of red, blue, and yellow making his costume the most iconic uniform in Japan, and a tired frown straining his face. All Might was breathing heavily as he looked down at the suited man lying by his feet. He stood there for a couple seconds before turning his back towards the man and squeezing his eyes shut as if the sight pained him. This scene should mean only one thing. 029, 028, 027, All Might had won, 018, 017. So why? 014, 013. Why was the timer still going? 011, 010. In the next second, faster than Izuku could track with his naked eye, the suited man sprung up and lunged towards All Might's back with a glowing hand. 008, 007. A sinister vortex of dark red colors swirling in his palm. He aimed that thing at All Might's exposed left side. 006, 005. Izuku had no time to think. He had to do something. 
But what? 004. His eyes landed on the first item he thought of and he yanked it out of his inventory. 003. He hurled it towards the villain. 002. But he underestimated his strength and the flash bomb dropped right by his feet. 001. Your luck has changed to 8 due to a decision you've just made. It exploded on impact. All Might's eyes glazed over as his rage slowly dissipated. It was then when he finally took in the damage they had caused around them and reality finally downed on him. It was his first time truly wanting someone dead. All those years he had spent enforcing justice and ensuring the peace of the city, and now he himself lost control of his emotions and went on a rampage. How was he any different from the villains and criminals? How would the citizens think if their symbol of peace, the number one hero everyone looked up to, had tried to kill someone? What about the kids who saw their personification of justice committing murder? They would think killing another human being was perfectly justified. If there was anyone who should never kill someone, it should be All Might. He held too many influences over the citizens. People looked up to him and followed after his footsteps. One mishap could have an incredible amount of negative influence over the adolescents. All Might was a god, a symbol, the pillar of justice who could do no wrong. Yagi Tashinori, on the other hand, was a human who had no image he needed to maintain. He could make mistakes with less severe consequences. It was fine for him to let his emotions get the better of him, but that wasn't the case for All Might. All Might turned his back to his fallen foe, unable to stare at the sight any longer. He couldn't be any more thankful that no one was around to witness him killing all for one, especially someone like the child. All the other heroes who participated in Operation Avengers with him were either severely wounded and unconscious, or ambushing the convenience store. He had to quickly get them immediate medical attention, deal with all for one's corpse, and see how Shimura Tenko was doing. But wrestle, the sound of air being sucked into a vacuum, all might notice too late. When he realized the targeted spot, the mad sphere of pure evil energy was inches away from his exposed left side. Then a loud bang tore both of their attention away momentarily, and that one millisecond of distraction was all he needed to narrowly dodge the attack, grab all for one's arm, and thrust the evil energy directly into his unprepared abdomen. The man only had the time to let out a single, choked noise before his body swirled with the crimson energy and got sucked inside the vortex, vanishing with a crack. Time seemed to have stopped as blood flowed to his head and all he could hear was his heavy breathing and the abnormally fast beating of his heart. His hands still outstretched, fingers weakly grasping the air where that crack in space resided. All Might waited with bated breath as if expecting all for one to pop into existence with a deadly jump scare. His breathing and heart rate slowly returned to normal. All Might withdrew his hand and clenched his fist, letting out a long sigh. He then turned to the source of the bang and froze on the spot. There standing in midst of the dispelling cloud of dust was a very familiar boy with that almost as iconic as his design green fluffy hairdo and round and hopeful jaded eyes. As All Might watched the boy cough profusely while attempting to clear the dusts with his other arm covering his eyes, his inner was in turmoil. Two years ago he had said some harsh words towards the kid when he first met him, telling him a quirkless person couldn't become a hero and should give up early. Yet, here he was now having his ass saved by the very boy of whom he had denied the dream. All Might didn't want the boy to get hurt during his pursuit but if he told the boy the same thing now, he would just look like an asshole and a hypocrite for turning a blind eye to his achievement. But if he was to eat back his words and tell him to go for it, he would look like an idiot and lose all credibility. All Might was still conflicted, but staying in this staring contest with the boy wouldn't do either. He had to thank the boy properly. And perhaps, apologize. In one single leap, All Might landed in front of the boy, the tremor causing the rubble he had been standing on to collapse into one scattered heap. It appears that we have met again, young man. All Might greeted with a cheerful grin as if nothing was amiss. Uh, All Might. The boy stuttered, just like he had when they first met, but something was different. The inundated admiration overflowing from his glistening eyes were greatly lessened. He probably hates me now for ruining his dream. All Might grinned warily. I must thank you for what you have done. That stunt you just pulled have possibly saved my very life. However, All Might bit his cheeks as he prepared his words. What you just did was incredibly dangerous. You could have gotten yourself killed. Flash bombs aren't something to just wave around like a toy. Those may be the children's version, they're still a weapon nonetheless. When you hear the sound of a battle, it's not a good idea to go investigate, especially when you lack any quirk to protect yourself. The smile faltered before it could fully emerge. The boy nodded, gazing downcast sullenly. I'm sorry, that look shot through All Might, cracking his facade into bits and shedding him down until all that remained was the unbearable amount of guilt. All Might tried, I'm not trying to chastise you, I'm just concerned for your safety. I don't want you to get hurt. It's fine, I understand, All Might. I'll be careful next time. That smile the boy showed him was painful to see. The boy saved him, yet what did he receive? A flimsy thank you and a rebuke. I have to thank him properly. I apologize if I seem too harsh, but I... It's fine, really. The boy interrupted softly. 
I understand how dangerous it is for a quirkless person to deal with villains and perform heroic acts. I've been in enough situations to realize that. I'll try to stay away from dangerous things and only be a hero when I know it's safe, but enough of that. All Might, what? What happened to that villain? Did you kill him? All Might opened his mouth but couldn't get any words out. No, I didn't kill him, he wanted to say. Killing is bad after all, he should be saying. But he just couldn't lie to the boy after everything else he had done to him. It wasn't like he could just say the villain ran away either. The boy would be wondering why the hell was the symbol of peace chatting with him so casually instead of chasing after the villain. All Might had no other choice but to tell the truth, that he, the personification of justice, just killed someone on his own accord. No need for excuses. Killing was killing. Nothing could glorify it. It didn't matter if it was for the sake of self-defense. At the end of the day, All Might had willingly plunged the vortex of energy into his opponent's body knowing the danger of it. Yes, I killed him. The boy widened his eyes and his lips parted slightly as he let out an O. Oh. Silence drifted between the two as neither knew what to say. All Might stared at the boy. And the boy stared back. I know killing another human being is an awful thing to do, but sometimes it's inevitable. I may be the symbol of peace, but in the end I'm still a human. Yes, contrary to the public's belief, All Might is not a god. He's a human just like everyone else. The boy gawked with his jaws slack as if his religion had just been deemed false. Humans make mistakes and I do, too. Humans have emotions and sometimes you can't help but let your feelings overrule your logic. Everyone are bound to have instances like that. If you don't, then you're not human, you're God. All Might sighed. No one deserves to be killed no matter how much villainy they have committed. In the end, it all comes down to whether you believe their death would be beneficial or meaningless. And you killed him because. This villain is called All for One. He has been around for generations causing mayhem in this country. Almost every single crime can somehow someway be traced back to him. He is the mastermind behind everything. Bringing him down can greatly dwindle the crime rate. For the next part, All Might had to choose his words carefully. He envisioned Gran Torino lecturing him on this topic. What would he say? I have a personal grudge against him and during our fight I failed to keep my emotions in control and tried to kill him. That last attack he aimed at me was the last draw and before I realized. His existence has been erased from this world. I have done something horrible, but his death is definitely beneficial to this country. All for one has the power to steal others' quirks permanently. If he's locked up, he may have a quirk that allows him to escape and wreak more havoc. In the end, though cruel it may be, death is the best way to deal with him. All Might finished fully expecting the boy to bear a look of betrayal. But during his explanation, the boy didn't show any signs of detest but instead had a look of understanding. I get what you mean, All Might. If you don't kill him, he would have killed you. And I'm sure the entire Japan would agree that it's beneficial for you to stay alive than him. I don't like saying this, but I'm glad he died. Why why you? Really? All Might spluttered. This reaction was not even close to what he expected, and he had come up with dozens of scenarios of how this talk would turn out. Yeah, the boy had a look of pure bliss as he smiled. No matter what you do, to me you're still All Might, the symbol of peace. I won't ever lose faith in you. Plus, I don't think you necessarily did something wrong. After all, killing him can mean saving many innocent lives that might be lost otherwise in the future. T thank you. All Might didn't know what else to say. Thank you for being so understanding. Thank you for saving my life. Thank you for not hating me after the cruel things I've said to you. What's your name? Midoriya Izuku. Young Midoriya, I can see you becoming a great hero. Really? Midoriya perked up. Yes, you have what many don't have, the ability to view things on a gray scale instead of the inborn black and white. You may not have a quirk, but the attitude you showed me just now is something only the best of the best heroes have. You are able to distinguish the gray area between good and bad. You understand that killing someone doesn't make you evil, when many pro heroes fail to understand that. Not all killers are bad guys. And your acceptance of that fact makes me believe that you have the potential to be an amazing hero. Why you really believe me? Yes, I do. All Might crouched before Midoriya and placed both hands onto his shoulders. His large hands barely fit on these tiny shoulder blades. Midoriya Izuku, I have faith in you. So please, forget what I said the first time we met. I was being an idiot. Don't give up your dream. You have what it takes to do great things. Midoriya's eyes watered but he tilted his head up to hold in the tears. After a moment of sniffling, he looked back down with tears all gone and brought him yellow backpack to the front. He rummaged around for a while then pulled out a notebook and a marker. All Might, can you write all that down along with an autograph please? I want to remember those words forever. All Might accepted the notebook and marker with a low chuckle. After everything that happened, the boy still remained as a fan. He took back his words. Midoriya definitely had what it took to do great things. Gran Torino didn't believe him when he revealed all for one's death to the old man. Not because All Might wasn't credible, but rather the villain was infamous for being manipulative and sly. 
Faking a death wasn't outside of his realm of possibilities. All Might himself wouldn't have believed it if he hadn't seen All for One leaving this world with his own eyes. He didn't have any concrete evidence that the man was dead, so the police couldn't put it into their report yet until they had confirmed after a thorough investigation. After reporting the result of this fight, All Might asked around for Shimura Tenko and an officer kindly pointed him towards the direction of the break room. Gran Torino was already there when he arrived, standing outside the door and frowning at the loud crying and screaming that came from inside the break room. All Might immediately asked, What's going on here? The brats being a pain in the ass that's what? Gran Torino grumbled. All Might pushed the door open slightly and peeked through the crack, immediately wincing as a strange, awful smell hit his sense. Ashen remains of the fridge and spilled food and juice carpeted the ground. Some food were rotten, presumably forgotten by their owner after being left there for so long. Tables were flipped over. Even the sink was overflowing with water. The only standing furniture, the couch, stood in between the two glaring individuals. I said, put it on. The officer growled, circling around the couch and waving a thin roll of bandages. Tenko dodged the offending hand and scurried around to the other side. No, I said no. Um, what's going on here? All Might intruded. All Might's in. The officer complained. I was ordered to wrap up his fingers so he doesn't hurt anything, and God forbid any person. But he keeps on refusing and throwing a tantrum. I'm not throwing a tantrum. Tenko fumed. Why don't you let me have a talk with him? The officer nodded so quickly his bobbing head formed a blur. He gave the roll of bandages to All Might and hurried out of the door, glad to pass on the responsibility of such a tedious task. Now, All Might clicked the door shut gently and sat on the couch, patting the space next to him gesturing for Tenko to sit. Would you mind telling me why you refuse to wrap up your fingers? Tenko eyed him suspiciously and didn't accept his offer. My mom said not to wrap up my fingers. And why is that? Because my quirk is dangerous and strong. All Might tilted his head. Not sure he understood the logic here. But humans are stronger and we shouldn't become enslaved to our quirks. My mom wanted me to be in control over my quirk, instead of letting it control me. She said I shouldn't be afraid of it and wrap up my fingers to protect myself. Instead, I should live alongside danger so I can get used to it and learn to adapt and overcome. That's very deep. You had a great mother. Tenko bit his lips, his eyes glistening with tears. Yet, you let her die. Tenko Kun. All Might hesitantly reached out a hand. Don't call my name. Tenko growled, slapping his hand away carefully avoiding using all his fingers. You're the symbol of peace aren't you? So why weren't you there protecting my parents? Why did you let them die? I, All Might was speechless. He could only, I'm sorry. Yes, you should be sorry. It's all your fault they're now dead. Why didn't you do your job properly? Why? Tenko whimpered, wiping away his tears furiously. Why weren't you there? For a moment, the only sound in the room were Tenko's sniffling and the click of the door as Chief Tsurigami poked his snout in questioning if everything was all right with Amir Gay. All Might sighed as he rubbed his face, suddenly feeling like he had aged at least ten years. Young Shimura, I'm sorry for not being there when your family was attacked. Your parents were great people and they didn't deserve to die. I was too late to save them. But rest assured, we've defeated the villain ultimately responsible for the death of your parents. You mean the man who saved me when no one else did? Tenko sneered. All Might winced, feeling a migraine growing. Indeed, he was the one who saved you. But he didn't do so with good intentions. He was simply using you to lure me out so he could kill me. All Might continued when the boy's expression didn't change. The villain is named All for One. He's the one who made the sludge kill your parents. He's also responsible for the death of your grandmother, Shimura Nana. And how do I know that everything you said wasn't just a lie? I have proof if you need them. Barked Surigami as he pushed the door open the rest of the way with Gran Torino trailing after him. I have his criminal record right here, woof. Please show us, if you don't mind. All Might urged before Tenko could voice his opinion. He stood up, allowing Tsurigami to spread out the documents on the couch. Tenko hesitantly touched a sheet of paper with his pinky lifted, paused as if waiting for any negative reactions, then proceeded to read through them. When he frowned, Tsurigami would explain the difficult jargons and characters that a kid his age had yet to learn. Tenko read very thoroughly, stopping every once in a while to ask questions. When he finished the last page, he looked up and pointed at Gran Torino. So you were friends with my grandma? That's correct. He then pointed at All Might. And you were her student? Yes. Tenko's expression twisted into one of fury. His finger shook as he yelled, so you should know that she had a family. If nothing else, you should be the first one to know when we're in danger. You're a hero. Shouldn't you keep an eye on those you know and make sure they're not in danger? All Might flinched. Each word shot through his heart, hitting him in his vitals. Today just wasn't his day, was it? First he had to commit murder in front of a kid. Second he had to eat his own words like an idiot and explain to a kid why sometimes killing was okay. And now, he was been berated by a ten-year-old for failing his master. Shishu would be so disappointed in him. 
She had given her son away so he and his family would be safe. Not so all for one would hunt them down and kill them all, right in front of her grandson's eyes. All Might knelt down in front of the boy who was glaring at him with so much sorrow and said, I'm sorry. You're right. I should have done better as the symbol of peace. I should have taken care of your family after my master passed away. But what has happened cannot be changed. What I can do, however, is try my best to make up to you. Please tell me what I can do to make it better. Tenko mumbled. Give me my family back. All Might shook his head. I'm afraid I can't revive the dead. But I can give you a new family. I don't want to live with some random people. His words were cut off sharply by Tenko's sudden hostility and All Might was a little taken back. I didn't mean the orphanage. I was thinking of taking you in. Finally, the boy's furious expression was replaced by one of shock. Young Shimura, how do you like to live with me? Tashinori. Gran Torino interjected, grabbing his shoulder. Are you sure about this? Do you really think you're ready for a child? I have to even if I'm not ready. I can always learn along the way. That's what Shishu would have wanted me to do. Beside, his quirk is too dangerous for him to just live with any random families. Of course, Tenko murmured, slouching with a vacant expression. Cause I'm too dangerous to live with. That's not it. All Might interrupted before the boy would get the wrong idea. It's not you that's dangerous. It's the bad people out there who would be a negative influence to you and take advantage of your quirk. In other words, I want to protect you from the villains by staying close to you and make up to you for not being there for your parents. All Might then turned to the chief. There wouldn't be a problem with me adopting him, would it? No, there shouldn't be considering you're the symbol of peace and your track record is clean as sheets, woof. All Might turned back to the boy. So, what do you think? Tenko was quiet for a moment as he contemplated over the idea. All three adult occupants waited patiently for the boy to come to a decision. Fine, he eventually agreed, but only on one condition. Yes, what is it? Tenko brought up his hand and pointed at the roll of bandages with his other. I'm not wrapping up my fingers. That's fine, I won't force you to. Tenko stuffed a hand into his pocket and clenched something that was causing a visible bump and had All Might wondering exactly what was the boy hiding that required him to constantly keep one hand in there. But he didn't ask because he knew Tenko wouldn't answer him when their current relationship was fractured like this. Tenko bit his lips, looking as if he wanted to say something else, but what came out was, okay, fine, but that doesn't mean I've forgiven you. Hearing the words he had been hoping for since he first received the news of the boy's kidnapping and the death of his family. All Might let out a smile very much like his iconic one but more genuine. It was a smile that rose from deep inside his heart. Not the trademark grin that he practiced in front of his mirror at least ten times every morning and was always ready to be brandished whenever the situation demanded it. Tenko immediately looked away when he smiled. And All Might could only shake his head and gaze into the distance with a faraway expression, knowing changing the boy's opinion of him wouldn't be easy. At the same time, the units lying low at the convenience store were getting impatient. More than 30 minutes had passed since the estimated time of arrival, yet the sludge never showed up, unbeknownst to them. At a corner store miles away in the complete opposite direction, the sludge slid out of the back storage room with a box full of food engulfed in his slimy body. His large orb-like eyes darted around cautiously before he quickly slipped down the drain, blending into the sewer water and heading back towards the house. It would be a long time before they realized that a villain surely would know that stealing from the same store over time would rouse suspicion. But by the time they got there, the sludge would already be back at the house, or rather, the remains of it, and be left wondering why ambulances and heroes were everywhere as he peeked out from the sewer lid. On the other hand, it would also take a while for the sludge to realize that his boss was dead and his paycheck had yet again escaped from his grasp, and the culprit behind it all, the goddamned All Might. The doorbell chimed and minutes later the door swung open revealing a doe-eyed woman with long, purple hair tied up in a loose ponytail. She was wearing an apron stained with various discolored smudges and carrying a ladle still dripping with what looked like curry. Izuku Khan, welcome. Shinsu Kaioken greeted with a warm smile as she ushered Izuku in. Toshi Chan has been waiting. Ah, um, thanks. This is for you. Izuku brought out the box of pancakes from his magic backpack and presented it. Thanks for inviting me here. No need for such pleasantries. Kaioken chuckled as she accepted the gift. Toshi's friends are always welcomed. Go ahead. Toshi Chan's in his room with Yuuga Kun and Henshin Kun. I still have to prepare dinner, but I'm sure you remember where it is. Of course. Don't worry about me. I know how to get there. Good. Well, have fun. And if Toshi Chan bullies you, make sure you let me know so I can kick his ass. Okay. Oh, okay. Izuku gave a weak smile, waving as the cheerful mother winked and ran back to the kitchen, curry dripping everywhere. When her form disappeared from view, Izuku let his smile fade. He tightened his grip on his pack and began making his way to Hitoshi's room. The design of the house gave off a warm and cozy feeling. Pictures of the happy family were captured in frames and hang on the wall. Izuku paused deliberately to look at a photo of baby Hitoshi trapped in a fish tank with a heavenly smile.
and surrounded by adorable multicolored fish, while Mama Kaioken and Papa Haka had a look of utter horror as they plunged their hands into the tank to save their baby from drowning. Walking past the living room, Izuku noticed some of the newest, recently released video games laying around the floor. It appeared that Hitoshi's parents spoiled him just as much as Izuku's did. As Izuku made his way up the stairs, his mind wandered to the event that had occurred not even ten minutes ago. He absent-mindedly pulled up his quest completion screen and stared blankly at the reward. The Punisher rips open a crack in time and space. Whatever beings and objects that are hit by this attack will be sucked into another dimension and gone from this universe forever. Single use only. No MP required. The crack will seal shut after five seconds. It instantly made sense how the villain, all for one, had disappeared when the effect of the flash bomb was over, instead of lying on the ground, dead. It was also why Izuku had accepted All Might's explanation so soon. He understood that the blonde hero did it in self-defense. On top of that, if this villain really was the biggest villain in the history of Japan and his existence meant many others' lives were at stakes, then he deserved to die by All Might's hand. Izuku still didn't like the idea of killing another individual, but if the number one hero said that killing someone was a form of saving others, then it couldn't be wrong. On a side note, he was now less than 100 EXP points away from getting his first quirk. He could reach it in like two days of time. The idea of no longer being quirkless rejuvenated Izuku and, with a bounce in his steps, he ran the rest of the way up, barging into Hitoshi's room with a loud fear not, for I have arrived. The three occupants of the room jerked around in surprise, two pairs of purple eyes and one pair of orange eyes locked onto him, surprise evident on their face. Hitoshi recovered the quickest. He looked around feigning surprise. Wait, is there a villain here that I don't know? Where? Where? Do you see it? Yuga winked, sending sparkles everywhere. Even if there are, they're too afraid to show their faces because my sheer awesomeness is blinding them. Izuku pouted, slumping onto the carpet and collapsing against a giant cat plushie. You guys are so mean. Namamono cried. Hey, I didn't even say anything. Don't lump me together with them. Anyway, what are you guys up to? Hitoshi held up a CD case that featured four guys dressed in black outfits stained with what looked like blood and wearing scary makeups, pointing at the music video playing on his laptop, grinning. I'm converting you guys into killers. Killers? Izuku yelped. Not that killer, idiot. I meant killer as in fans of my favorite band. One shot, one kill. It's our fan name. I don't think I get it. It's okay, Izuku. Yuga placed a hand on his shoulder, staring at him intently. I don't get it either. You guys just don't get metal. Hitoshi pressed a key and the music video began playing. Instantly, the loud punk metal rock music, or whatever that genre was, filled the room, causing walls to moan, furnitures to dance with the beat, and band posters to faceblend. Listen to this. Izuku could only make out blood, death, and escape before his eardrums couldn't handle no more and he had to launch himself at Hitoshi and pause the video. The trio then spent the rest of the time showing Hitoshi good music, which ended in a dispute between Yuuga and Namamano about whether jazz and blues were one and the same, before the last invitee. Manami arrived. Sorry, I got lost. Manami gasped as she hunched over with her hands on her knees. She held up a phone, a phone that showed a map screen with a dot that kept darting around. My map malfunctioned and it misled me many times. Hitoshi began saying how it was fine and she didn't need to worry about being late while Izuku tuned out the conversation, unable to wrap his mind around the fact that Manami, who was only two years older than they were, already had her own phone. On their way up the stairs, Haka called to them from the living room. The man with messy, dark blue hair and heavy eye bags was lying on the couch lazily with one arm dangling off of it and the other holding a controller. When you guys come down for dinner, would you mind bringing me my USB drive containing all the movies I've downloaded? It should be on my desk in my study. Itoshi grumbled, lazy bum, but agreed nonetheless. When they've reached the top of the stairs, Namamano piped up, I gotta pee. Where's the toilet? I'll take you there, Itoshi offered. You guys go wait in my room. I'll be right back. Okay. Izuku and the others nodded as they sank once again into those soft beanbag chairs. The dim light in the hallway casted a shadow over Hitoshi's face. He was leaning against the wall by the bathroom with his arm crossed and a mischievous smirk adorning his face. Shinsu Hitoshi may look like an ordinary eight-year-old who invited his friends over for a sleepover, but in reality, he was a man with a mission, and this was all a trap for a target he had set his eyes on a long time ago. His target was currently washing his hands in the bathroom. Very soon. Very soon. Itoshi would get his answers. The door swung open and a satisfied Namamano walked out, wiping his hands on his trousers and sighing in relief, only to squeal in surprise when he came face to face with Hitoshi. W what are you doing here? I thought you already. I have a very important favor to ask. Oh okay. 
What is it? Hitoshi stepped forward and Namamano backpedaled until his back hit the walls. The orange-haired boy darted his eyes nervously, staring at anything that wasn't Hitoshi. I want you to sleep with me tonight. Huh? Namamano said smartly. Why? Hitoshi scratched his cheeks, his smirk slipping off of his face as he explained with a faint blush. The thing is, I love cats but my parents are allergic to them. And my biggest dream is to cuddle with a cat one day. So, he trailed off. What was left unsaid should be obvious enough without him having to outright say it. Oh, Namamano nodded in understanding, rubbing his chin in a thinking posture. So you want me to morph into a cat and cuddle with you tonight? Yeah, if it's alright with you. Of course not. The orange-haired boy exclaimed, flailing his arms around and almost hitting Hitoshi in the face. Boys shouldn't cuddle. My mom said cuddling is too girly and if you do it then you're a pansy. The rejection was to be expected and Hitoshi already had a plan B ready for this circumstance. I'm not telling you to do it for free. Hitoshi pulled out something he was hiding behind him and showed it to Namamano. If you sleep with me, this is yours to keep. How are you for real? Namamano made a grab for the object but Hitoshi dodged easily. I'll do it. I'll do it every day if I have to. Hitoshi curled his lips as he took in the enthusiasm in Namamano's actions. Too easy. When dinner time rolled by, Izuku had finished reading all the superhero comics Hitoshi had to offer. The five of them left the room and were about to head downstairs before Hitoshi remembered the USB. He was about to get it himself and let the others go downstairs before him. But they were all way too curious of what the study looked like to pass off the chance. Whoa, Izuku gasped in awe when he took in the massive shelves of thick hard-covered books and the triple-monitored computer setup. That's so cool. Yeah, Hitoshi said absent-mindedly as he searched for the USB. Although the study seemed fairly spacious at first glance, it suddenly felt so much more crowded once all five of them settled inside. Manami went straight towards the cool computer setup while Namamano immediately dived for the trophy cases displayed on a glass shelf, ogling at the well-made figures and mimicking their various poses. Yuuga even took a book out of the shelves and began reading it out loud, in French. Hmm, what's the matter, Toshi? Izuku went up behind him and found Hitoshi frowning at two identical USB on the desk. I'm not sure which one is the one with the movies. Stupid dad didn't label them. Hitoshi plugged one of them into a port, and the computer's locked. Try your birthday. Namamano suggested with one eye closed and his hands positioned straight out in front of him as if he was holding a gun. Incorrect. Remaining attempts too. What about your mom's birthday? Yuga wondered as he flipped to the next page. Incorrect. Remaining attempts 1. What would happen if you fail it three times? Izuku asked and Hitoshi responded with a shrug. Well, why don't we try? I have a faster method. Manami held up her phone and a phone cord she picked up from the desk with a smirk. If you allow me to do some tampering with your dad's computer, that is. Would it harm the computer? No. But it might invade your dad's privacy. I don't mind. And I obviously don't. Manami said as she plugged one end of the cord into the phone and the other end into the computer. Izuku watched with utter confusion as she tapped some app on her phone, typed something, and the computer screen blacked out, revealing strings of text running across the screen line by line. They quickly filled up the entire screen and proceeded to drag the screen up. When they stopped, they were prompted to choose an option, then another, then. It's done. Izuku dropped his jaws and almost forgot to pick it up if not for Minami giggling at him. H. How? What just happened? What was that? Izuku asked the question that must be on everyone's mind at the moment. This is called hacking, which is basically when a person bypasses a computer's security system and breaks into it. Cool. That's so cool. Izuku exclaimed and Minami blushed. Isn't this what that Mexico hero does? Samba. I think her name was. It's Sombra. And I'm hoping to become a hacking hero just like her. That's a great dream. Izuku gave her a big thumbs up, noting how her blush deepened. I'm sure you can do it. Now her whole face was beet red. Manami covered her face with both of her pigtails and turned back to the computer. In the corner of his eyes, Izuku caught Hitoshi grinning and Yuuga winking at him. Namamano, however, was just like him, looking utterly confused at the turn of event. Uh, anyway, Manami coughed into her fist. Here's the content of this drive. She opened up the unnamed drive and an endless list of folders appeared. The scroller on the right side got so tiny Izuku almost couldn't spot it. That's a lot of movies, Yuuga breathed. Is this the one you wanted? Hitoshi scratched his head. I'm not sure. Dad's the one who deals with the computer stuff. He always asks me what movie I want to watch and he'll find it for me. I've never seen what's inside this USB. Minami clicked on a folder, then a folder, then a file. The document opened up, revealing an Excel spreadsheet filled with numbers and words that were too difficult for them to understand. The only words they could understand was the title, Shinsekai Charity Donations. Wow, your parents really donate a lot to charity. Namamano marveled. Yeah, Hitoshi agreed. They said since it starts with Shin, it has a connection with us which is why we don't donate to any charities other than Shinsekai. Well then, obviously, 
This isn't the USB we wanted. Minami closed out the folder and ejected the drive. She was about to return the computer to normal with her phone when she paused the pointer on a file on the desktop. What's this? Itoshi leaned forward to take a look. Ah, that's the story my mom's writing. How to become a villain for dummies. Izuku laughed. Your mom's funny. Yeah, Hitoshi grinned. It's supposed to be a comedic story but publishers kept rejecting it without even reading it thinking it's actually teaching people how to become villains. I can see where they're coming from, Namamano laughed nervously. Now that they knew which USB was the correct one, Hitoshi marked the one with the movies movies and the other one charity. Dinner was spent playing with food and watching movies. By the time they had finished three movies, everyone was so exhausted they could barely drag their bodies into the bathroom for a shower before going to bed. When they were done, Kaioken had already placed four futons in Hitoshi's room. Izuku plopped down in between Yuuga's and Namamano's futon, burying his face into the pillow and breathing in the clean breeze scent of the detergent. That night, Izuku slept soundlessly. In the middle of the night, Hitoshi felt a shift on his bed. He cracked a tired eye open and smiled when he saw the tiny orange cat curling against his chest. Thanks, Namamano. Just go to sleep, Namaniko mumbled. Aye aye. Hitoshi pulled the blanket over his head and wrapped his hands around the small furry being, nuzzling against the protesting cat. His whole body practically melted as his fingers sank into the softness and he couldn't help but let out a coo. Go to sleep. The cat hissed. Izuku's dream was ripped into shreds by a scream the next morning. His eyes shot open and he scrambled to untangle himself from the blanket. The source of the commotion was, surprisingly, Hitoshi who was up against the wall looking as if someone had just burned all his cat merchandise right in front of him. Izuku had never seen him show an expression other than the usual aloof, tired, and the occasional anger. Yet, here he was with a gobsmacked look accompanied by a string of non-coherent stuttering and a shaking finger that was pointed at a groggy Namamano, who was curling up against Hitoshi and blinking blearily. Why did you change back? Hitoshi shrieked. Huh. Namamano propped himself up, dazed. Oh, I can't maintain the form when I'm asleep. You should have told me beforehand. Unable to process the situation, especially when it was so early in the morning, Izuku lay back down and pulled the blanket over his head. A few minutes passed as he simply lay there letting his screaming friends finish with their ruckus. Footsteps pounded all around him. There was a yelp as someone tripped over his legs and fell onto Yuuga's futon. Manami was throwing pillows and blankets everywhere as she complained about her missing phone. Itoshi and Namamano were still arguing and Yuuga who tried to conciliate them was hit with something causing him to go oof and stumble into Namamano who shrieked as he fell onto Hitoshi, knocked him against the wall, and according to the loud bang that brought a pair of angry footsteps towards their room, Hitoshi had hit his head pretty hard. What's the meaning of this? The room went dead silent as Kaioken and Haka barged through the door, with the former, the more tenacious of the two, angrily demanding an explanation. While each of his friends struggled to find an excuse to get themselves out of trouble and shift the blame onto the others, Izuku was telling Gola to create his daily save file. Save files were generated automatically after quest completions and title achievements. But Izuku also made a habit to create a save point at the beginning of every day so in case something went wrong, he could just restart that day. He had unlimited empty save slots so he didn't need to worry about running out of space. But Izuku still deleted the days when nothing happened, just to make it easier to locate specific save files in the future. The parents had already left the room when Izuku pulled the blanket off of him. His friends were all doing their things silently with their heads down guiltily. Toshi, is her head okay? Izuku asked, breaking the silence. It's no big deal, Hitoshi grumbled as he trudged out of the room, with the other three following suit. Manami was offered the opportunity to do her business in Hitoshi's parents' bathroom, which was attached to their master bedroom, while Izuku and the boys were assigned to the one in the hallway. The small bathroom wasn't big enough to contain all three of them, especially with Namamano prancing around gelling Hitoshi's hair to look like someone named Sasuke and Yuuga twirling around and making poses at the mirror. Izuku had to brush his teeth while cowering over the tub due to the limited space. Finally, after a long and painful restroom session, the children made their way downstairs. Kaioken had already prepared breakfast for them and was waiting by the dining table while typing something on her phone. Haka was walking back and forth holding his phone by his ears. He's not picking up. Haka sighed as he ended the call. He's not replying either. Hitoshi sat down in front of his set of dishes as the others followed suit. What are you talking about? Remember old man Nanba? Haka sat down next to Kaioken and placed his phone in his pocket. Your friend who owns a publisher? Yeah. It's been a while since he talked to us though. We're hoping he'll publish the story since all the other publishers rejected it. But he's not picking up. We've even tried texting him online with no response. Kaioken locked her phone and put it away. Usually when we call him, he'd respond back within an hour. But we've tried calling him last night and then this morning, and still he didn't call back. Hmm, that's weird. Haka sighed as he clapped his hands together. 
Anyway, let's forget about that for now. It's time to eat. When everyone was finished with breakfast, they all volunteered to help clean up the dishes, partly because it was a polite thing to do, and partly due to the racket they caused this morning. Kyokin was smiling gratefully when she put the last plate in the cabinet and told them to get ready for YHP. Izuku had come downstairs with his magic backpack so he was all ready. While waiting for the others, he went up to Manami who was sitting on the couch playing with her phone and sat next to her, making her jump in surprise. Hey, Manami-chan. Why yes, can you help me with something? Anything. Manami set her phone down on her lap and looked ready to listen. Remember that gentle hero I told you about. When she nodded, Izuku continued, I've known him for quite a while now, but I've only called him. And when I asked to meet him, he kept on refusing. I don't know his address so I can't seek him out either. So I'm hoping you can use your super hacking skill and help me locate his house, if that's not too much to ask. Without hesitation, Minami nodded once more. I can do that. You have his number. Yeah, it's right here. Izuku took out the slip of paper Gentle had given him years ago and passed it to Manami. I have it all memorized so you can keep it. Manami accepted the paper, staring at the elegant designs on the edge and rubbing her finger over the patterns etched into the material. Give me a few days and I'll get back to you. Great. Thanks. Izuku grabbed her hands and shook them excitedly. You're a godsend. A heavy blush crept up to her face and Izuku remembered the conversation he had with Yuuga last week. Hey, so you said that Manami-chan likes me, but I don't feel anything towards her. Is this normal? Yuuga leaned towards him. This, mon cher Ami, means you're gay. Izuku didn't think he likes boys either. He had even asked Kaken. Kaken, what do you want? Break had just started and Izuku wanted to get this over with before his classmates would crowd him. Do you think I'm gay? Kaken stared at him like he'd just developed a quirk and suddenly stood up. He stormed up to Izuku, who was a little intimidated by the sudden aggression, yanked him up by his collar, and kissed him on the mouth. Izuku pretty much lost all mobility as he stared into Kaken's red eyes. Sharp intakes of breath could be heard from all around them. Not even a second later, Kaken pushed him off, wiping his lips. Feel anything? Izuku could barely talk, still shell-shocked. And no, nothing. Then you're not gay. Dumbass. Kaken grumbled and sat back down, propping his feet onto the desk and kicking his chair back idly. Izuku didn't understand why Kaken did that, but it wasn't the first day Kaken did something strange. Izuku had long since gotten used to Kaken's eccentricity. Is everyone Ria Adi? Haka's loud voice pulled Izuku back to the present. Minami stood up and pocketed her phone. You ready, Izuku-kun? Yeah, let's go. Izuku followed her and they settled into Shinsu family's fancy car. Izuku was wondering why Manami decided to sit in the front seat but his question was quickly answered when the girl immediately striked a conversation with Haka about computers as soon as the man sat on the driver's seat. When Yuuga, Hitoshi, and Namamano were all seated next to him and everyone was buckled up, Haka started driving. Yuuga was checking his reflections on the window, brushing a strand of hair away from his eyes, while Hitoshi and Namamano were talking about games. Hey, wanna do that again? Namamano was asking. Sure, any time, but I'm not paying you again. Namamano pouted. I have to buy all my games with money I earned because my parents are so stingy with their money they never give me any allowance. I never thought I'd be able to play in Famous, Second Son when it was just released. If only I was born into your family. What's so great about this game anyway? Is it really worth you going against what your mom said? You don't know. Namamano frantically pulled out a game from his old messenger bag that looked a little faded in colors as if it was washed too many times. He turned the game around so the back was facing Hitoshi. In this game you can choose to be either a superhero or a supervillain. The choices you make determine your path. And different paths also come with different power sets. Not to mention the choices of quirks are so unique and interesting. Look at this. He gets a neon quirk and his entire body can turn into neon light. He can move in the speed of light and run up buildings. And can even use a sword made out of neon. He also gets a video quirk and can have these digital wings and can fly and can summon pixelated angels or demons to fight for him. This quirk can even create a virtual reality and pull people into it but you're not strong enough to use it to its full potential but it's still freaking awesome regardless. Not to mention he can even turn invisible. Hmm, not my type, Hitoshi concluded, causing Namamano to nearly choke on his words. I like FPS and Battle Royale games more. What's so fun about guns when you have quirks? Izuku completely agreed with Namamano on this one. Quirks had more variety and were more entertaining when compared to guns. The game premise did sound interesting though. Izuku would have to check it out when he had the time. The two of them were still talking about games when they arrived at YHP. Haka kissed Hitoshi on the forehead when he was about to leave but the purple-haired boy was too embarrassed to kiss back, especially with his friends all staring at him with a strange, knowing smile. He simply settled with a hug and waved goodbye as his dad drove away. Genji sensei was already there when they arrived, and that was the first sign of anomaly. Usually Shimura-sensei was the first to arrive, 
yet today she was nowhere to be seen. Genji Sensei. Izuku questioned, where's Shimura Sensei? A strange look flickered over his face but it was gone before Izuku could catch on to the meaning behind it. Genji Sensei knelt down and patted Izuku on the head, smiling. Shimura Sensei has to quit this job due to family reason. Unfortunately, she didn't have time to say goodbye before she had to go. I know you'll miss her but I'm sure you'll able to meet her again someday in the future. This was also what he told everyone else when class began. Izuku was by no means a rebellious and unreasonable kid. He understood that a sudden job change was inevitable and life didn't always go the way you wanted. He accepted what he was told and didn't think too much about it, as do the rest of the class. They were all sad that their teacher had to go but they all knew they wouldn't be able to stay with Shimura Sensei forever. One day, they'd grow up and have to leave her. Beside, with the lunch activity coming up Izuku was too busy pondering over the possible quirks he would get to care about anything else. Would it be a mutant quirk? If so, how would he explain to others? Was it an offensive quirk like Kakens or some other types? How would he use it to its full potential? What kind of costumes and gadgets should he purchase? How would his mom, his friends, and Kaken react? How would Gentle react? Sitting on a closed toilet lid in the restroom of a cafe, Izuku dismissed the level up notification and scrolled through the choices of quirks he could choose. Like he expected, less than 10 minutes into the activity and Izuku had already reached level 10. Using a restroom break as an excuse, Izuku locked himself in a stall and eagerly tapped open the description of each quirk. He rubbed his palms together as he read through them all, sparks of excitement dancing under his skin as if every cell in his body was jittering with adrenaline. How long had he been waiting for this? To finally gain a quirk just like everyone else and be on equal footing with them. To be accepted by Kaken and have a chance of become a hero. He had never been so glad that Gentle had saved him that day. It was thanks to him that Izuku was able to live on and see himself gaining a quirk. If he had actually died that night, Izuku would be drowning in regrets by now, not that he'd be alive to experience it. Despite being excited about getting a quirk, when it was actually time to choose, Izuku hesitated. The quirk he chose would stay with him for the rest of his life. He had to choose it carefully. This was no joke. If he chose the wrong one, there would be no going backs. Izuku's finger hovered above each quirk, unable to decide between the three. Teleportation you can teleport to any place you've been to and can accurately visualize in your mind. Any objects or persons who are in contact with you will be teleported as well. Bubble. Encase yourself in a protective bubble that shields you from all corporeal and abstract outside forces. Anyone in touch with you will also be enveloped in the bubble. Metal control. You can move any metal objects you see with your mind. All three were great quirks. Teleportation could be used as both offensive and defensive but it would require Izuku to have some actual fighting skill if he wanted to use it as the former. Bubble was mainly a defensive quirk, but if he was able to move around while being in the bubble, he could charge at enemies head on knocking them out. Control could be very versatile, but he didn't know the extent of the power. How did the control work? Did he need to remain eye contact? How long did it last? Was there a limit to the size and weight of the metal object? So many questions and no answers. With the limited information he had now, there was no way Izuku could make a decision that would shape the rest of his life at this moment. He would need to do research, have a talk with Gola and see if he could make it spill some intel, experiment, and consult with his mom. Not to mention his team was already impatient seeing how they had been banging on his stall for about a minute now begging for him to get out. Izuku swept aside the notification and flushed the toilet just to keep up the act. Unlocking the door, he was bombarded with complaints as his grumbling teammates dragged him out of the cafe. For the rest of the activity, Izuku wasn't as enthusiastic as he was weeks ago when he was struggling for level 10. There wasn't a need to rush now that he had reached his goal. He could just take things slow and enjoy the experience. Everyone was heaving and soaked in sweat by the time the activity was over. The summer heat was implacable, overcooking the earth and evaporating their sweat into a cloud of awful odor that drifted amongst them. The moment everyone stepped into the classroom, a chorus of sighs filled the air-conditioned room as the children collapsed onto their chair. Many students came up to Izuku and purchased a few popsicles from him at the low cost of 50 yen apiece. Even Genji Sensei, Eraserhead, and present Mike each bought one. Izuku's part-time job as a sweet vendor took place at YHP as well. It could help him make friends so why not? Very soon, Izuku had earned 2,000 yen. After everyone made a disgusting, sticky mess all over their hands and cleaned themselves, Genji Sensei clapped to get everyone's attention. Everyone, good job today. You all did very well. As a reward, you may use the pool for the rest of the day. However, Genji Sensei raised his voice, cutting off the cheering. I have something to announce before that. Don't worry, it's good news. Everyone quickly straightened their backs and began listening obediently. Eraserhead and Present Mike entered the classroom with a stack of paperwork and called for a few volunteers to pass them out, Izuku immediately raising his hand. Every year we YHP conducts a field trip near the end of the school year. 
Last week, we made everyone participate in a poll of your preferred destination for this year's field trip which will take place next weekend. Before I reveal the result, however, I want to hear from everyone why you think it's necessary to have field trips, because we can have fun and learn stuff at the same time. Close. Anyone else? Izuku transferred the stack of paperwork onto one arm and raised his other. It allows us to experience and learn new things that aren't taught at school. Very close. Let me ask you this. How many of you start playing video games right after arriving home every day? A few hands raised accompanied by abashed grins. Some raised theirs halfway before pulling it back down. Izuku raised his hand proudly. He didn't play video games when he arrived home. He played it every second of the day. You can't become a hero by holing up in your room all day. You have to feel, see, touch, and even taste the real world around you. A hero's job is to protect the citizens. How are you going to do that if you don't even understand the world outside of your room and the classroom? Educational field trips put you in a new environment and that helps with getting out of your comfort zone and bonding with your fellow classmates. Comradery is very important to heroes. The friends you make right now can possibly work alongside you as heroes in the future and can even save your life one day. Don't underestimate the power of friendship. Being put in an unfamiliar terrain can also broaden the way you think and give you new ideas for the future. You might find a new interest, which can even be the turning point in your life. And that's something you can only get from a field trip. Izuku nodded in understanding and glanced at his friends. They were glancing at each other's as well. Now, let's reveal the poll result. Present Mike went up to the podium with a sheet of paper. He cleared his throat and announced, in fifth place with two votes as a visit to Academy City. In fourth place with four votes as a tour of Mecha City and watching the Robo Res. In third place with six votes as participating in the demonstration of the virtual reality game Cocoon. In second place with eight votes as I Expo on I Island. And last but not least, in first place with ten votes as All Might Amusement Park. The class all jumped out of their seats and cheered to various degrees of excitement. Izuku too was ecstatic. He loved AMAP and was always ready for more. He guessed the reason why everyone voted for MAP was due to the fact that All Might had announced weeks ago that he was going to participate in a stunt show at the amusement park next week, who in their right mind would pass off a chance to meet the number one hero face to face. Izuku gave the remaining stack of paper to Genji Sensei, who explained, The paper I'm passing around is a permission form for your parents to sign. Like every field trip we've done in the past years, we're required by law to receive consent from your parents before we can take you on a trip. Tell them to sign the bottom portion and cut along the dotted lines. Bring me the signed form next set along with the list of recommended gears and we'll depart from YHP at 9 in the morning. If your parents refuse to let you go, then unfortunately, it'll be a normal YHP day for you. Some kids groaned. The others looked at them in pity. Now that's said and done, I know everyone's hot and tired, so go cool down in the pool and have some fun. Everyone has done well today so this is my reward to you. Please don't make me regret it. Of course, no one waited for him to finish talking. Everyone rushed out of the room, hollering as they went to the indoor pool. All the girls jumped in with their clothes still on while the boys stripped into their underwears then dived straight into the pool as soon as it came into sight. The teachers hurried after them. Poor and ignored Genji sensei was twitching profusely. I'm serious. Safety first. Please don't do something dangerous and make me regret. Once again he was interrupted as Namamano yanked him by the foot and pulled him into the water. Everyone laughed when Genji sensei resurfaced with water flowing out of his eyes. He quickly dog paddled to the edge and crawled over to the two pro heroes who were simply watching the scene with an amused smile on their faces, complaining about being bullied by the children and wanting to exact revenge. Eraserhead wanted to stay out of Genji sensei's petty revenge plan. But he was forced to participate when present Mike jumped the chance to have some fun. And the fun turned out to be a full-blown water battle. The battle ended rather quickly after Eraserhead accidentally got splashed in the back by Genji Sensei, who gulped and called the fight to an end before everyone would suffer the wrath of Eraserhead. Izuku had seen it once. An angry Eraserhead wasn't something he'd want to see again. When Enko picked up Izuku at the end of that day, he was dripping wet. At first, she was shocked by his appearance and thought he was bullied and had dirty water dumped on him. But then she saw that all his other classmates were in a similar state and stopped panicking. For the next few days Izuku delved into his research of the three quirks. He filled up an entire notebook of strengths and weaknesses for each quirk and costume ideas. He imagined himself having each of these quirks. How would he use them in a fight in different locations and situations? It wasn't easy to brainstorm especially when he hadn't experienced these quirks personally. He could only base his research on the quirk title and description. He had asked Gola but the little metallic cyclops refused to tell him anything, saying what's the fun if I just tell you everything. It's more fun watching you choose a quirk you later on regret him wahaha. 
On Tuesday when Izuku arrived home from school, his mom showed him a message from Manami's mother. It seemed that Manami had kept up her promise and located Gentle's address for him. His mom was curious as to who this Gentle was. Izuku didn't tell her the details and simply said, He's just a friend. He moved and I forgot to ask where his new house is. Manami knows so I asked her to send you the address. I'm going to visit him now. I'll be back soon. The address was less than a mile away. It took Izuku only a few minutes to ride there. He hid behind a trash can and stored his All Might bicycle into his inventory. Then he looked around, making sure no one had seen him. The sun was starting to set and Izuku needed to hurry if he wanted to get back home before it got dark. He followed the address and found his way to a house with the nameplate Takeshita. Who's Takeshita? Izuku wondered. He jumped when the door was suddenly shoved open and scampered behind a light pole, hiding from view. Izuku didn't know why he felt the need to hide. He just acted on his instincts and did it for some reason. The man that came out of the house was definitely not gentle. Disappointment rose inside of him but was quickly pushed down by relief when Gentle appeared right after the man, who Izuku assumed was Takeshita. They hadn't noticed him yet and were talking on the porch. I'll pick you up when my class ends, Takeshita said as he opened up the garage revealing a Toyota car. Usually meetings like this would end quickly if the company isn't interested in your offer. I don't know much about the Mansion Tea Company. Well, I'm sure you know more about it than I do, but I know that this meeting will be a success. How can you be so sure? Gentle asked. He was dressed in a fancy suit very much like when Izuku first met him. His white hair was also combed back stylishly. I'm just an average college student who's about to meet the CEO of a well-known tea company. How can you be so sure that they'll accept my proposal? Because you're not average, Denjuro. You may think you're because you've failed many times, but so what? Everyone fails. I failed the provisional hero license exam on my first try, too. It's a matter of whether you're able to stand back up or not. Takeshita placed a hand on Gentle's shoulder. You, my friend, never give up and are always trying, breaking every obstacle that's ever stood in your way. That's why I know that this meeting is going to be a success and so does your business. No, it's our business. It's yours, Tanjuro, Takeshita said sternly. I've only given you some pointers and tips. You're the one who came up with the idea and put the idea into action. Plus, it's called Gentle Trampoline for a reason. Anyway, let's get you over there. Can't be late for the meeting, you know. Takeshita pushed Gentle gently onto the passenger seat while he sat on the driver's seat. Izuku hid further behind the light pole when they drove past him, watching the car become smaller and smaller until it completely disappeared in the distance. Izuku felt a weight lifted off of his chest. All those years he had wanted to meet Gentle because he was worried. He had never met his hero again after that day. What if Gentle had forgotten about him? What if Gentle was in trouble? Was that why he refused to meet Izuku face to face? But this conversation changed his mind. Gentle didn't give up after he was expelled from school. He had continued fighting, finishing high school, and now attending college. He was even starting a business to earn money to support himself. Like what he had said when he gave Izuku his phone number, I promise, next time you see this face, I will be a whole new Gentle. I will be a hero worthy of your admiration. Gentle was working hard to better himself and become worthy of Izuku's admiration. He refused to meet Izuku not because he was in trouble and didn't want Izuku to see him in a disgruntled state, but rather because he wanted to wait until he was successful and had become a whole new gentle. The least Izuku could do was carry out Gentle's wish and wait patiently for the man to seek him out himself. Okay sadly the chapter is over, and if you enjoyed the video just leave a like and subscribe with post notification, so when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.